Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets, and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues on both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. Driving one of these big trucks is a woman who, if you met at a truck stop, you would see what you think is a tough but fairly normal person. But this truck driver is far from normal, but in a pleasant, caring way. Bonnie is an interstate truck driver, but when she gets home, her life is about her animals. I rescue her. She had a broken leg when she was a puppy, and they were going to put her down. And I said, how much do you want? How much is the vet going to charge you to put her down? And he said, oh, $50. I said, well, I'll give you the $50 and take the dog. Bonnie's ranch is far from ordinary. Let's start with the dogs. I've had up to 50, but being that I'm driving truck all the time now, it's too much. 20 is a little much anyway. It's a lot of work. And I have a great guy that comes out here and works and helps me do stuff. You know, it gets monotonous, I mean, because, you know, you got some that when I'm gone stay in the house and they don't get out, so you know you have a mess to clean up. The guys, you know how guys are about doing that. But they do a pretty good job, I have to, I have to admit. But, because um, I got some really old girls in here that, that are in their, you know, 14, 15 years old, and um, they can't take this heat and they can't take the bad weather, so you just have to do what you gotta do. He's the one that brought the bears home. This is Reno, and he is a giant schnauzer. This is not something that's happened just all of a sudden, trust me. I've been doing this, like I said, for many, many years. I don't think anybody could have enough dogs. I mean, dogs are your buddies. That's the dogs, about a dozen of them. Next, exotic parrots. Ah! You shut up. Ah! You shut up. What did I tell you about that, talking like that? Give mama a kiss. You love mama? Oh, I love you too. He's very intelligent. He can do all kinds of little things when he wants to, but getting him to do it's another story. It's like, you know, I don't have to, don't make me. From there, it's horses, about 10 of them. And then an unlikely friend, a fully grown adult steer. He's a very good pet. I probably could ride him if I wanted to, but he's a very good pet. Everybody thinks I ought to sell him, but I can't sell him. I, he's a pet. Shrek is a miniature mule. That's his mama right there. Yes, that's a bear off in the distance, and its neighbors do eat a lot. This is what the tigers eat. This is my so-called dispensary. They get chicken. This is what they're getting today. They're getting steaks, yum. You heard right, tigers. You have to try to give them variety. You have to give them chicken, you have to give them beef, pork, you give them horse meat. We do get deer in. This is the freezer for chicken. My people that work for me, so what I have them do is I have them take the chicken out and I make them look at the label for the weight and I tell them exactly how much I want fed every day. So for them to calibrate it, and then we have records that we keep on how much they eat, who didn't eat what today. Technically, USDA requires you to do that, but I, you know, 
I do it on my own because if something happens, I can go to the vet and say, okay, this is what this tiger's done all week long, and he has a better frame of mind of what's happening. This is what the bears eat. This is the bear freezer. We have yogurts, we have butter, we have creams, rice pudding, a little bit of everything. Their favorite, ice cream. <laughs> if you're getting a feeling that this is Noah's Ark, you are right. Bonnie is a serious animal lover. Just think about what all those treats cost. Her two American black bears were accidental strays. The 750,000 black bears in America kill less than one person per year, and attacks in captivity are rare. But is Bonnie at risk with her bears? The answer to that is more about how they are looked after rather than whether or not they are dangerous. Contrast that with 26 deaths by dog attack each year, although there are millions of dogs in the U.S. alone. This is Bam Bam and Pebbles. They're about four years old now. They came to me. Uh, I have big black schnauzer I have. He's a giant. They were following him, and I thought they were dogs, but they end up being bears. And once they got the bottle and got realized what was going on, they became my pets. These are American black bears. Come on. Show them how tall you are. Good boy. Good boy. Good girl. Oh, mama, baby loves you. Mama loves you. I know. And these are my babies, and they've got really long claws, as you can tell. And they usually tear me up. There you go. Good girl. Pebbles, bam, bam, stand down. Come on. Come on. Good boy. Good boy. Hey, you're stealing them. OK. They're stealing them. They're stealing them. Good boy. Yes, sir. Mama loves you. I love these bears. You can get in here and I can mess with them. Of course, you don't want to ever trust them because they show no, no sign that they're going to attack you. I have been bit. I've been clawed. I've been knocked down by them. And usually I carry a taser with me when I'm in here out here by myself so I can get up. And she's about as unpredictable as you can get. I've scared her and she's turned around and, you know, I walked up on her too quiet and I've scared her and she, she came at me. But, you know, it wasn't an attack. As soon as she realized it was me, she stopped. I can't express enough that these are wild animals and their mind can change at any moment. They can be killers in a matter of seconds if they wanted to. I have found with my experience with animals, exotics, domesticated, you feed them well, you take care of them well, you give them plenty to eat, they seem to be fine. When you start not feeding them and doing what you're not supposed to do, you hurt them, then they hurt you back. If you come at them aggressively, they're gonna come right back to you aggressively. Like if they're doing something, and she's wanting to bite me, I just change her mind and go, no, 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 you know, it's okay. You know, you turn the tables on them. And loud noises will scare them. There's times that, like I'm doing something and they're being nosy. If I don't want them around, I'll slap the side of the tank and they run. I'm not a bear expert and never claim to be, but being with these, and these are my first challenge with them, I've learned a lot. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's been trial and error. I think they're doing good. I think, I think I'm doing okay with them. I mean, some people may say I'm not, but they seem happy to me, don't they, to you? They're very easy to take care of. I, I'm really surprised. I've offered them meat. I've offered them fish. I put four rolls of hay out there day four yesterday. Look how easy they mangled it. <laughs> they go up in the trees. They get on them. They climb up on them. I mean, they get way up there. They come down to eat and to pick on me. Have you touched one? Come here. Bam, bam. Come over here on this side, touch the butt. These bears can be dangerous, but that is also part of their appeal. And this could be why predator pets are popular. The 
feeling of being with these animals is a mixture of fear and fascination. Well, I'm slightly worried now. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, he's licking me. <laughs> oh, dinner. <laughs> <laughs> They're very strong. They can take a log and they can literally push it, move it wherever they want to. Oh, look at that. Is that good? When she comes in heat, she gets a little cantankerous and she can get pretty rough with him. But he doesn't show any aggression. He, he just does his own thing, gets in a different tree. <laughs> like a man, goes to a man cave. <laughs> but this is my baby right here. This is my baby. My main concern is keeping them where they're supposed to be, keep them fed, and like I said again, as long as you feed them, feed them well, they're not going anywhere. And these guys here can't go back out in the wild because they don't know how to feed themselves. So basically they're mine until I die, and then when I'm dead, I have a sanctuary that's gonna take them, and that will take them and the cats. So they already have a place to go. This way people won't have to say, well, she's an old woman. Where are they gonna go when she dies? Well, there is a place for them to go. And it's a wonderful place. And they will care for them like I care for them. Been there a zillion times to keep on different times and make sure how they take care of their animals. And I'm very impressed. I don't know how long they're gonna live and how long I'm gonna live. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> They stand on the edge, and this is what happens to my $500 stock tank. Huh? More toys? Huh? For our crew, bears are one thing, but Bonnie's apex pets require a little more respect. It is estimated that there are more tigers in the U.S. than in the wild globally. Bonnie's younger tiger was born in captivity, and to Bonnie, he is just a big, playful cat. She's, you know, just that playful teenager stage where everybody's a toy and everything we have is a toy. No, 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 gentle, gentle. gentle. You notice how she has not hurt the dog? Mm -hmm. She hasn't yelped or anything? That's called chuffing. <laughs> she goes, what was that? Oh, 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 don't run, don't run. Oh, oh, are you okay? The concern is what will happen when the big cat reaches maturity. Incidents of pet tigers killing people are rare, but we have to always remember they are an apex killer. So Bonnie, one way or the other, is taking a risk. Here, Bonnie? Bonnie, here's no. a stick. No, I got it. No, you stop. Now, come on. Ooh. Don't bite my leg. Not just with one tiger, her second one is a fully grown female. Well, she came to me seven years ago. She had ringworm and a yeast infection all over her hair. And she was pretty poor, but now she, you can tell she's magnificent. She's healthy, you know? And uh, she's not that she doesn't like that cat. She's just telling it to back off. But she's my baby, and I love her. Well, she weighs 450 pounds. I go in there and pet her, and I do, I do ever clean the pen, do everything like I do with the regular, like I did with the other cat. But when people are here and the cameras, she gets bashful. So, and I think, you know, I mean, she's back here in the back. She don't get uh, a lot of people here to socialize with her. If she had more people to socialize with her, she'd probably be all over us. But really, she's a very good cat. She's not mean, she's not aggressive. You know, when she's scared, you saw what she did. You know, she kind of growls a little bit, you know, but I mean, that's just to show you to back off. You know, she's a tiger, again, you know, don't feed her, she'll eat you. I've only been scared of one cat in my life. I was in the pen with two cats, and I was against the fence like this, and they double-teamed me. 
one come here and one come here. They've never hurt me, but it is definitely a feeling that, you know, okay, this could be it. <laughs> you know, but otherwise, I, I no, I'm not afraid of them. I mean, I should be, I mean, I'm very caught, uh, let's, let's put that a different way. I'm very, I'm not scared of them, but I'm very cautious of them. You, you can't, I, I don't know how to explain this feeling, but I mean, I just don't have the fear of them, but I know they can kill me. I know they can hurt me. You know, I don't turn my back on them. Um, I mean, I know what they are. I know that they can be uh, an aggressive animal and they can be friendly one day and be an idiot the next day. The thing is, is when you're feeding them meat, get out of the pen. Why do you want to be there? They're eating. If they're having a bad day, why irritate them? Leave them alone. Let them just have, go through their bad day. It's a sense you have with animals, you know. If you have that sense, your chances of getting hurt is minute, you know. But if you're bullying them or doing things and you don't pay attention, then you get hurt, and that's what usually happens with people. They're not for everybody, you know, and not everybody wants them. They're a big expense. They cost a lot of money every month to feed. It's not that they're a lot of work, but you have to take care of them. You have to know when something's wrong with them. But that's the whole idea of owning animals anyway, isn't it? Oh, oh come on, new stuff. Come on, mama, come on. Anushka. It comes from Alaska and it means the first ray of light. So that's what I thought of. And then Sunita, the little one's name, is a Spanish name for beauty. But those are my children, as children go. The American bison is an unpredictable and at times lazy and unconcerned animal. They appear peaceful, but this large mammal has a temperament that is totally unpredictable. Bison roam the plains of North America in their millions. Hunting decimated their population down to less than 1,000 animals. Today, things are looking up. The population is growing, and to one family, a pet bison is the perfect house companion, even if the house is a little A-frame cottage on the plains of Texas. People that don't know me think I'm crazy, and the people that know me know I'm crazy. <laughs> I've been here for 31 years, and I've been training horses for a living, and I use buffalo or bison to train my horses with. Yeah, I was fascinated with them when I was a kid and never thought about even owning one. I don't think when I was young you could legally own a bison. They're a little on the crazy side, and most people that raise cattle don't want to mess with them because they tear your pens and stuff up. They're a lot wilder than a cow is, and they're harder to handle for most people, but if you know how to handle them, they're almost as easy to work as cattle are. Sharon and R.C. are both extreme animal lovers. We both have the fascination with bison. I'm not much for the little bitty dogs or anything like that. I like the wildlife. And that's one reason why R.C. and I, you know, fit together, because we both like the wildlife. The more Western it is, the better we both like it. The first time I ever saw a bison, of course, was R.C. I mean, you know, in life, you know, I mean, I've seen them on TV and all that, but first time was whenever R.C. brought some home to train his, you know, cutting horses. After that, we decided to own Wild Thing and he become our pet. Keeping a bison as a pet does have its challenges. They can weigh up to 2,700 pounds and run at over 30 miles per hour. And they can get a little grumpy. A lot of times you gotta go in the pen with them. And you gotta know your distance and everything because if you get too close, they're gonna come after you or they're gonna run away. 
And if they don't run away real quick, they're fixing to come and get you. They're uh, the largest land animal in the United States that native to the United States. They can outrun any horse. It's always dangerous being around a herd of bison because you don't know when one's gonna attack you. And I have had them horn my horses and knock my horses all the way down on top of me. I've been in that situation a lot. Uh, one particular cow one time come after me, and if I hadn't had a jacket, I threw it on top of her horns, and I got out of the pen while she was fighting the jacket. He got me down one time, three times in one day, and uh, my wife had to dress me for three days. <laughs> Hello? He knocked me down. He was wanting me to be a buffalo and play with him, but Hello? I got to an ax handle and explained to him we didn't do that. <laughs> R.C. counts Wild Thing as his pet and his companion on the ranch. This big bison is, at times, almost cute. Wild Thing, of course, you know, I mean, he's a little orange calf, you know, whenever we get him. He's about two and a half, three months old. And uh, of course, RC's trying to halter train him and, and everything, and he conquers that. But then I have a brilliant idea, and I said, well, why don't we bring Wild Thing in the house? Hello, Wild Thing. And he says, you don't understand. He is a bison. He could tear up your house. You may not have nothing left. No. Well, you only live once. You bring your cats and your dogs and your kids in the house, so might as well. So ever since then, we've been bringing Wild Thing in the house, and he's grown up with us. He has lots of personality. Even though he's a bison, he's got personality. I mean, if he gets his feelings hurt, he goes and pouts. And you know when he pouts, because he just has that certain look in his face and the certain movements that he gives. Wild Thing also likes to be pushy sometimes, but then again, Wild Thing can be loving. Wild Thing! Hello, baby boy. But only to RC and I. Only the past 10 years, I've been able to actually touch him and groom him. I mean, I'm always out there taking pictures of him and different things like that. I can wear fringe and wear big headdresses that I make with feathers. RC, he can't wear fringe around him, not safely. So, you know, and I think it's because uh, Wild Thing's used to RC being just a cowboy, and he's used to me being just out there, because, I mean, I am, I'm always out there. So he never knows what to expect of me. <laughs> but there's times that Wild Thing is sitting outside, relaxing, and I may, kind of crawl in and lay close to him. I can't touch him, I can't lay up against him because then he'll jump up. But I do lay in there with him and then sometimes RC and I both will lay in there together. And I mean, you know, he can be, you know, seem real sweet, but, but he's not a, you know, sweet animal per se, you know, I mean, he is a very dangerous animal for others. Well, I'd afraid he might tear up stuff, you know, if we brought him in. But when I brought him in, it was kind of odd because he behaved himself in here. And then pretty soon I was leaving the door open and he'd come back and forth in the house. And But he never used the bathroom in the house. If he'd ever used the bathroom in the house, this deal would have never happened. He potty trained himself. I, I do not have a clue how you could potty train a buffalo. <laughs> 
Now that he's gotten big, we have to move coffee tables and couches around. It's like having a small car come through your house. He has a hard time getting his horns through the doors. We've had people eat with us before at their own risk, <laughs> but it's not probably perfectly safe for them, although I'm willing to lay down my life to save theirs. When the grandkids come over, we have to put up fences, we have to put up everything in the house. We don't have to when wild thing comes yeah. out. I'd rather have the wild thing in the house than my grandkids most of the time. <laughs> so far, he hadn't tore up anything. He hadn't, he's just been perfect in the house. He, he looks at everything, he's real curious about everything in the house, but he doesn't tear up anything. A lot of times, as soon as he walks out of the house, he'll knock my barbecue pit over but it's outside. But in the house, he's a perfect gentleman. He's unpredictable. <laughs> in the house, he's pretty predictable. Outside, uh, he's really a crazy, wild, crazy animal outside. He's very dangerous for anybody else to be around. It's taken 10 years for Sharon to be able to go around them safely. And I still want to be there for her because I will attack him I can't win, but he thinks I can win. <laughs> Always being the alpha, you gotta be the alpha. You gotta have enough courage to stand up to him even though you know you can lose. I don't have a chance against him, but he thinks I can. Once I get him by the horns, he thinks I got him. It's a big bluff. It is likely that Wild Thing is the only fully trained bison in the world. His skills go beyond wrecking the fences. He pulls a chariot, plows a garden. He was her best man at her wedding. My boy's the first one to ski behind a buffalo on, on sand. And my daughter's the first one to snow sled behind a buffalo. He eats at the dining room table with us. Any crazy thing I can think of to do, I do it. He's the first one to ever pull a canoe. There are times that Wild Thing seems to get what's going on, even at a big event like his owner's wedding. I just thought it was something different to, to do. I didn't know anybody ever know about it but us, but uh, yeah. I thought it was kind of cool to have a bison or buffalo as a best man. Our minister, he knew us already, so... He wasn't real comfortable, uh, though. <laughs> no, he wasn't real comfortable, but he, he liked it. I mean, he thought it was neat, you know, and, and he only said, only for us, not for everybody. Our wedding has been all over the world. He was a good gentleman. He did throw the rings off his horn, so... I see him as a little baby. <laughs> I don't see him as a big, big buffalo. He's a baby to me. He's not big to me because I've raised him and he's still a baby to me. Yeah. And when you look at his little face, it just looks so sweet. So you just fall in love with him, you know. I have no fear of him at all, but I do know when not to mess with him. He's, he's moody. There's sometimes I know that I better leave him alone. There is no doubt that this is a dangerous animal. It could escape and cause a lot of trouble. But to date, Wild Thing has seldom wandered beyond his local street. If he gets out, everybody just take pictures from their porch, but they know not to go around him. Yeah. He, go he goes down the road about a quarter of a mile and fights a cedar tree. And I learned the first time I went down there, I better let him fight the cedar tree for a little while because he'll come after me if I try to make him quit too soon. Mm -hmm. So I let him go ahead and fight it for a little while, then I'll put a rope around his horns and lead him home. He's got a real big barn, and he has fans in it, and I water the ground every day because it's hot this time of year, and he stays pretty comfortable. Of course, his favorite place is in the house. I go over there and feed him every day. I can pour the feed in the trough. If you try to pour the feed in the trough, he'd kill you. Mm -hmm. He don't want anybody feeding him but myself and Sharon. I have let other people feed him through the fence and he'll attack them. RC treats Wild Thing with mutual respect, but it is RC who has to do the cleaning up. 
I just got a lot of joy out of them. I got to clean his poop out of the yard every, every day. And I'm, you know what, I'm glad it's out there so I can clean it up because I, I just enjoy them. I brush them every day. I spend more time with him than I do my wife. I'm in the pen with him when he's tearing up stuff usually. He may be throwing the canoe in the air or tearing the fences up. I stay in the pen with him. He's, ever since he hurt me one time pretty good, uh, he's never, I think he knows he hurt me and now he don't want to. And the hard part when we're filming or doing something out there and, and we want a video or something, I can't get close to him when he's tearing up stuff. But for the opposite reason, you think. If I get close to him, he's gonna quit. Cause he's gonna protect me by quitting. So if I wanna share him doing a video of him tearing up a fence. I gotta stay back far enough that he won't quit. Cause once I get in a danger zone, he shuts it down. He knows I'm his best friend because I never do anything against him. I do everything for him. Well, I think I'll be here all his life. All of his life. Yeah, we'll, ne we'll never give up one wild thing. He, he, hopefully, he's middle age. He's 12 now, and he should live to be around 25 at least. I hope. Mm -hmm. And he's not. He's not going anywhere. There's no amount of money could ever buy him. Mm He'll -hmm. never be for sale. Never. And he would be too dangerous for anybody else to have. And one thing about the bison, there are some other trainers. There have been other trainers. I've known four of them killed in the last five years. And they kill nearly all their trainers. And he may kill me, but I hope he don't. <laughs> and I sure want to protect her. It's hard to define Tippi Hedren, the Hollywood legend and star of the Birds, Marnie, Roar, and the Countess from Hong Kong. She has been an active humanitarian, creator of a multi-million dollar manicuring industry, and is the only actor to have worked on films with both Alfred Hitchcock and Charlie Chaplin. But her real passion is with the beauty and majesty of the big cats. Her recent biography looks into her acting career but spends more time on her love of animals. Tippi is the founder of Shambhala, a sprawling 40-acre wild animal sanctuary a few hours north of Los Angeles. Shambhala is home to around 30 big cats. I can't even imagine my life without, without these big cats. I can't even imagine it. I mean, they've given, given me so much. Certainly on understanding the species and totally respecting the qualities that are inborn into those beings and what is in that brain and, and uh, what activates those instincts and uh, just getting to know these animals. It's been a great honor. It's been something that we have to have done to be able to give them the life that we have given them, to be able to understand them. We can't understand everything about them. Enough to really give them a good life. There's something very, very fascinating about, about something of great beauty. The personality of the great cat is varied and um, elaborate and dangerous, and um, you know, they can kill you. Uh, without even thinking twice about it. Well, I've always been in love with them, even before I even had a possibility of going to Africa. Seeing them actually in their own environment, in their own way of life, and, and being free, and it was an astounding time. Shambhala Reserve is not a zoo or an animal park. It was set up to take on the role of looking after animals that no longer had a home in the U.S. Some were dropped off at the gates, 
Others have come from circuses or zoos, and many from private pet ownership. It is estimated that over 3,500 tigers alone are in private ownership in the U.S., with many of them now too large to look after. I don't know the exact numbers of them, but I know it has diminished because people are getting smarter. I mean, you're with the, with the uh, exotic feline, you're dealing with an apex predator. You're dealing with an animal who could just as soon kill you as just walk across the room. They are extremely dangerous. They have instincts born in them that can never be removed. And um, they are dangerous. Tibby Hedren knows too well the dangers. During the production of her feature film, Roar, Tigers and Lions featured heavily in the story. This meant working closely with a number of dangerous animals, and incidents did happen. I had seen a number of accidents caused by these animals. I was hurt, my, you know, practically all the people on our movie had some sort of a, an encounter with uh, one of the animals, with a lion or a tiger. And, um, oh, they were going to name a, a wing at the Palmdale Hospital after us because we were there so much. <laughs> Melanie Griffith, Tippy's daughter, a well-known actor in her own right, was also on the set of Roar. Melanie was very used to having the big cats around, but even then, things can go wrong. Gosh, she was uh, leaned over. She did something. Anyway, one of the cats uh, was a lion, and it got her right across her forehead. I just grabbed her and ran, got out the gate, and put her in the car, and we went to the doctor. And she had to have a whole, you know, all these stitches put in her forehead. Fortunately, he did a really good job. You'd never know it. So I do know from where I speak, you know, these are not animals that should be in somebody's home as a pet or in, in captivity in somebody's backyard in an eight by 10 cage or, you know, that kind of confinement. I think the American public is becoming smarter. They're becoming more aware of the fact that this is a brute, it's, it's simply brutality to have those animals in a circus. It's not only brutal to keep the strict confinement that they're in, the treatment that they have in order to do those stupid tricks that they make them do is, um, it's obscene. It's horrible, and those poor animals, I'm, I, you know, I'm surprised more people haven't been killed by these animals from the treatment they've had. Shambhala is Tippy's home. She shares the 40 acres with her cats. And in the past, it was common for some of the animals to live in the house, even to the point of sleeping on the bed with her daughter, Melanie. Tigers and lions were their pets, so much so that this image of a tiger jumping through the kitchen window was not set up. It was just one of the many daily events that happened over many years of rearing the big cats. But Tippy reached the conclusion that rather than having them as pets, they should be studied and left to live their natural lives rather than be part of the household. The decision was made to stop the interaction with the animals, especially after the dangers became more noticeable. There was a whole group of women. They were in college. They wanted to have a photograph with a tiger. And they found the tiger, and the tiger was trained to stand there and be photographed. And they all went up and had their, their uh, picture taken with the tiger, and one of them went up, and the tiger moved and stepped on the girl's foot, and she screamed, and the tiger jumped her. There are situations that are so frightening and so unnecessary that never should happen. In fact, at one point, I remember gathering my staff around, and I said there will be no more contact with any of the animals again. 
right now, it's over, it's done. And they were all really angry because they, they really enjoyed having that one-on-one -on -one with the animal, with the lion or the tiger. And they were smart, they knew what they were doing, but that doesn't make a difference. You're dealing with an apex predator who has the top say. They have the top word. It's a great honor to have one of these animals be your friend. To know that that animal recognizes you and likes you, but they're a weapon. They're a weapon and they operate simply on their, on their minds and their instincts. And uh, you can't ever forget that. When you're not dealing with a, with a killer, I think any kind of an animal needs to have whoever becomes the, the power of, in, a, in a captive situation must know everything about that species, about what, what does that animal need and what can I give it that they need, not what I feel like giving them. You know, do I, oh well, I've got an eight by 10 cage out in my backyard, that'll be fine. He'll fit in there. That's not enough. No, there's a great deal to know about an animal, any animal that you decide to, to take into your life, no matter what it is. Whether it's, you know, my little cat that just walked by or whatever, what can I give that animal? that will give him a life that he will be content. And if you, if you, if you look at it that way, uh, there probably wouldn't be so many unhappy, um, miserable animals in captivity. I think there are a lot of people who would like to have a wild animal as a pet. You know, of course, it depends on the type of wild animal that you choose. However, if you're choosing uh, an apex predator to become your pet, you're making a very, very like, big mistake, a huge mistake, because the instincts in those animals are in there. It's in their brain, and there's nothing you can do to change that. They will always be a danger. You just don't ever know when it's going to come to the foreground, and most likely you wouldn't have the, the strength or, or the knowledge of how to react to it. I mean, these animals are powerful beyond belief. I don't know, the tensile strength of these animals is one that we can't, in their, in their greatest amount of power that they exude, there isn't any way that you could, you could fight that other than a bullet. I feel very, very grateful that I've been able to have this life with the big cats. I am very grateful that I have managed to become an older woman. I've still got all my limbs and I'm still walking upright because there have been times when I was put in the hospital because you're dealing with an entity that is so powerful and so unforgiving. And, and they're not good at telling you what their plans are. We feel very, very fortunate that we haven't had any serious problems with these animals. And I do not recommend anyone acquiring a lion or a tiger as a pet for any reason. The fascinating thing about them is that you just never know. I mean, you can have 10 years of just absolute angel Angel lion, angel tiger, and then bam. It's like playing Russian roulette. Shambhala has its role. It is one place where lions and tigers can feel safe and cared for. Tibby Hedren has done so much for these animals. They are in captivity, 
But the respect shown to each and every one of them goes without saying. But the final word on owning a predator pet is a warning. With the exotic cats, you're dealing, you're dealing with a serial killer. Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. Gilbert's Bar G Ranch sits between the Rocky Mountains and the Sinbad Desert in Castledale, Utah. Since the 70s, Dwayne Gilbert has run a variety of livestock, including cattle and horses. Today, semi-retired, he raises a small herd of Grant Zebra. Horses have been domesticated for thousands of years. Yet despite how similar they appear, zebra have never been tamed. They've had lions chasing them for thousands of years, okay? Anything new, anything happens, they run. That's the only thing they know is to run or bite and kick. So if they're cornered, they're gonna bite and kick. I've heard stuff on TV that they've seen instances where a zebra could crush a lion's head. I would believe it. Dwayne has been running zebra for around 20 years and applies the knowledge he's gained from raising horses. We raised horses for a lot of years. We. Uh, we had a, a breeding stallion, run 20 head of brood mares. Um, so I, I understood horses a lot. And a friend of ours in California says, you know, you like horses. You do really well. You gotta try zebras. And so we bought a few zebras and we just really enjoyed them. When we got our first zebras, it was a little bit cold. So I called the zoo and they said, oh, you have to have heated barns and you have to have this and you have to have that. So I did that and the zebras were beating each other up. They didn't like being contained. And so I, when I called my friend, he says, turn them loose. Zebras have to have a place to go. I turned them loose and everything was fine. To an experienced rancher like Dwayne, handling a zebra herd is not unlike raising other, more common livestock. When we load the babies up, when they're ready to wean, we'll go up to our corrals and I'll feed them up there and we'll put them in a corral. The next day I'll feed outside the corral and I'll just stand at the gate and wait for the ones to come out that I don't want until we have what we want left in there. We go from there 
into a loading alley and, and right into a horse trailer. It's like working with wild horses or cattle. They're not broke to lead. You're not gonna just push them in. If you'll notice, I fed my zebras, I strung the hay out. They're just like other animals. They have a pecking order. If you don't string it out, if you've got it all in one container in a feeder, you're gonna have three or four in there and you're gonna have them kicking and biting and they'll still grab the hay, pull it out of the feeder and eat it off the ground. And so I rather bring it out here where there's some grass and it's a little bit cleaner and string it out, let the zebras find their pecking order and they have a place to run. They have a place to go more than just 10 feet in case something happens. Dwayne's years owning zebra have made him highly knowledgeable about his striped equine herd. If there's a situation that we have to have a vet here, then we'd, we'd sure call him. I've used a couple of different vets. I know more about them than they do, but they're there with their experience and so that they can help do their end of it. As far as bringing them in, putting them in a chute or something, uh, you know, I'm more familiar with them and they just kind of stand back and then when we get them in there, then they, they're able to do what they can. While many zebra owners raise their unusual pets to be fully domesticated, Dwayne prefers his to remain wild. I leave them wild for a reason. I, I don't haul their break. I don't bottle feed my baby zebras. When I want zebras in my herd, I want them so that they're scared of me, okay? I don't want one that's not scared of me to where uh, if, if there's an incident, it's gonna, you know, hurt me. I don't want that. As any other animal, especially equine, you take a stallion, and if they're not scared of you, when they get their hormones, a, a, a horse of any kind, you don't know if they can turn on you or at some time bite you, and zebras are the same. And if they're tame, they're not scared of you. And I can take my stallions and, and uh, th they're just like this. Slow down a little bit, bud. You can feed them, they'll come up to you, be right by you when you wanna feed them. But if you move, they're gone, okay? I like that. Another thing I like about this, this is natural out here. There's cleaner grass, they have an area, they're not in a corral where it's chances of uh, infections or stuff. As a practiced rancher, Dwayne is always alert when working around large animals, especially unpredictable wild animals with a kick that can easily crack a skull. We do have coyotes here. We have mountain lions that will come down occasionally from the mountains. One of the things we have to watch is dogs. A zebra will kill a dog real fast. And yet, if they're in a contained area, the dog will scare them. So that's, again, if they're out here, they're fine. They'll chase a dog down because it's a predator to them and they're gonna defend their babies. If I could probably walk over there, but anybody different, uh, they, it, they're just scared. They're leery of anything new, anything, you know, more than one person out here. Zebras are aggressive animals, and fights between males are common and violent. In May of 2018, a woman in Zimbabwe was attacked by a zebra she had kept as a pet for 10 years. It bit off her thumb and part of one breast. Even as an old hand, highly experienced in handling livestock, Dwayne has been on the receiving end of a zebra's bad mood. There was a time I sold a, a little male zebra and he was, I think, three or four months old. And the guy wanted me to deliver him. So in order to keep it calm, to keep from hurting itself, I rode in a horse trailer with it and I had a halter on it and I would hold it. And he kept trying to bite my leg. 
every time, every time he, he'd think he was okay, he'd go wham and he'd try to bite my leg and I'd have to hold his head up. You know, another time we weaned a baby uh, that was just a, a week old from its mother. And I usually run them through a, a chute that's got rubber belting on it to protect them. And then we just let the mother out and hold the baby. Well, I got in with the baby after the mother got out and she was going over the top trying to bite me. I thought, you know, this is not a good situation. I should have been farther away, but luckily she couldn't reach me. But there again, she was protecting her baby. A strong protective instinct and an equally strong tendency to startle makes for a highly unpredictable animal. So do zebras make good pets? People want some that are bottle fed. When they want a bottle fed one, they take them anywhere from two days old up to 10 days old to 30 days old, and they can still bottle feed them. When they bottle feed them, it just makes them gentler. Uh, petting zoos want a gentle zebra, okay? People that uh, want to put one with a couple of horses and have in their yard, in their pasture, they, they want one that's calmer, so they'll buy one and raise it on a bottle. Other people, I've seen them take them at six months old, 10 months old, uh, a year old, and put a halter on them and still break them to late. They take a lot of work in order to get them at that point though. A bottle fed baby will, will bond with uh, the person that's feeding it. We've seen an instance in uh, California one time, we visited some friends and they had a little bottle baby zebra and it was only 30 days old and they had kind of a party. Well, this zebra would follow its mother around, which is feeding her, you know, on a bottle, follow her around, and if somebody would come up and talk to her, she would get in between the two people. Like, this is my mom, leave her alone. <laughs> Dwayne also breeds and sells his zebras, and his customers have a whole range of different reasons for wanting to own one. You know, I've been raising them over 20 years, and uh, you know, uh, you just, I don't know, it just seems like we have a number of people every year still call and say, you know, I got a zebra from you, I want another one, and of course, petting zoos, they've been good clients. There's still so much of the public out there that doesn't know that you can own a zebra. And it seems owning zebras can also bring some completely unexpected surprises and special moments. One time a young girl from Salt Lake called me. She had heard we had zebras and she had just loved them. And I didn't know her. She called and says, if we brought a photographer down, could we get some pictures of me in my wedding dress no. with the zebras? And I says, you can try. But I says, you put a white dress on and step out in front of them zebras and they're gonna leave. And she says, well, I'd really like to try. I just love everything about zebras. Her and her mother showed up and she got in her wedding gown and had the photographer down here. And we came down here and I put some feed out for the zebras and they left the feed and walked right up behind that girl in that white dress like, that is something different. You just don't know how they're gonna act. So many times I think they're gonna just run and get away from anything that's new, and yet all of a sudden they'll turn around and, and say, hey, this doesn't scare us. See, we've got one here that says, there is something different over there. <laughs> they may not make good riding or working livestock, and their flighty nature makes them dangerous. But it's clear that the lives of Dwayne and his family are obviously enriched by having their very own zebra herd. We love our zebras. I'll come out here in my truck and watch them and watch them. And, and you'll see the same thing as you'll see zebras in the wild. And to watch them run and play, especially the babies, you know, you'll get four or five babies together and they'll just run around the pasture playing and, and dart in and out of the other mares. And they're an animal. So you just have to watch them and learn learn about them. Wow. 
Well, yes, they're cute, all right. Aren't they a little unusual looking? Yes, they're monkeys. Chimpanzees share 98% of our DNA. Their intelligence, playful nature, and their resemblance to human babies once made them popular entertainers and even popular pets. Oh, boy, please stick that in your mouth. Please. Now, boy, you mustn't fight like this. Danny, sit up here in the chair. Out of all kinds of creatures that you could have as pets, chimps are probably the worst pet that you can ask for, for the chimp's benefit. You may get the greatest joy in the world by having a chimp, but what does the chimp get out of it? Martin Collette is the founder of Wildlife Way Station, an exotic animal sanctuary that a colony of 40 chimpanzees now call home. Chimps need chimps. They need to grow up in a colony with young chimps and old chimps and in-between chimps and chimps of personality, cranky chimps and happy chimps and dominant chimps and subordinate chimps and chimps learn by watching. And baby chimps learn everything by watching the adults. And they grow up with chimpanzee skills, which then allows them to take the rightful place in the world of chimpanzees. Having worked closely with chimpanzees for more than 40 years, primatologist Bob Ingersoll agrees. I mean, it's like being a human. You could build me the nicest apartment on the, on the planet. I could live here in this apartment and have a beautiful view like I do, but if I didn't have anyone to talk to or anyone to express my, my humanness to, uh, that would be a pretty harsh existence. Chimps need other chimps, just like humans need other humans. Bob was part of the controversial NIM research project in the 1970s in which researchers explored captive chimpanzees' ability to learn language. Chimps are chimps. Uh, bats are bats. And they, and they behave with their genetic predisposition, but on the cellular level, they're very similar to us. So it makes sense to me that those animals are thinking just like us. I actually had two years of experience before I met Nim, and Nim came back to the University of Oklahoma in September of 1977. So I knew all of his brothers. I uh, knew several of his other siblings that were twins, several female and male chimps. But I, I took to Nim quickly, and, uh, and I saw Nim as a needy chimp that needed a friend, and I wanted to be his friend. Bob worked very closely with Nim and his siblings, teaching them American Sign Language. He eventually learned that chimpanzees are not as similar to human beings as we'd like to think. First and foremost, chimps need to be with other chimps. Secondarily, they need an area, a, a place where they can be together that's comfortable to them. And in captivity, that's very difficult. I mean, I work with a number of sanctuaries, and, and that's always our problem, that uh, no matter what, you can't give them freedom. We do what I call the illusion of freedom as best we can, but at the end of the day, they're still in captivity. And like I keep saying, captivity is the enemy. In most U.S. states, it is now illegal to own a chimp. And since 2015, when captive chimpanzees were classified as an endangered species, they can no longer be used in invasive testing. A few years ago, the United States, you know, put a moratorium on that and then ended it. And NIH and, and uh, the government agencies that own the chimps that, that were part of all that are now in the process of retiring them. Uh, chimp Haven has been established, which is the National Chimp Sanctuary in, in uh, Louisiana. There are several hundred chimps there and probably several hundred more that will be going there. So, so chimps in the United States are, are at least the ones that were institutionally held by either the government or, or pharmaceutical manufacturers or drug companies or hospitals. They're now in the process of retiring those animals. The pets, on the other hand, and the entertainment chimps, not quite so lucky. Most of my colony is from biomedical research, and I am 
pleased and proud to say chimpanzees are amazing. They are very philosophical. They do learn. They adapt well. And we probably have the biggest uh, group of chimpanzees in the Western United States here. And there are bigger chimp sanctuaries in Florida and in uh, Louisiana. And they have, of course, bigger grounds and big opportunities than we do here. But based on all the knowledge I have had, we've had only one really, really tragic uh, chimp that came to us. He was a self-mutilator and he would bite and rip and destroy anything from the end of his fingers to as far as he could reach with his mouth on both arms and hands and down his legs. And it took us five years before we could stop that type of behavior. But stop we did. Well, actually, he did. We gave the opportunities, we gave different options, and he adjusted and adapted. And towards the latter part of his days, the last few years of his life, he lived in a group of chimpanzees. And I'm thrilled. Many chimps now living in sanctuaries came from private owners who learned that baby chimps may be cute, but adolescent and adult chimps can be deadly. No, I, I wouldn't say that a chimpanzee was necessarily a predator in the sense that a big cat or a lion or, or any of those, you know, or a crocodile or, or barracuda fish or whatever, you know, are predators. But in the wild, chimpanzees cooperatively hunt. They eat monkeys, they, they hunt monkeys, they hunt bush buck, uh, and that's fairly natural. Uh, I, I think that's also, you know, I, I'm interested in chimp cognitive behavior, and, and when, you, when you understand what they do in the hunting situation in the wild, it's fairly complicated. They send out points, they, they, they talk amongst each other, they move the animal to the tree that they're going to you know, do whatever. So the planning and, and the advanced thinking and those sorts of things that you see in that context are, are, are complicated. And they are definitely preying on those monkeys. Those who do choose to take on chimpanzee ownership rarely keep their dangerous pets for more than a few years. Very seldom, very seldom. By the time a chimp is five, six years old, sometimes seven, it's already becoming a chimp. It's assertive and it wants to do this. And unless you understand chimps and you are a good and a kind trainer, you're not gonna be able to teach this chimp what you need him to do because you're not treating him in that manner. This is your, this is your pet, this is your baby, and they can be dangerous. As you've heard about some of the accidents that happen throughout the world, they're pretty brutal. In 2009, Charla Nash was severely mauled by her friend's exotic pet. She lost both her hands, her nose, ears, and her sight. Time for 911, where's your emergency? Oh, this is Katie. 241 Rock Rock Crimson Road. What's Send the problem? The police. Send the police. He's killing my friend. Who's killing your friend? Get my chimpanzee. He, he ripped her apart. Hurry up. With a gun. Hurry up, please. There's someone on the way. What gun, please? You shoot him. What is the monkey doing? Tell me what the monkey is. Oh, he, he ripped her face off. The easily visible muscles on this chimp with alopecia show just how strong these chimpanzees are. Combine that strength with almost human intelligence, and the chimp can be a formidable threat. Chimps are dangerous because most people do not understand what is a chimpanzee. In the world of chimpanzees, might is right. You know, there is a very definitive hierarchy and so on and so forth. There is order in a chimp colony, 
It may not appear so for somebody standing outside and watching some of the behavior, but there is order. But chimps are dangerous. They are five times as strong as you are. They have an intellect of five, six, and occasionally even a seven-year-old child. That's very bright. They can plan, they can figure, they can create situations where they will pre-plan things. So, and they're also, they can be very volatile. And so somebody does something against them, they're explosive and volatile. And they have teeth this long, and I've got arms, and they can do serious damage to people. Due to recent changes to legislation, sanctuaries are also seeing an increase in surrendered pet chimps. Well, I, I think that uh, those people that own chimps uh, are less out there now. I think that those people uh, should be examining the next step, which would be sanctuary. The pet chimps especially, I think because I work at the Center for Great Apes, I know what they do and I know it's righteous. I know that they've taken animals in that, that didn't, you know, you wouldn't think would have a chance to be integrated into a group and then become a chimp, but I've seen it happen. And, uh, and I know people that have turned their chimps over to us who we don't, we don't deny them access. They get to come and visit. We don't disallow them from coming to visit their ex-pets. But uh, we have a number of people that, that had chimp pets that, that realized their mistake and have uh, rectified that by turning their chimps over to us. So, uh, I mean, the reality is that uh, this is ending slowly but surely and it's fewer and fewer chimps are sold in the United States per year. There are probably around 400 chimps that are still kind of up in the air in terms of what's going to happen, where they're going to go and slowly but surely we are attempting to move the chimps that aren't in an accredited situation into an accredited situation. Chimpanzees that come to sanctuaries from private ownership situations often have a hard time learning how to be chimps again. The chimps who've never seen grass or trees or sky or birds, I mean, they're startled by it and they're a little leery of it. They can be fearful to step outside, but a chimp's got a great brain and it's curious and it does step out eventually and it, it will sit and it will look and it will figure things out, and it'll watch by example. Most chimpanzees raised in captivity still enjoy and even seek out human contact. We here believe in creating an atmosphere where the chimps are trusting of their keepers and of their supervisors, of their people. So you can bring them along you can make them feel secure. You can give them options of friends. They can choose their friends who they want to hang out with. You give a chimp an opportunity and you help it along in the areas where it has not been comfortable. They settle very nicely. There are a number of chimpanzees that have been in situations that are so egregious that I can tell you about one named Clyde who lived for 35 years in a box in a garage. Uh, that's just wrong. And so when an animal like that comes to the Center for Great Apes, we, we read as best we can the behavior of that animal and we do what's best we think for them. If they solicit our, our attention, we give it to them. If they solicit our Grooming, for example, not all of us, but the ones of us that have been clearly trained and checked out so that we don't lose our hands or fingers or whatever, uh, we do that. Uh, what we do more than anything, though, is we try to interject that chimp in with other chimps. We try to introduce them together. And we've been fairly successful at the center. Some captive chimps even prefer being with humans to being with other chimpanzees. There are a couple of cases that, and one in particular, a chimpanzee that I, a beloved chimp to me that passed away a few years ago named Denise. She just didn't get along with chimps. She didn't have that opportunity to be a chimp when she was young, and she didn't like chimps. 
She grew up in the home. She drank beers and cigarettes, used cigarettes. And when she came to us, it was very tough. And she was a tough lady. She didn't like chimps. She wanted to be with humans. And at the end of Denise's life for the last two years, we did the best we could to make her life as, as fun and as positive. Still being around other chimps, just not in direct contact because it, it didn't work out for her. But for the most part, we tried as best we can to get chimps with other chimps. And it's a beautiful thing when you see a chimp that's never been with a chimp grooming one another, rolling around and being a chimp. And when that happens, we don't interject. We purposefully move away from that. We attempt to let them be chimps. We don't approach them if they approach us and they solicit our, you know, like, hey, Bob, come over here, you know, because chimps know how to, you know, get your attention. Like that, for example, or, or you know, <coughs> or whatever, you know, they get your attention, then you know it. And then you, you know, you decide whether or not, you know, that's something that's appropriate or not. The consensus among great ape experts is that chimpanzees need to live like chimpanzees. Martin believes that even captive colonies should be able to live as wild chimps. You know, it's interesting. I believe in the case of chimpanzees, I think every chimp group anywhere in the world should be allowed to reproduce every five, six, seven years. Because a baby in a chimp colony is a glue that keeps them together. It is the joy. They are so alive. They are so interested in the baby. And there are aunts, and there are uncles, and there are kids to play with, and there, everybody loves a baby. And I think the quality of life for chimps is greatly enhanced when every so often there's a baby. So I think, I believe, although we don't do it, but I personally believe we should allow decent-sized groups of chimps to have a baby every so many years. Chimpanzee family groups may seem similar to humans, and their babies may seem just as adorable as human babies. But all that we have learned about chimps tells us that no matter how much they resemble humans, they are simply not meant to live as humans. Well, I am against captivity in the sense that for these animals that shouldn't be captive, but I also understand that they came, they came to be in the situation they are over time and from a time when we don't have the viewpoint we do now. And uh, so some of the chimps are caught up in that. They're, for the most part, they're aging out. I mean, we have a lot of 40, 50-year-old chimps that are uh, passing away in sanctuaries. And as they pass away, the numbers dwindle. And ultimately, I think that uh, those situations will end. And there won't be the surplus of animals that we had in the 60s and 70s and 80s when there wasn't a moratorium on breeding and that sort of thing. Find a nice sanctuary and place that animal in a nice sanctuary to allow this animal to have an opportunity to grow up to be a chimpanzee. In the United Kingdom, exotic pet ownership is on the rise. However, not all owners possess the knowledge or experience to provide adequate care for these animals. Ark Wildlife Park is the United Kingdom's first rescue zoo, homing over 180 animals who have been rescued or donated from private pet ownership. Ark Wildlife Park originally started off life as purely a reptile sanctuary. So all the snakes and lizards in here are ex-pets, and then over the years, people started bringing us more and more unusual and weirder animals. This in here is a little grey banded king snake. This little lady in particular is an albino, so she's got some beautiful coloration on her. And you can see why these guys are popular as a pet species. 
these little snakes and lizards can make great pets because if you go away for the weekend, as long as you've made sure there's someone to give them some fresh water, these guys aren't gonna pine for you like a cat or a dog is going to, and they certainly don't need taking out for walks. So in some respects, they can actually be much less lower maintenance than sort of some of our more traditional pet animals like cats and dogs. But whether you actually get that reciprocal love come back to you, not really, I'm afraid. I don't think she'd ever miss me if I wasn't around. Like with any pet, people really need to do their research. And the other thing you have to factor in, a hamster or a, or a gerbil is going to be with you two, three years. This little lady here, she can potentially be with us for about 20 odd years. So reptiles, as a general rule, not all species, but as a general rule, they can have quite long lifespans. Compared to sort of most pet species, no, they thrive in a much smaller environment because that's what they're sort of designed to do. The reason why you go out into the countryside, you very rarely, if ever, you'll see a snake coming across you because they're too busy hiding. That's what snakes do, I think. So they do like to be sort of like a bit more confined than traditional animals. A small crocodilian, the best way to handle them is to grab them firmly right behind the jawline so they can't swing their head back and grab you. Rudolph's reaching the size now where another foot or so I wouldn't be happy handling him, um, but at this size, one man can easily handle one of these crocodilians if you know what you're doing and you've been trained. Um, again, this is where it comes to, they don't make good pets. You make a mistake, they can easily take your finger off. Just gonna go in behind, grab him by the back of the head, gently ease him out, and then keep your hand locked behind and also support the hind quarters, more for his comfort than anything. Certainly when he starts getting much bigger than this, we wouldn't be actively handling him. Nowhere near fully grown yet, but uh, he's potentially gonna max out about seven or eight foot long. Like most of the animals here on the park, he's one of our rescues, an ex-pet that was being kept illegally. These guys have got one of the strongest bite forces of any animal in the animal kingdom. the crocodilians have got a very powerful bite. Even at this size, this guy could easily remove my fingers, which is why I keep my hands nice and firmly locked behind his jaws, but they're certainly, I couldn't think of a worse animal to have as a pet, really. This guy can potentially live 50 or 60 years. So that's the other thing people have to consider when they get a pet reptile, even the more common pet species like corn snakes and leopard geckos, they're not like a hamster or a gerbil that's gonna be with you a couple of years. They've got the potential, a lot of these pet reptiles, 30, 40 years easily. But of course you have to factor in, uh, potentially they are dangerous. No, he's never bitten me, but I don't give him the chance to. Crocodilians, you can't trust them. It's not like a dog or a cat. Even though he's quite relaxed and laid back as far as crocodilians go, I'd never trust him. I don't give him that opportunity, so I'd never let him just sit on my lap loose, as it were. Uh, it only takes one mistake and you're gonna lose a finger, so it's just not worth it. Another animal that shouldn't be confused for a house pet is the lynx. While they may look like a beautiful feline, the lynx is a wild cat and a very skilled predator. This is Echo and she's our beautiful Eurasian lynx. They cover historically Europe and Asia, used to actually be native here to the UK. And all lynx are characterized by those wonderful little tufts on the tip of the ears and the little short bob tail. And they're the characteristics um, of the four lynx species. She's been with us since she was only a little kit. She's not a rescue, she was brought in as an ambassador animal. We want to start helpfully raising funds for the Iberian lynx breeding project, her close cousin, which is also unfortunately the most endangered wild cat species in the world. I certainly couldn't recommend any wild cat species as being kept as a pet. She certainly has a loyalty to me because she's known me since she was a kit and I can safely come in here with her, but I'm the only one that comes in with her just to be on the safe side. At the end of the day, she's a wild animal. You've got to treat her like that. She's not a domestic cat. Despite the purring and the rolling on her back for belly rubs, it can be very easy to forget that these guys are a wild animal. And uh, she's certainly got the, the strength, the ability, and the armory. These guys have got big, long, old claws and teeth on them to do some nasty damage to me. I certainly, if she was a tiger or a lion, I certainly wouldn't be in here with her, no matter what the bond we have. If you were to have a, a bad day, I'd walk away from the situation, whereas if you're saying like a tiger, I wouldn't. But either way, you've got to remember these are wild animals, so you've got to treat them with that sort of level of respect. They are a predator, basically purely meat eaters, even things like wolves and wild canines. They will actually take uh, vegetable matter into their diet, but cats are strictly, as a general rule, they're, they're meat eaters. They're one of the most efficient predators on the planet. Cats they are fantastically designed to do what they do. Lynx are what you'd call one of the larger members of the small wildcat species, so that excludes things like leopards, cheetahs, tigers and lions. 
they're nowhere near the size of the of the big guys as it were but as far as more the sort of a wild species of small cat like servals ocelots margays they're certainly one of the larger species if people really want to look after an animal like this and they're willing to give it a lovely big enclosure and give it the respect and the time it deserves, then by all means do so, but never be fooled into thinking that this is a suitable pet species um, for sort of 99.5% of people that consider maybe keeping a, a wild cat as a pet, they're really not suitable. Foxes. They're a controversial animal that divide the public's opinion. Some see them as pests and tricksters, while others think they're adorable. Keeping a fox in Britain is legal, however, not without its challenges. They are cheeky, as our crew found out when this guy decided to investigate the camera bag. <laughs> yeah, anything new in their enclosure has to be investigated. <laughs> yeah. That's what you'd call your traditional UK fox. These grey girls, they are actually exactly the same species. They're just a colour variation that you might be more familiar with in North America. We do rarely get this sort of melanistic, dark black grey version in the wild. But all three of these guys were born and bred for the UK pet industry. They're incredibly intelligent animals. As you can see, he's having, enjoying an ear scrunch, much like a dog would. Uh, but this again is where people sometimes think that maybe they're a good alternative to a, a dog, and they really aren't. They haven't had those thousands of years of domestication. They're really not designed to live indoors. We've heard some reports of foxes being kept in people's flats. And again, they really need to be kept outside if you're gonna keep a fox in a nice, big, large outdoor enclosure. They could certainly give you a painful nip. They're not gonna remove a finger. They're not gonna do anything that's gonna cause you any permanent damage, but they could certainly give you a nasty nip if you weren't expecting it. Being a zookeeper, this part of the uh, risk, so we do occasionally when we have to handle these animals, give them vaccinations, they will give you a nip. And it's not a pleasant experience, but I wouldn't class them as a dangerous animal in the same respect as maybe the caiman or the lynx. Not having had that domestication, there's far more chance of getting a nip off a pet fox than there would be a dog. Park Wildlife Park is the home to many different types of animals. Some familiar, like these rabbits, goats, and pigs, and others a little more unusual. But they all have something in common. They were once pets in a private ownership. Park Wildlife Park is the place that animals end up when private pet owners don't or can't care for them. It's important to remember that exotics are not for everyone. These animals will live out their lives in captivity, but play a role in educating the public on the reality of keeping exotic pets. Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides. 
And those who know the dangers, but see the benefits to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. In Abney Park Cemetery, North London, there is an unusual gravesite, a sleeping lion, a memorial to Frank C. Bostock. Frank was a showman who toured with exotic animals throughout Europe. In 1893, he moved to America and connected the masses with these amazing creatures. He is credited as being the first person to bring a pet lion to the U.S. Frank was known to have been mauled several times, which is thought to have contributed to his early death in 1912 at the age of 46. Was this where the owning of great cats as pets began in the U.S. and continues to this day? The Lion Week. And as you can see here, this little pet, Squeaky the Lion, makes a wonderful house pet. The danger factor is always there with these large feline pets, as this old clip shows. Watching it is a little unsettling, but it isn't enough to stop more and more people seeking the unusual as a pet. Animals are family, and it doesn't matter if it's a tiny little house cat or, you know, a lion or tiger or a bear, you have that connection with animals regardless of size. When I was young, I used to think I could save the world. And I was always dragging home misfits, and I worked at a veterinary clinic for a while, and don't put the dog to sleep, I'll find him a home. Jill Carnegie's passion to save animals has become her lifelong mission. But her focus is not just about rehoming the neighborhood dog. In the town of Sharon, Wisconsin, the Valley of the King Sanctuary is home to a large variety of exotic animals abused, abandoned, retired, and injured. These large pets aren't for the faint-hearted. And for Jill, having a rebellious streak has led her to this amazing work. When I was a child, I was always dragging things home and getting into trouble. Um, my mother hates animals. She's 96 years old, she's still alive. And um, we had many, many discussions about animals and I ended up getting married young when I was 17 to basically get out of the house. And I married um, a guy because he had a horse, which is really stupid. But, uh, <laughs> and then we ended up here. I, I divorced him in 96 and then remarried Jim, who loves animals as much as, as I do. We've been married 20 years now. Jill and Jim are dedicated to looking after the welfare of their animals. Sanctuaries are common in the U.S., so there's a need to rehome. In captivity, big cats have been known to attack humans with devastating results. This horrific scene is testament to what can go wrong. A man trying to feed a couple of circus animals finds out the hard way that a tiger is a predator and one that can strike at any time. The defense is a couple of wooden poles, but the man struggles to save his hand. From minor injuries to permanent disability and even death, it's never wise to assume a big cat is a tame animal, no matter where you might find it. In Jill's sanctuary, there's no crossing of the boundaries, even if one of their residents was once a family pet. This is Janie, she's grumpy. She hasn't been here very long. She's from a lady in Texas who has cancer and she couldn't care for her. She was a pet. And she actually adored the lady. She's still adjusting. It'll take her time. The interesting thing is I can come out and she's, she's fine with me. I can give her treats and talk to her and she rolls over and I don't go in with her. I wouldn't trust her. She's actually a very sweet cat. She just doesn't like a lot of people. She feels threatened. And um, she's got to adjust living with a few girls down here, which she's not crazy about. So um, eventually she'll have a buddy when we get a male lion in. 
And then we do vasectomies because we don't believe in breeding. So she'll, then she'll be happy. <laughs> Callie, hi girl. This was someone's pet. They lived in Florida. She is about 17 years old and she's been here ever since she's been about five. She lived in their house till she was about four or five years old and um, she had the run of their backyard. And then they had to move and no place would allow them to have their lion. Ooh, come on. Come on, there we go. What a good tiger. <laughs> You're such a good tiger. He's one of the biggest tigers we have, but we have one that's even larger. And he's 17, so he's not a youngster by any stretch. But he's been here since he was four months old. He was somebody's pet in Big Bed, Wisconsin. They bought him illegally from a breeder in Arizona. And then they realized when he was about four months old that the furniture and the kids were not safe. And so they did the right thing and brought him out. And then they said, we will never get another exotic again. So thank God for that. He's probably at least, I would put him 11, 1200 pounds easily. Yeah, he's massive. There is no doubt Kubla is one very large animal. And with that size comes a big appetite. Tigers rely primarily on sight and sound for hunting. They will see you long before you have any idea they've been sizing you up. A tiger can consume almost 100 pounds of meat at a time. Large prey are no barrier. Even if you've been working with your trained cats for decades, you can never trust a tiger. <laughs> It only takes one shocking moment to change your life to near death, as this Spanish circus trainer found out during the performance. Kubla doesn't have to go on the prowl for anything but more affection. And with Jill around, that's a given. He's an absolute love bug. He doesn't have a mean bone in his body. But you always have to remember that they're trained and never tamed. They are who they are, and even a good one can cause serious harm. So you just don't want to, especially the older I get, I guess I get smarter too. <laughs> yeah, we always take tons and tons of precautions. And in 44 years, we've never had an injury, never had an escape, never had anything happen. Knock on wood. And everything that's come in as babies get huge like this, I think because we feed every day, we don't believe in fasting them, and they get an enormous amount of calcium and vitamins and absolutely everything that they need, where a lot of private people don't have a clue what the animals should get. We've gotten cougars in with rickets, um, others with broken bones, and just all kinds of horrible things. So a zoo will take ground, meat, put it on a little platter, slide it under and take it away. So they don't have anything to chew on and then maybe one day they'll give them bones so they can chew on a bone. But the zoo cats that we've gotten in have had uh, slab fractures, really bad teeth that our vets have had to put to back together again. These guys, that ones that have come in when they're young that we've raised, even when they're senior citizens and we knock them out, their teeth are absolutely pristine because they get everything that they need, the hide, the bone, um, just everything. Plus they get supplements. Jill feels right at home with these enormous cats. These are her adored pets. But when the need arose, she took a big step out of her comfort zone to start welcoming large Syrian grizzlies to the sanctuary. So gentle, yeah. Which at first I was like, grizzly bears? I don't think so. And when I saw them and how gentle they were, I'm like, okay, this could be doable. 
Jill's not at ease with these enormous bears, but is growing to like having them around. However, choosing to hang out with these massive predators inside the cage, knowing they're capable of suddenly turning on anyone, isn't a choice for most of us. Is this bravery or a death wish? Bears are aggressive. Camping in their territory is a risk to you and your property. And yet, many people have these same bears living in their homes. Deaths from bear attacks are rare in the U.S. On average, three people per year are taken, which makes the odds of being killed very small. But does this risk increase with more exposure? While Jill devotes her life to caring for her pets, there also comes that heartbreaking time when you need to say goodbye. We hold the record for the oldest living felid in the world, and that was Sammy. He lived to be 36 years old, a purebred Sumatran tiger. And he was a little butterball the day we put him to sleep, sadly, but his hips gave out. So when the quality of life is gone, then it's, it's time for them. We cremate all of our big cats and our other animals. That way no one can dig them up 100 years from now and get them. I'm like King Tut with the grave, so. <laughs> <laughs> this is Huggy. This is the one that I have to put to sleep, but it's, it's really killing me. He's an old man. He's in multiple organ failure, but it's his time. He's 22 years old. It's, it's heartbreaking, even though you know it, it's the right thing to do, you know. This time next week, he'll probably be passed on to Rainbow Bridge. Yeah, but I'm gonna miss him. I will absolutely miss him terribly. It's really hard. I have a lot of favorites that are buried here. I had lost my son in um, 1998 in a car accident, and he's buried here, and this is where Jim and I will be buried as well, because we wanna be with those we love. I don't wanna be in a human cemetery. It just doesn't feel right. I love the elderly and I, and I love the misfits. That's really where my heart is. And when a cat is old and senile, they forget they eat. So you feed them and 10 minutes later, they're like, hello, I didn't eat today. And you got to give them some more. And um, that goes on all day. <laughs> Jill is a seasoned conservationist. Her motivation is about rescue. It's so amazing. When they're rescued, they're completely different than one you've raised as a kid. They are so grateful. And the exotics are exactly the same way because we loaded these animals up and they know they're going to a better place instantly. This certainly is a better place with superior conditions than where these animals have come from. For Lena and her mate, Thena, their lives have improved remarkably. And we have a little crippled tiger here. This is one of my favorites. This is Lena. She came out of the same seizure in Indiana, and the SWAT team was there. They had all their long guns, and uh, it was pretty scary. Here she comes. There she comes. And as you can see, her knees are really bad. Hi. The way she walks. Hi, little pumpkin. Hi, how are you? This cat and this other cat over here, they lived in circus roll crates. Six foot by four foot, maybe five foot, their entire lives. They were in a dark barn, no light. We had to use bolt cutters to open all the locks because it had been ever since they were just prisoners in those little areas. When Lena came, she would sit and she could kind of paddle around like this on her feet and then she'd do this like stargazing and now as you can see she can run and she can play and um, our vet is amazed that she gets around as well as she did because it was not expected at all but she probably will never live to see old age because of her handicap but for the time that we have with her you know we'll do anything and everything for her but this owner that, that owned this cat, it was, it was horrific. He was an older circus 
mentality kind of person and then once a year he'd roll the wagons out for the neighborhood kids to see and then roll them back into their dark barn. He would take a stick and just scoop the poop out and it, all over the floor in there it was awful. It's probably one of the worst seizures that we've ever been on. It was absolutely horrific. This is the other one that came with Lena um, that lived in a circus roll crate. Yeah, this is Thena. She was very young to begin with. When we got her, she's about 18 months old. So she wasn't left in that condition. So like this one was for six years to become neurotic. But most of the neurotic behaviors is gone now, which is great. But she doesn't seem to have been scarred at all as far as you know, being abused like that. She's really got a cute personality. She's very outgoing. She does have broken teeth from grabbing the, the bars where she lived. And she was really thin when she came. He's so sweet. But even though he's got hybrid in him, you can't trust them. They have a switch because they've got the wolf in them. But he's a very sweet boy. He loves his attention. He loves his cuddles. Yeah, you're a good boy. We lost his sister to cancer when she was three. Hi, Milo. I think he's eight or nine. And it's very interesting because um, we have a couple volunteers that he hates, and he will actually charge the fence to eat them. Yes, it's amazing. I mean, like, he knows you guys are all animal people. What a good boy. Like many homes, there's often a need for renovations, and the Valley of the King Sanctuary is no different. Nestled on 10 acres of farmland, the sanctuary was established more than 30 years ago, and as more funding comes through, the better the conditions become for these majestic creatures. If every sanctuary in America did not have big cats and was empty, and they had a place to go, that would be my dream. I would tell you, if we could buy the property that surround us, I would give them, if we had the money, two, three, four, five acre pens. That would be the ultimate. It'd be awesome. The interesting thing is, is when they come from an area that they have a, a small pen and you give them a larger pen, they're so happy and content with what they have because they've never had a large area. The one lion that was kept in a roll, circus roll crate her entire life, we just moved her to the big area up um, in the compound and she didn't know what to do. She would stay in the small area and she would kind of look around. She wouldn't play with her toys. She wouldn't roar or vocalize. And it took her about two weeks to figure out, okay, so I can go over here and oh my gosh, I can go over there too. And, Oh, there's a toy, and now she's playing and acting like a normal animal. So it's kind of like um, you have to to get inside of their heads to kind of rearrange their thinking that, okay, it's okay to have that much room. Jill and her husband are very committed to ensuring their beautiful animals have a great second chance to a much improved life. You come to the point you can't save them all. It's not humanly possible. But if everybody took care of their own backyard and did what they could, that the world would truly be a better place. So everyone who comes through our gates, we make a lifetime commitment to, and they're here forever through thick and thin and illness and whatever. And I know that the time that we need to let them go, that they had a good life for the time that they had with us. Well, yeah, I get bitten every day. Well, probably not every day, but once a week. And that's because I breed pythons. I breed young snakes that, that are, are harmless. Pythons don't have any venom. Some snakes may be technically venomous, but not that bad. So I've had a few bites that I don't count. If you get to the pointy end, I've had four intensive care visits. So four times the word's been a bit touch and go. Every time was something I did wrong, yes. And when you do something over and over, sometimes it's complacency sets in. Just how close would you get to a snake to feel the snake's body slithering against your skin? 
Even experienced snake handlers, like this one in Cyprus, who removed the snake from the neighbor's backyard, can run into a problem. Yes? Yes. <laughs> the adrenaline factor is huge, but the consequences can make for a very bad day. However, when you're performing for a crowd, it's all about the showmanship. This one here is a tiger snake and potentially very, very lethal if it bit you. Because this one's captive bred and it's used to me and I've never given it any reason to bite me. It's never, it's not, snakes aren't designed just to bite for no reason. If it did, it would be, yeah, a bad day. It's potentially one of the most lethal land snakes in the world. He won't just bite you. This is the misconception. He doesn't want to bite you to get away. So often you won't get a warning. You'll hear a rustle in the bush and that's him already getting away. 80% of our hospitalized bites, people trying to catch and kill the snake. It's simple. People think they're dangerous and because they've got to deal with this dangerous animal and they deal with it by getting the shovel, trying to kill it. And then they realize how quick and agile these animals are when it's too late. Australian Gary Davies has had a fascination with snakes since he was five years old. He knew he wanted to be a snake man. Over the years, he gathered a collection of the most venomous, including the tiger snake, king brown, and death adder. Add to that a few different species of pythons and lizards, and you've got a rather uncommon assortment of pets. For Gary, this passion for reptiles has led to a career working with snakes and educating the public. But quite frankly, it seems Gary prefers snakes to humans. Look, honestly, what a man and his snake do in the privacy of their own snake shed is a different story. Uh, but in public, I don't go handling snakes in order like this. It's just to show you that they are not, you know, red hot killers that are out to get us. Naturally, I'm not his prey. Tiger snakes are far from violent or uh, aggressive animals. In fact, if you're going to learn snakes, tiger snakes and king browns are one of the most quietest, easily chilled snakes of the venomous snakes there are. If you're new to snakes, perhaps starting with a couple of Australia's most venomous isn't for the beginner. They may be laid back and chilled out, but you don't want to be surprising them. You keep within boundaries. I'm not doing anything to cause this snake to actually bite me. Um, and he is close, getting close to full grown now. But it's not about size. Venom, it doesn't come down to size with venom. You know, you need a mil, a mil of venom. It doesn't matter how big the snake is. So it's not like, oh, he's too big to handle, no. That one there is, it's gonna give you, you know, a bad day as bad as anything on the planet can, as far as venom, you know. I don't recommend it as a pet. If you want to like snakes, there's a whole lot of uh, less toxic snakes, you know, safer snakes to keep. But if tiger snakes are your thing and you've got to that stage, then, then great, you know, I'm all for it. But I just don't suggest it for someone thinking about a pet snake. No, don't think of a tiger snake. Don't think of a venomous snake. I think keeping venomous snake is something you evolve to and you get to rather than trying to aspire to. If you're thinking a tiger snake might be off the pet list, after all, it is one of the top three most venomous land snakes in Australia, then you may be interested in the king brown. It comes in much lower on the danger scale, at around number six. This is a king brown. <laughs> Particularly huge for a king brown. Might not be able to hold up. But it is a venomous snake that's very, very active. Yeah, he's gonna be a lot more active. He wasn't captive bred. He was actually wild caught under license, but he has got used to me and that I don't hurt him. So he's in the process of calming down very well, but it is a process thing where this one, I won't um, give the same sort of luxuries as I would that tiger snake. It's just understanding your own animal again. Um, he can turn around and bite, but he's slowly learning since he's been caught that, oh, well, this guy's not too bad. If you're a snake in captivity, you don't get to choose your owner. But Gary is a role model for responsible pet ownership. 
for one, he's a reptile feeder, so he'll feed on other snakes. He's pretty good at catching and killing, overpowering even death adders, other venomous snakes. So I'd never keep him together with another snake, especially if he's hungry. Great tip for the uninitiated, it pays to do your research. Snake ownership is serious business. There's a lot to learn in order to stay safe. The King Brown is the largest member of the black snake family, so he's not actually a brown snake. But because he's often brown in colour, they've called him the King Brown. The other name is Mulga Snake, which is probably a better name. If you got bitten by this, you'd need black snake antivenom, not brown snake. They're very widespread, so they're found right throughout the whole of Australia, um, except for the very southeast and the very southwest. Now, a big one of these can push three metres, and that's probably the Kimberley forms. The ones in the Kimberley are the biggest. When you grab one of them by the tail in the wild, you know you've got a snake when he's three metres long. A snake that big and with the name King Brown, that's where he gets these reputation from them. Everything that happens, people talk about, oh, do you hear about the King Brown? And these are stories that have been exaggerated because it sounds such an aggressive animal, sounds so big. Yes, it's a perception of deadliness. It's, it can be dangerous, but um, again, I think we carry the legends a lot more than the actual reality uh, deserves. If they're not natural predators, they're gonna bite out of fear. Now you can break down that fear, uh, they're not scared of you so much, there's no reason for them just to bite randomly. Fear is quite possibly the number one reason why you would be bitten. If you see a snake sliding through the bush or accidentally step on one, there's a really good chance you're going to panic and perhaps end up in the hospital. Even with all of Gary's experience, he's admitted to a few close calls. I've been handling venomous snakes for well over 25 years. Anytime you get bitten, it's because you've crossed a line. You've been complacent. And hopefully that brings you down to earth and you see your mistake, or else you're just gonna make it again. There's always an adrenaline rush when, like you said, you know it can go wrong in a second. You've gotta be dead if you don't get adrenaline out of that. You hold a tiger snake like this, I mean, you've got to be dead if you don't get in some sort of adrenaline rush. But that's not the right reason to keep them, to keep them for the beauty of the animal. You're working with these animals, you've got to have the understanding there's certain lines you don't cross. You've got to respect that potential risk. There has to be a knowledge of it and an understanding that if I make a mistake here, this is going to end badly for me. There's a hot zone. So while you're in that hot zone, while you're in a hot zone, that's where the potential is. You stay out of that and you're quite, you know, he's not lurking, waiting for you. Well, not if you're a good keeper. If you lose them around the house and they're just lurking somewhere you don't know, but a good keeper with snakes, he's got an enclosure where he lives and, you know, you know when it's, uh, you're in a dangerous position and that's when you've got to be switched on. Owning any pet that is considered a little unusual often comes with risks, risks that can be fatal but it can be an adventure for the seasoned, unusual pet lover. You can potentially keep one as a pet, but you have to show the authorities, take the right steps before they deem that you're safe enough to keep one. Now, I would never suggest anyone keeping king browns or tiger snakes unless they've kept snakes for a long time and they actually know quite a bit about venomous snakes. You can only really learn that by experience. But uh, the adventure side is getting out there in in the scrub and actually finding these animals. And that's my passion, uh, finding King Browns in the field, in the wild, and watching what they do. And that's where our learning comes from, you know? So I guess that's my passion, but everyone's different. If you're convinced you're ready to proudly own a pet snake, then moving to a non-venomous variety is a great place to start. Although they can still be a bit of a handful. Meet Bob. He's an older python, his name's Bob. But I've had him about 14 years from, from birth. He's been around people his whole life. He works with kids and in crowds, and often if I'm standing close to someone who's holding him, he will come over to me. And he doesn't love me, I have no, no doubt. He doesn't love me and has an affection for me, but I'm a familiar scent to him, just like if he had a, um, a hollow log in the wild that's a familiar place, it's a familiar scent. Bob is likely to reach a maximum length of four and a half to five meters but all of pythons have been known to get up to six and a half meters or more. That's a lot of snake to keep your eye on. Me and Bob, often there's things that happen around the house that people would think 
strange. I'm making a sandwich with him around my neck. Seems strange to some people, I guess. It's quite normal around my house. I guess sometimes people think of um, pets as something that you can cuddle and grab hold of. Now, to me, not necessarily true. You know, you don't have to pat an animal. <laughs> you can still have a pet and just enjoy it for what it is. And I think that maybe that's a line that some people call, call some things a pet because they can cuddle it at night and give it a hug. Some animals don't necessarily want to be hugged. Um, but does that make them not a pet? If you're looking after them, you keep an animal in captivity and you give it all its needs and you look after it and it's a healthy animal and you get enjoyment out of it, then to me, that's a pet. You, you've got to have respect and they can be dangerous, but there's so many things in this world that can be dangerous, you know? Some people get married, God, you know, that's danger there. <laughs> You know, each to their own, really. <laughs> Some people think that reptiles are easy, especially snakes, easy pets to keep. And I don't like that attitude because you think you're going to get a pet because it's easy to keep. Then that's probably the wrong reason to get them. They can be easy once you understand their, their needs, but sometimes their needs aren't as simple as people think. You know, most, a lot of people think, oh, you just keep them warm. Well, keeping them warm, you can kill them by overheating them. No, I do what I love. Since I was five years old, I loved snakes, so if I could turn my life into snakes, that's what I did. But again, it comes down to some people keep it just for their own ego, especially when it comes down to, well, predator pets or, or things that are potentially dangerous. Often the person's keeping it just to say, look at me, you know, and I think that's the wrong sort of person, and often they're the ones that make mistakes. And in this game, the problem becomes ours because someone keeps things for a wrong reason. If they get bitten by a tiger snake, they make the news. And there's knee-jerk reactions that come to the rest of the hobby. Everyone that keeps these animals has to get affected by the weakest few. So to me, I always believe that people, if they want to keep venomous snakes particularly, as long as they know what they're doing and they, they are doing it for the right reasons, um, not just to be tough or look at me because that's just gonna end wrong sooner or later. People see these cats on Disney films, you know, oh, they all look all friendly and I want one of those. And what happens, they get one and oh dear, it, it, it attacks me. <laughs> it's destroyed my house. Oh, I don't want it anymore. That's the pet side. But then a number of these private breeders are doing the job properly. Dr. Terry Moore knows cats. In fact, he loves cats so much, he has devoted his life to ensuring the survival of a wide number of species. But don't be fooled by the fact that Terry is in the enclosure with this Temex golden cat. These cats are quick and can attack. However, in the right hands, they can be mostly controlled. And there's the African golden cat, which is much more orange than this. Keeping cats in captivity, there's the pluses and the minuses. If they're doing it properly, and there are a lot of private breeders in this country that we work with, a lot of the private breeders work with zoos and are providing livestock for show in zoos so that people can come along and just understand why we need to protect them. But then you've got to differentiate between the people who look after the animals properly and the ones who just want them for status. You know, I've got this cat. <laughs> Having one as a pet, I'm sorry, this isn't going to work because very few of these cats are friendly enough to be classed as a pet. These cats are all in good hands at the Cat Survival Trust. While the trust is focused on long-term conservation of cats in the wild, this 12-acre property at Hertfordshire, England is a haven for unwanted and surplus wild cats from zoos and other collections where cats have proven to be too much of a handful. When I was studying at uh, London University back in the 60s, I was actually working part of the time for my uncle's firm in, in aviation insurance to pay my way. And one day I went into Harrods and uh, there was a South American Margay for sale uh, for 300 pounds. And I thought about this. I thought, that's a nice cat. And for the wrong reason, to have it as a pet. 
and I went away and uh, got money together and three weeks later went back to buy it but unfortunately Lady Fisher of Kilberton Wildlife Park beat me to it but between 66 which is when I saw this cat and uh, 75 I accumulated so many books about wild cats and realized that you know there were 37 species of cat not just your lions and tigers but you know such uh, amazing cats as Pampas cat and Andean mountain cat and sand cat and Eremote cat and so on, which I'd never heard of. I mean, they weren't in the school curriculum. So I, I really got into this and felt, well, something ought to be done. And realized very quickly after a few years that sadly there wasn't a rescue operation in England to take surplus and unwanted cats. So a group of us got together and in 75 we formed the charity, basically to look after unwanted and confiscated yes. cats from illegal collections. He's getting a bit heavy to hold and he's, you've got to be careful when you're holding him, it doesn't, it's, it's uncomfortable for him. The Eurasian lynx is an interesting one. The Scandinavian, there are about two, three thousand left. The Central European, uh, two or three hundred. And the Italian, down to about forty. This is a Central European. So with two or three hundred left is not good. He's only really friendly with four of us. We used to allow people in with him, but not anymore. He picks up on the slightest element of fear and get quite aggressive. Working with these animals requires a lot of knowledge on what makes them tick. We wanted to study cats in the wild. We wanted to find some ways of perhaps preserving cats in the wild, keeping them safe in the wild. We wanted to provide a, an educational service. The first 30 years were pretty difficult, although in 92 we did manage to buy 10,000 acres of virgin forest in northeast Argentina with five species of cat living free in their own environment. And in future we want to buy more natural habitat because keeping animals in their own environment is by far the most economic, most ethical way. And of course, to save cats, you've got to have that entire ecosystem intact. Any part of that food chain is out and the cats are going to die. There is no doubt the work that Terry and his team of volunteers do is vital to the survival of many cat species. The jaguar is in danger and the work at the Cat Survival Trust is about helping animals like Athena, affectionately known as Jags. But we all know looks can be deceiving. Jaguars are only found in South and Central America. They're quite different from the leopards. They're much bigger, much chunkier, and much more dangerous. They'll take uh, crocodiles out of the uh, rivers and, and just crunch them. Give her a, a whole deer and there is nothing left. I mean, she will eat the skull, the hooves, absolutely everything. I go in with all the cats here with the exception of the jaguar and the amio leopards because she was already uh, an adult when she came. I didn't have the chance to build a relationship with her and she wouldn't know her own strength. She'd want to play hard. <laughs> The unpredictability of a pet in captivity is never something to be ignored. As of all the cats we keep here, she's probably the, the most dangerous. Cats are potentially dangerous and not ideal as pets in any way. appeal as a pet, particularly when they're young. They are playful and often have many of the enduring characteristics of a domestic cat. However, when you think what a domestic cat can do to a small mouse, you'd have to be mindful that the time may come where you could end up being the big cat's human mouse to torment and tease until your last breath is taken. Perhaps these cats are far more spectacular in the wild than in your backyard 
But for these cats to roam free, a lot of work needs to be done. Keeping cats in captivity is a sort of stopgap. Let's face it, most of the wild places where you find cats are being wiped out. There's just too many humans, we, we need oil, we need minerals, we need metals, we're destroying the habitat. And so every species is seeing falling numbers every year. The way it's going, we could lose every single species, not out of cats, but everything else. Research and breeding programs are vital to save these animals. Zoos have played a major part in education, allowing people to understand why animals are important. There are some very good zoos who do a lot of conservation work. You know, they breed certain species in captivity and then release them back into the wild. For the good zoos that have lots of information, uh, lots of placards and, and uh, uh, posters all about why we have to save animals, that's great. But I think what we have to do is look really seriously at the zoos that are underfunded, that aren't looking after the animals properly, and they should be closed. So the question is, in the future, so many of these cats that have many subspecies, how relevant is it to say, right, let's save all of the different subspecies? Pumas, they're originally, they thought to be 29 subspecies. So when you've got a species like the puma, what you find is that those that are living near the equator are much smaller. Those living away from the equator are much bigger and much chunkier and, and their fur is much thicker. Sadly, because jaguar need much stronger enclosures, this is a much thicker wire than you would keep uh, any of the other cats that we have in, uh, zoos can't generally afford to build a huge enclosure like this with this extra cost uh, added to the wire. Uh, she's now unfortunately too old to breed and because the Jaguar stud book have said, look, if, if we breed a load, where are we going to put them? Because zoos can't afford to build this sort of enclosure anymore. So there is a restriction on breeding. Generally speaking, stud books are there to make sure that we don't get surpluses in official collections. And that's very sensible with the Jaguar because there's a fair number left in the wild, although as they destroy more and more forest, we're losing habitat at such a, an amazing rate. And ultimately, some of the subspecies could disappear. Whether you're looking at these cats thinking, I want one as a lovable purring pet, or if you feel you should get on board to help save many species of big cats, it's clear the survival of these incredible animals is up to the human race. We've hunted to the point of extinction. We've destroyed habitats, but we can still make a difference. My number two is more than capable of taking over. We have a number of volunteers who potentially could take over in, in, in future times. And we're very lucky. We've had a lot of volunteers in the past who are, are emailing me quite frequently. Uh, are we in a position to have them back? They don't need much money. They just need enough for food and, and uh, clothing and bits and pieces. We're at a situation now where we know a number of our supporters have left quite substantial sums to the charity, not only to keep it going, but also to buy more natural habitat uh, in, in countries around the world. So I feel pretty happy about the current situation with the Trust. We don't have any debt here. The property is effectively owned by the charity now. I don't have any fears in the future. Too many animal collections don't think ahead. And that is one problem with people who keep exotic cats as pets. What is going to happen when they die? What is going to happen when they can't look after them anymore? But with the huge number of people who keep private collections of all sorts of animals, they really need to think this through because the only option is to put them down. And then what was the point of having them in the first place? People who keep these animals, a lot of them will have friends and relatives come and see the cats, will learn more about why the, why the cat is endangered. And that will all help towards people in the future providing funding for new projects, particularly in the wild. And certainly we found by having cats here that when we bought our 10,000 acres of forest in Argentina, people were very happy to support it because they saw the cat and they saw why we wanted to save the cat in its own habitat.
Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets, and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. Mark Kohlhorst knows his animals. Owner of the traveling zoo, Mark's Ark, and with over 40 species living on his property, he really is a modern-day Noah. From horses to ducks, rabbits to frogs, Mark is an expert on all things cute and cuddly. But Mark also has a curiosity for the dangerous side of animal handling. His pride and joy are some of the world's most hostile predators. I'm going to be getting out Ivy. Ivy is the larger of my two alligators. Really, quite honestly, not knowing what her type of temperament is. And she's quite different than any others that I've ever had. She is not friendly. This is not a normal pet. Um, you guys might want to stand back, because she's going to get an avalanche of water. And the way she's presenting right here, she can take a hold of this and bust it easily. I go through a lot of these. You might ask why I do this. And when she is taped, she calms right down. She kind of knows this is a job. What I'm trying to do is get her tail so that I have control. There we go. That's really good. And then I can get her from behind. She is not happy. This is actually easier than it usually goes with her. So once I control her tail, and I've got the back of her head, then I can just press her firmly, but not harming her, down. And then her bite power is very powerful on the way down, but not up. Electrical tape only will tape against itself and not on her, so it doesn't pull her skin. She can breathe perfectly fine. And once I have her subdued like this, she can't bite, and she's really of no danger unless she decides she wanted to use her tail. I would feel completely confident in letting a very small child hold her now. And a lot of people are worried about the claws. The nails, they're not very sharp, actually, and they really don't serve a whole lot of purpose. They do dig in the mud. At four years old, Ivy's still relatively small. But Mark knows the dangers she will pose once she reaches adulthood. It is likely she will grow to nine feet long and weigh up to 250 pounds. Once she reaches five feet, she will be classified as a class three wild animal, and Mark will need to obtain a permit to keep her. Alligators are probably, in my opinion, one of the smarter reptiles. They definitely have anger. She has uh, almost got my fingers. She has got me across the back with her tail. Even for this size, it would feel like somebody taking a very broad belt across your back and just drive it right back. Exclusively found across America's Southeast, alligators are some of the most menacing predators in the United States. Growing up to 15 feet and reaching 1,000 pounds, this is not a creature you want to run into unprepared. I've never had dogs or cats when I was a kid. My parents were very tolerant, and I always had exotics. Uh, one of my first pets was a, a spectacled caiman. It was nasty, evil. I really liked it. My dad enjoyed it, too. They're fascinating. They're, they're smart, strong. This type of animal's been around longer than dinosaurs. It's a 
tricky thing to call this a pet. I've known people that have had 12 foot alligators literally in their basement in a, the large city of Fort Wayne near here with their toddler child that jumps on its back and played with it and pet it. And the animal had free reign of the basement and a pond, a pool. Now that's a bit extreme for me. I, that, that won't ever happen. My child never goes near this animal unless it's in my hands and it's secured. This animal can be dangerous. Encounters between humans and alligators are on the increase in the United States. Worldwide, it's estimated that a thousand people die every year as a result of crocodilian attacks. I have seen her take raw chicken legs and take that bone and just crunch it in half. And I've been bitten by another alligator before, and I thought I was going to lose my thumb. It was an alligator that was about a foot longer than this that I had. And I was in a hurry and a rush to go to a show. And even though he didn't have a temperament like this, he didn't like that hurried pace. He got a hold of my thumb, and the next thing I thought was, there goes my thumb. And he pressed down and bit down so hard, it felt like, I can't imagine the pressure. It just, I thought my thumb was gone. Alligator's teeth break off easily, and Mark's attack left him with a tooth lodged in his hand. They have the strongest bite pressure relative to size of any crocodilian, and Mark was lucky to escape further harm while at the mercy of this wild creature. A full-size alligator can bre break the femur of a cow. It's substantial, it's, it's incredibly strong. People buy them as a novelty. These are people that they decide they want to get a pet without ever having experience with any kind of exotic animals. They buy it, it's dangerous. They thought it was a novelty, they thought it was going to be cool, it was going to be really neat. And they learn that, you know, it's not a pet. That being said, I know my animals. I use these animals a lot for 11 years. This is a safe animal that I would never, ever, by in any circumstances, ever let anybody get injured. While Mark is highly conscientious of his animals, unfortunately, the same cannot be said for all exotic pet owners. Juan Stewart is the chief veterinary officer and national director of American Humane Hollywood. Juan has spent many years working in animal shelters and is a strong advocate for the welfare and protection of both domesticated and wild animals. These reptiles, these birds, these small exotics, they require so much expertise, it would blow your mind. You get a small boa at your pet store and it's all of 18 inches. Well, one day that thing, if you feed it right and take care of it, it's gonna be, you know, eight, 10, 15 feet potentially, and then what do you do? I mean, they get discarded. And that's not fair for the animal they can become wild, vicious, dangerous animals. Years spent dealing with these crocodilians means Mark has experienced firsthand the wild nature of these highly powerful animals. Absolutely, this is a predator. Uh, you would not believe what this thing is capable of when it eats. I prefer to feed dead food when there's a situation where I have to feed live. 180 degrees different in their behavior. They are unbelievably fast, unbelievably violent. When you hear them, you know, killing their prey, and you hear the bones crunch, it's, there's no doubt about it. You just, you just hear it, it's a <laughs> And they want to kill it as quick as possible. They're very efficient, very efficient. When dealing with an alligator, as with any wild predator, Caution is key. Returning the alligator to its cage can be a particularly difficult task, and Mark approaches it with precision and care. The power is in her hip and, and, and her tail, so between my legs here, it's the best way i found to do it, and then I have to hold her very securely because she'll do that. And so she knows she's getting put away, and I've gotta be very quick and careful with her because sometimes she'll come back at me. She's got a posture right now. That's an aggressive posture. She's checking things out. She's kind of curious. Yeah, she's OK now. She's calmed down. She's going to probably just go right back up on her platform. She knows everything's done. 
Like many exotic enthusiasts, one predator is not enough to satisfy Mark's desire for the dangerous and mysterious. This is a Colombian red-tailed boa. She's about seven, eight years old. Her name is Rocky, Rocky Balboa. They can vary a lot in their color. She has bronze. This is one of South America's largest snakes, the green anaconda being the bigger. As an arboreal snake, Colombian red-tailed boas are natively found living in the treetops. They have the fastest strike of any snake and can easily catch monkeys and birds out of trees. She's almost eight feet long. She's strong enough that she could constrict enough to keep my chest from expanding to take in breath. So it's a very, very powerful snake. Even as a trained animal handler, Mark is not immune to the power of these highly dangerous snakes. Caught alone and unaware, he experienced their predatory nature and powerful grasp. I have had incidents before. When I was a zookeeper, I had a much larger one than this that didn't want to go back in its cage. And the snake did not want to let me go. It did not want to go back in the cage. And I struggled with the snake for well over an hour. I could not get to my radio. I was able to get the upper hand on it. I think I just literally had more energy than it did. And I was able to literally take it off like a pair of pants and slide it down. But when I was done, I can't remember, but only a few other times where I was so exhausted in my life. These are the strongest animals and their musculature and the way they hold on is different than anything else. I've been bitten by large snakes like this before and they're so fast that you don't even realize that you're bitten at first because it's so quick that even your nerve endings don't fire right. Honestly, you think, was I just bitten? And then you realize that you've got 60, 70 tooth marks in your arm from a snake like this and it's a half inch deep it bleeds for quite a long time before your blood clots, and it does hurt. Imagine having 60 hypodermics all in one short, small area. This is not a domesticated or tame animal. You never know when you're gonna have a bad day with that animal, you just have to know the animal. I, I can kinda tell with my animals when, when they're not feeling good or anything. She's doing fine, she's, she's having a great time. If she were not, she would be closed up and, and tight. Perhaps the most widely feared of Mark's collection is his tarantula. While its venom won't kill you, the tarantula's razor-sharp fangs and large, hairy body make it infamous around the world. I don't know that I'm gonna be holding her. She just bit into this. And let me tell you what, it was quite Oh, no, something. She just dug her fangs right in that wood. I've held her before, but boy, she just drove them right in. This is a Chilean rose hair tarantula, a very common tarantula available in pet stores. They typically have a reputation as being a really calm spider. This is a female. Females can live a lot longer than males, up to 30 years. Males are short, seven to nine years. And I've never been bitten by a tarantula. Don't ever want to. <laughs> she has half inch fangs. The venom though is described as being relatively benign. The bite is what hurts. I mean, having half inch fangs, two of them. And spiders are really soft. But what they do when they bite is they grab really powerful and they bite and let go. That powerful grab is tremendous. Probably the snake and the spiders are the most fearful animals that I have, that I show. I am not a cat person, a wild cat person, small or large cat, and I'm not a primate person. I am completely against those type of animals. Big cats, primates, they're too smart for their own good, and they're dealing with an animal that matures like a human being, except they're a wild animal. And so when something turns 15 and their testosterone blooms four times greater than a human being in an animal that's only 30 or 40 pounds, and you yank the chain around the neck of that animal one too many times, and that animal wants to be dominant in a troop, you're in trouble. I worked with primates too long, and um, 
They're, they definitely are not a pet. This is something you can control, you can take care of. Uh, primates are not something for everybody, for anybody. Now, normally I would handle spiders a lot easier, come more comfortable than this, but I'm, she's, like I said, I'm a little more unfamiliar with her. This is not something I've done many times with her. These aren't for everybody, no, <laughs> no, definitely not. I can go in the cage with all the animals out here. The question is, can I come back out of the cage? When driving through rural Indiana, there are many sounds you would expect to hear. What may surprise you is the roar of a mighty tiger. Opened in 1991 by Indiana local Joe Taft, the exotic feline rescue center is a refuge for the abandoned and the abused. Home to over 200 exotic cats across nine different species. Joe's long-held interest in exotic cats began in his youth. I started with cats in the mid-60s. I bought an ocelot as a pet for absolutely no good reason. Uh, after the ocelot, I had a leopard that I lived with for 19 years, and I lived with her. I mean, she was a pet. She had a big outside enclosure, but she had three rooms in the house, and she had the run of my house. Most of the time, uh, she slept in my bed at night her whole life. And during the winter, she was under the covers with her head out in the pillow. During the summer, she was over on the couch. Joe's attitude towards pet ownership changed after witnessing the mistreatment many of these creatures face in captivity. What we do here puts us in contact with the 98% of the people who have these animals who shouldn't. And very seldom are we in contact with those 2% or maybe even 1% of people who have them that do a good job. In the United States, laws concerning exotic pet ownership are handled at a state level. Indiana laws are considered relatively lenient compared to other states, requiring little more than a permit for exotic pet ownership. Despite this, many owners don't bother with a permit, instead purchasing animals illegally from breeders online. You could find these animals on the internet and you could get them for $500 or $1,000. And there wasn't much regulation about their interstate movement. Now there are new federal laws in effect that clamp down on the interstate movement of big cats in the pet market. Unfortunately, a USDA permit is easy to come by, and if you have a USDA permit, then you can move the cats back and forth across state lines. On the other hand, there cannot be any money involved in those movements. And frankly, you know that most of the exchanges involving these animals there is money involved. All of the cats at the center are rescues, arriving from zoos, circuses, breeders, and pet owners around the country. Joe has made it his mission to rescue ill-treated felines and educate the public about these beautiful and mysterious animals. A lot of these cats come here poorly nourished. You get an animal like this in a, in a little cage and upset and he snaps at something, they'll break their teeth off. So cats would come to us with big grooves cut in their teeth right at the base. And then it wouldn't take a lot of impact with something just to snap those teeth off. Although I've certainly seen upset tigers hit steel bars and teeth just break. Many of Joe's rescues arrive in cages not suitable for their size. With over 25 years on the job, 
Joe has seen firsthand how mistreatment can have long-term physical and psychological effects on these majestic creatures. These were circus lions. When the guy that owned these retired from the circus, he wheeled nine big cats into his barn and circus wheel cages, and that's where they spent the next 10 years. Six years into that, he bought another tiger and put her in a five by seven cage, and she lived in that for four years in that barn. Finally, the USDA decided that it was time to quit patting this guy in the head, and they called me one morning and said, we have 10 big cats up here. We want you to take eight of them and crate the other two for another facility. We did it the next day in a blizzard, two and a half feet of snow. These guys could barely walk when they got here. They were here for a month before they first tried to run, and then they just fell over. The guy that had these lions certainly didn't give a damn about them. But they're doing much better now. It's no fault of Joe's that some of his animals arrived displaying the physical scars of previous neglect. Zozo, she walks in a circle because for four years she was in a cage that was five foot by seven foot. And she didn't have the ability to walk anywhere else. Years of mistreatment can also have significant behavioral effects on the predator with many of the felines arriving depressed, anxious, and overly aggressive. I don't do things that would make me afraid. You know, after working with big cats for over 50 years, I know the things that, that people do that are scary. And one of my serious goals is to be able to do this again tomorrow. So you can't do that if they hurt you. Huh, come here. Hi. I mean, she's as sweet as can be, uh, but she is full of energy, and she would certainly break me. Even with the protection of a fence, Joe knows never to let your guard down around these vicious predators, especially when they are hungry. The oldest tiger that's ever been here was 26 when she died. And sometimes we blame that on what she ate before she came here, which was a 17-year-old girl. Court documents described the tigers as, quote, extraordinarily hungry, unquote. We didn't get them for two years after the incident, and they were still extraordinarily hungry. They were all part of a traveling animal show, and the guy had jury-rigged some cages in a barn so he could go out and party for the winter and left them in the care of a young girl who did not have a reliable source of food, and they hadn't been fed at all for four days. And she went in the barn and took her teenage friend in with her. But the court transcripts say that the keeper girl who didn't have the experience to be a keeper to begin with, went up to the cage where these hungry tigers were with a hose uh, to give them water, turned her back to talk to her friend. And you saw what happened when I turned my back on, only these guys were hungry. And the tigers reached out and, and grabbed her and pulled her back to the fence. And her teenage friend ran up to try and save her. And they grabbed her friend's arm and pulled it off and ran off and ate it. And the girl died on the floor. Sadly, this shocking attack is not an isolated incident. Since 1990, more than 300 dangerous events involving big cats have occurred, resulting in the deaths of four children and 16 adults. The staff at the rescue center are highly trained and well aware of the risks associated with working with such a powerful animal. Regardless of the situation, these are dangerous predators. I wouldn't want to go in there and let her sit in my lap. She would definitely take your fingers off uh, as a food source. 
You can see she's not interested in that much anymore. Where did you get that big belly? You're not a skinny little girl anymore, are you? No. <laughs> Since opening the rescue center, Joe and his team have saved countless big cats from all around the country and have had their fair share of close calls. Bruises, scratches, and broken bones are all part of the job when working with some of the world's most formidable predators. However, these big cats are not Joe's only threat. His work also receives public backlash. This tiger is one of four tigers that we took out of downtown Gary, Indiana. This was a federal seizure, and the USDA called us the day before we were supposed to take these cats and said, we're afraid to be in this neighborhood in the afternoon. Why don't you come up and spend the night in a neighboring town? And we'll go in first thing in the morning and take them. Well, the state police showed up at 8 o'clock in the morning and they put yellow crime scene tape around the place. We got there 10 minutes later and there were probably 100 people on the streets ready to throw beer bottles at us. So it was an interesting morning. He had three of them in the back room of his tattoo parlor and this, this one was out in the parking lot behind the tattoo parlor. Look at his claws now. See those claws? children. These guys came here when they were six months old. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service asked us to go to New York and take a leopard, which we did. And as we took the leopard, they told the guy, we're not going to prosecute on this. Don't do it again. He must have been on the phone buying these leopards before we got all the way out of his driveway. And six months later, after his wife escaped from being chained and beaten in the basement stairs. She went to the police and the police came back and found two leopards and four kids. So we went out and got these two leopards. But for Joe and his team, the risks are worth it to see these magnificent, powerful creatures given a second chance at life. This tiger came from Branson, Missouri, where he was in a magic theater where they cleaned his cage every day with bleach. Didn't particularly bother to reach, rinse the bleach off. In many cases, the effects of long-term neglect continue to manifest themselves even years later. He had bleach burns on all of his feet. He could barely stand up. See how he still holds that one foot up? Sebastian the tiger also arrived in a poor condition. A detached retina meant he was in constant pain and in need of an urgent operation. He is just one of 25 of Joe's rescued tigers that have required surgery on their eyes. While Joe dedicates his time and money to providing medical attention to those animals who need it, fortunately, not all of them arrive badly neglected. One of Joe's charges still has a special place in the heart of one Ohio State Trooper and his wife. She came from an Ohio State Trooper who had encountered her as a sick and injured cub. And then he took her home and he and his wife nursed this animal back to health and kept her for nine years. Ohio was one of the states that had no regulations about the keeping of wild animals. And then Ohio passed some incredibly knee-jerk regulations. And as a result of those regulations, this state patrolman uh, was forced to give this animal up. On October 18, 2011, Ohio resident Terry Thompson let loose his vast collection of exotic animals in the streets of Zanesville. 56 animals including black bears, mountain lions, 
Bengal tigers, wolves, and leopards roam the streets, terrifying residents. Shortly after, state legislation was changed, making the private ownership of wild animals and restricted snakes increasingly difficult. Even before I came into the legislature, there were some issues at hand uh, with wild animals. Um, you, you know, they got talked about, but then after a couple months, it kind of went away. We wanted to make more than just a motion with this. We, we wanted to actually implement something and get something moving. And when we looked at this legislation, we wanted to be different than any other state. Everyone said, well, look at the other states and look what they're doing around you. We didn't want to do it that way. We wanted to make this Ohio, and we were going to stand and make it Ohio law. And that's how we wanted to do it. We didn't want to base any of the legislation off what other states were doing. We went over to get the cat. He lived way out in the country. We had a hard time finding him. When we finally found the house, there was a state police car out in front, and I thought, we're too late, there's been trouble. But as it turned out, he was the owner uh, of all the cats that we have here that had been privately owned. Uh, this officer and his wife are the only people who come to visit and they come every few months. Considering the number of cougars in this country, the number of people who are hurt or killed by cougars is minuscule. You have to really trigger one of these animals to come after you. Most people that are attacked by cougars don't know there's a cougar there. I mean, if you're jogging down a mountain trail or mountain biking, uh, you can go by one and trigger all of their chase instincts and they will chase you. While many of these owners have good intentions, according to Joe, a lack of understanding about how to properly care for the wild animals often results in mistreatment and neglect. You know, there are people who have these animals, uh, people in private hands, who take incredibly good care of them. And I'm not, not against that. Uh, I'm against poor care. I'm against incompetent ownership. Indiana, I think, has some pretty reasonable state regulations. Uh, if you can acquire one of these animals legally and you can jump through some hoops, you can get a permit to keep one in Indiana. So, you know, in that regard, we're certainly not in favor of seeing them, you know, for sale in your local pet store but there are people that take good care of them and I'm not in favor of seeing them taken away from them either. We're making a difference for one animal at a time. We're not making a political statement. We're not saying that people should or should not have these animals. We're saying that this is an animal who was in trouble. Uh, this is an animal that has been mistreated. This is an animal whose life is endangered. And we will step forward and do what we can do to save that animal. You know, we will go wherever they are to get them. We will bring them back here. Uh, we will uh, make whatever medical technology is at our disposal available to them and we will see that they have a safe place to stay for the rest of their life. You will get hurt. Are they gonna kill you? No, they're not gonna kill you, but they're gonna hurt you. They will scratch you up pretty bad. Val Mahler is crazy about bobcats. Since opening the National Bobcat Rescue and Research Center in 2008, her life has been devoted to protecting and studying the often misunderstood predator. I've worked in the animal business my entire life. I've been a wildlife biologist, moved out here to, to do something completely different and fell into bobcats because that was what was booming at the time that there was no one else out here. I have not met a more intelligent, compassionate, emotional animal in my entire life. 
Bobcats, in comparison to their body size, have the largest brain of any of the felines. It doesn't matter if it's wild or if it's one that's been raised in, you know, in captivity. They all have this deep emotional bond with each other or with their human people. If they're a pet, they, they develop a deep emotional bond. Val's bobcats have developed this bond and show their affection by rubbing their glands on her and marking their scent. Oh, you're gonna squish me. You're gonna squish me. Headbutting and mouth-to-mouth -mouth contact are also believed to be the ultimate displays of affection. You're fat. You're fat. No. Normally, the difference in the marking and the affection, she will rub her head up against like this. <laughs> this is more of affection, and then she'll lick my nose a lot and hold it with her teeth. Hmm. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's not it. That's not it. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. I know. Despite their friendly appearance, Val knows that the best place for these predators is out in the wild. Bobcats really do need to live in the wild. The reality is a bobcat is a wild cat, F0. They are wild. And so to put a wild animal, even if it's affectionate, even if it loves you as a cub, to put it into a pet environment is, is really just, it's just not, <laughs> I don't know, but it's not realistic. They are going to tear your house up. They can't be a house pet. If you are going to keep them as a pet, which we never condone, they need to be kept in large cages. You need to have the funding to be able to feed them every day. They're an obligate carnivore. They have to be fed meat. If you go to the grocery store and buy food, you have to use supplements to supplement that so it gives them the appropriate minerals and, and vitamins. So understanding what kind of animal they are what the responsibility is to them as an emotional animal that you cannot just leave, you can't go on a vacation and leave them behind. Val's bobcats remain highly territorial, and their unpredictable and ultimately wild nature make even the calmest of bobcats a dangerous choice of pet. <laughs> bobcats can be territorial. They can become food aggressive. When they have food that they want, that they think you might get from them, or when they have your phone or your keys and you want them, they're gonna hurt you. They're, they, you know, they can certainly, they have the ability to hurt. Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. You okay? That just me. Yeah. Even our camera crew fell prey to these wild animals' advances. If you're down at the same level with them, or if they're up, at eye level on a fence, the, the first thing they're gonna do is jump at you and they and they will pat you really quickly with their feet. They just go pop, 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 pop. And you, your face will bleed a lot. Oh, mama. So it's a warning. If you cross that line a second time, then that's when they use teeth. And teeth is where that begins to get more dangerous. Oh, it's my nose. It's my nose, I love them. Bobcats have been known to attack household pets, including rabbits, cats, and dogs. They're a great hairdresser. Even animal lover Val, who has around 50 animals living in her house, won't let the cats roam freely. I would absolutely not keep a bobcat running around my house. I, that, to me, that would be insane. I have over 70 on the property. I would, I have my choice of every personality and every, you know, the extremes, one end to the other, from the, from the sweetest to the craziest. And there's not one on this property that I would comfortably put into my house. Bobcats are nocturnal and primarily hunt under the cover of night. With a diet consisting of small and medium-sized mammals, this fierce predator will first stalk its prey before striking with razor-sharp precision, cutting the spinal cord of its unsuspecting victim. <laughs> Val considers that the urbanization of traditional rural areas has, in fact, provided an almost ideal hunting ground for the bobcats. 
the planting of domestic shrubs, trees, and lawns has increased rabbit, bird, mice, and squirrel populations, all of which are the perfect bobcat prey. Bobcats are also known to kill prey much bigger than themselves. And while they often hunt by stealth, they can deliver a death blow with a leaping pounce that can cover 10 feet. That's too. What are you doing? He wants the toy. Their reputation for being vicious and predatory hunters has made bobcat trapping commonplace in the United States. As we know, their environment is dwindling. Um, they're preyed upon, they're killed. So it, it's, it's not the most friendly place for them outside of the borders or the safe walls of private ownership or, or animal company ownership. Bobcats are common throughout North America and are found in a range of diverse habitats. They adapt well to many different living conditions and can be found in forests, swamps, and deserts. In the last 10 years, their urban population has also increased significantly. When we talk about an urban bobcat, we're talking about an animal that has adapted to live in the urban environment. There are 12 uh, and questionably 13 subspecies of bobcats. The science is still outstanding on it. The smallest of the subspecies are down here south in Texas along the, the southern borders and in Mexico. And as you go north, they get larger. We have been doing the science on bobcats here for 20 years. We have learned more about them in the past 20 years probably than anybody has ever known about them. A lot of interesting things went on, particularly, again, with the urban bobcats, because they're almost a new species. They're, they're a completely different animal than the rural bobcats. They can't stand it. They smell like other cats. No, I know. It's a matriarchal society in the urban environment. The, the girls are in charge. The boys generally are really submissive to them. When you see two bobcats fighting, it's largely the females. Bobcats live a solitary lifestyle only interacting with others of their kind during breeding season each winter. They are territorial, and run-ins at the wrong time of year are often violent. Even bobcats that have become pets remain stealthy hunters and premeditate every move they make. Val is taking a risk every time she interacts with these highly intelligent hunters. Yet, she wants nothing more than to see the bobcat population thrive and survive. Yes, there are lots of bobcats in America today. There are. And in 20 years, I think there's every likelihood that we could lose all of them due to inbreeding and genetic issues and disease, and it could take out both the urban and the rural cats. So. I think that our work here is important, understanding them before this happens, um, you know, and being ready for it when it does happen um, is going to be a very important part of what we do. Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues on both sides. Those who know the dangers, but see the benefits. To 
others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. There are 48 animals that we had to put down. Those animals included one wolf, six black bears, two grizzly bears, nine male lions, eight lionesses, one baboon, three mountain lions, and 18 tigers. I remember it all happening on a Wednesday evening at about 10 till seven. That was when I received the first phone call. We became international news by the next morning. It was just a disaster waiting to happen. Zanesville is a sleepy town in Muskingum County, Ohio, with a population of just over 25,000 people. Until 2011, Zanesville was best known for its Y Bridge and many beautiful parks. It's one of the last places in the world you would expect to find an exotic pet owner with so many animals. But on one fateful day, the worst example of exotic pet ownership brought Zanesville to the attention of the world. Zanesville is a very small, agricultural, very family-oriented community. Everybody knows everybody, and everybody knows what everybody's doing. It's a small town. One of these small town residents was lifelong inhabitant Terry Thompson, a decorated Vietnam War veteran whose main role had been as a machine gunner on a Huey helicopter. His wife, Marion, was an avid horse rider and a local school teacher. Many locals knew the Thompsons kept exotic animals, but Terry was better known as the man who flew a light plane under the Y Bridge a notorious hoarder whose property was scattered with old cars and a dangerous mix of guns and wild exotic animals. Terry had drawn attention to himself many times over the years with his unusual behavior. Local police sergeant Todd Canaval has vivid recollections of Terry Thompson. We had dealt with him off and on. He had just been released from prison just a few days before this incident on a firearms charge. We had dealt with him in the past also about uh, the animals, just checking on their welfare and the safety of the public as far as the containment systems that uh, he provided them and such. He had several animals then, 70 some I believe. He had tigers, he had lions, he had black bears, he had grizzly bears. He had different apes. One time he had camels, numerous horses. Uh, there was just animals everywhere. In the garage, there was a couple of tiger cages. There was a bedroom where a, a mountain lion, I think, lived. Um, there was monkeys in the basement in a cage. Yeah, Terry was different. Terry always kind of pushed the envelope, but Terry was Terry. I, he was never really disrespectful to me or anything. I was always concerned that either Terry or Marion would be attacked by the animals. I realized they had a good rapport with the animals, but they're still wild animals and something would trigger him. I figured maybe someday we would go up there and find one of them severely injured or killed. The sergeant's fear was realized on the evening of October 18, 2011. Terry's notoriety was about to extend beyond the small community of Zanesville. As the day drew to a close, it is believed that he cut open the cages of more than 50 of his wild animals, setting them free before taking his own life. Senator Troy Balderson was born and bred in Zanesville and had been a member of the Ohio House of Representatives since 2009. This incident was a trigger for him to amend the legislation surrounding exotic pet ownership in Ohio. About a mile down the road that evening, there was a, a tournament soccer game going on. There could have been a lot of tragedy, and, and, and there wasn't. For the most part, no one was injured. That was one of the biggest accomplishments that I feel that we, that came out of the situation. The next thing I saw was a black figure. It turned out it was a bear. Sam Kopchak is a retired school teacher and lived next door to Terry. That evening, he was out in his own yard attending his own horse, Red, when he saw Terry's horses acting strangely. I saw 
the horses that were over there, it's probably about 60 horses I estimate that they had, they were going around the circle. And I said, well, they're not supposed to do that. Something's going on, you know. Then Sam saw something even more out of the ordinary. I actually got red up there by the corner. We walked down through here, and I just felt like something was looking at me. And I kind of turned to the left, and big male African lion, he came down. This is about the spot he was uh, sitting. He just sat down right there, and just kind of, you know, like that. And uh, I just kept on going, and I never looked back till I got down to the white fence with my barn. And then after I was down by my barn, he was pacing back and forth on the fence. As you can see, this is like a seven strand, bob, not a bob wire, just a smooth wire. And if he wanted to leap over that, he was big enough that he could leap over that fence. What Sam soon realized was that the lion was just the beginning of what was about to unfold. So I actually saw like six animals, the original bear and then the uh, lion, the male lion and the, and the female lion and the, another bear and uh, the wolf went by and the tigers. Sheriff's office. Yeah, I think I just seen one. It looked like a jaguar or a wolf or something. I received a call that uh, some of the animals were out. We weren't sure to the extent of, of the situation, but I was requested to come to the scene. When we arrived, uh, we were advised by one of the patrol sergeants that he had been up in the, the compound area uh, looking for Terry or Marion and had uh, seen a body laying out in a field. That was our first priority, determine who it was and if they were injured or deceased. We were first approached by, uh, I believe it was two tigers come out of a barn towards us. And as they rushed the truck, we were forced to dispatch them. Then we arrived in the area of where the body was, and it was quite apparent whoever it was was deceased. There was a white uh, tiger chewing on him. About that time, we were advised that there was two cats ready to exit the compound area on the south side of the property. So we had to go over there and dispatch those animals. I didn't know how many were out, but once we got up there, I had made contact with the sheriff that appeared that everything had been turned loose. And I mean, there was bears, there was tigers, there's lions running everywhere. It was a huge concern because it was later in the evening, you know, if it got dark, the only thing securing that property is just a regular barbed wire fence like you would have for cattle or whatever. You know, these animals would have easily cleared that, and in a short time, they'd have been in populated areas and injuring, you know, humans. There was some that had escaped the perimeter, but we had set up officers along the perimeter to contain that. I discussed with the sheriff what our situation was. There was no other option except to dispatch the animals. We started engaging the animals at different distances. Some were shot 30 to 50, 70 yards away. But then it came to where we had to go to the barn areas and that because they were in there. And yeah, we had one lioness come at us. Uh, we ended up having to shoot her and she was stopped probably three feet from us when she finally went down. Most of us had AR-15 shooting the 223 round. I was concerned that maybe there wasn't enough power, but after we engaged a few animals and saw that you know the, the rifle was doing its job, then I felt a little better that, you know, we, we could be safe. It was a coordinated effort to try to keep everything safe and, and contained. Sam became an unwitting bystander to a grisly scene. I saw the deputies pull in, and my first thing was, well, there's going to take more than two deputies to take care of this, because if, if all those animals are out. And uh, I saw a truck, and there was several, probably four, deputies on the back with, with the guns, and uh, they drove back there. And within a few minutes, I could hear shooting. It just sounded like a big fireworks display. It just kept on. It seemed like it went on forever. I saw them going across the field, just like hunters, you know, with a gap between them with their guns. 49 animals that they killed, and one missing, and six that were in the house. So it was 56 total animals that were there. It was quickly determined that it would have been impossible to control all these wild animals using tranquilizers. And the decision to use live ammunition undoubtedly saved human lives. To the best of my knowledge, there was one tiger left 
and the veterinarian there, I think her name was Wolf, she went over and got a perfect shot with a tranquilizer hitting perfectly where she wanted to. I mean, she, I guess, made the determination how much to give him, you know, how big he was. And he was in the weeds and so forth, and he come immediately charging out of there. And if the deputies weren't there, he'd have probably got her. They had to shoot it. When it comes down to a situation like that, I realize there, uh, you know, the animals have rights, but humans have more. And you just, you, you couldn't justify uh, risking human life for, for the animals. They had to be somewhat scared. They were out of their containment systems, uh, running loose. You just didn't know how they were gonna react. You could kind of surmise that he had let them go, but it wasn't until, you know, the investigation was completed later we were pretty much, we, we knew that's what had happened. You know, even if you'd found them in some of their containment systems, he cut the fences so that you couldn't recontain them. I, I'm glad it turned out that no one got hurt. To have that many animals loose, we were just very lucky that we caught it when we did. You're not ready for something like that. Uh, we had to deal with what we had to do, and that's why I think they've come out with legislation on this kind of uh, practice. It's just, it's not feasible. Uh, safety for the public or for the animals. Immediately following the incident, Ohio ultimately banned the ownership of exotic animals and their transportation across state lines. We don't want to see these animals lose their lives over something like this. They are wild. I mean, the, these animals are not domesticated. They are wild animals. That's what I kept trying to focus on. That's what I did focus on when we did this legislation. They're wild. We knew something needed to be done. Um, the administration knew that something needed to be done, and we had to stand up and, and, and do the right thing for the state of Ohio. And that's what, you know, I had to make that decision also. Challenging as I knew it was going to be, I knew there was going to be a lot of negative feedback from taking on a piece of legislation like this. You know, before I started doing this legislation, I did travel the state of Ohio and going to sanctuaries that, you know, that's the challenging part. There were people that had sanctuaries that were doing it respectfully. You wanted to look at both sides of it, but you also had to take the responsibility to make the right judgment, to set the mind of we weren't going to do this. We weren't going to allow you to have wild animals without certain restrictions that you had to abide by. We had a facility at the Department of Ag that was built out there that took in the people that could not find places for their wild animals. They could take them to the Department of Ag. Um, we stored them there until we could find some place to go. Um, there are good places out there with the facilities that are, are capable of, of handling these animals. And, um, you know, it's some place for these owners can, that can take their animals that they can still have a relationship with. They can still go visit. They can still go feed. I think that was important to a lot of them. It's, you know, it's still there and always will be there, you know, in your mind about it. I'm just so thankful that nobody got hurt, and it's terrible that he had to die. It's a very sad thing. All those animals are buried back there along the, the, the road where they buried them. I mean, they dug a big, put them all in there. You see, they laid them all. See, that was the bad picture on the internet that made people irate because all those animals, when you saw that, that scene, and the, the sheriff was very upset. They don't know who took those pictures, and they put them out. But I mean, that, the, but they had to put them lay them out so they would know they had them all. And the, and the caretaker was the one, like I said, that was counting the heads and telling them, well, yeah, we do have them all or whatever with it. But that made it a terrible scene too, because you see the see all of them lying there, you know, like that. So it wasn't too nice to see. But they're beautiful animals and you hate to see them get killed. But if you got a choice between the animals and people, you got to save the people and that's what they did. Exotic pets take all shapes and forms, and often the owners have an incredible and very special bond with their animals. And this is undeniably the case with Lisa. Oh, baby money. You see this little itty bitty baby, as cute as can be. But that little itty bitty baby is gonna tear you apart. At no point should you ever feel complacent with a monkey you've never met before. This monkey was only after the owner's camera, but it's an intense reminder, this is a wild animal. 
If you buy a monkey, be prepared that you are gonna get attacked. Lisa and Mugwai have been friends for 24 years. A commitment that's incredibly rewarding, but also very demanding. Unless you're an educated monkey owner, you're in for a disaster. Every single monkey bites, and it's gonna bite you, no matter what you do. So, you know, a monkey has to be tamed, and then it can be trained. So it's a process that you have to go through, and it takes a lot of taming to become a good monkey. When you have a good monkey, it's easy to make new friends. But if your monkey is a little wild, it may bite strangers. Many vets will only examine a monkey when it's sedated to avoid any unwelcome wounds. When these animals hit six years old and start going through puberty, they can become wild, vicious, dangerous animals. You know, the training that they've often learned, the domestication they've learned at that early age, that pretty much goes out the window, and you're dealing with literally a whole different animal. Monkeys frequent the tourist circuit in Thailand, and they may seem super cute, but you always need to keep your guard up and pay attention to what may become aggressive behavior. Don't be deceived by their so-called friendly antics. These monkeys are wild. A lot of these animals carry diseases that are communicable to people. They're called zoonotic diseases. And a zoonotic disease is any disease that can be transferred from pet or animal to person. And some of the diseases are quite serious. Non-human primates carry herpes and monkeypox and Ebola. So again, if you don't know what you're doing, sanitation, care, so forth, then that's something that you can take on or a family member or a friend who's visiting because the disease is now spread around your home. You have to step back and look at all that's involved, do your research and education, depending on the pet and what's involved. The take home here is never should it be taken lightly owning an exotic pet, regardless of the size or the species. We still have monkeys in the United States that are carrying disease. Probably only a third out of the 40,000 monkeys out there and growing each and every day, they are not vaccinated. We've been vaccinating these monkeys for years and years and years. And we do a serology test to screen everything that imaginable that they could possibly have. This isn't a pet for someone keen on owning a low maintenance animal. Monkeys can be a handful. She's very calm though. She'll sit and she'll watch a movie with you, have some popcorn. She doesn't get into a lot of things. She used to when she was uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> so over the age of of 12 to 13, then they really start to be a part of your life. Capuchin monkeys reach maturity around five years, at which point their personality can become even more demanding and potentially aggressive. If you're the prime carer, you really need a lot of training to make sure the relationship stays on track. She is eight pounds. So that eight pounds coming at you full force. That's a lot of monkey there. Really, seriously, it's a lot of monkey. She's, she's strong. A monkey on the attack is a situation to be avoided at all costs. However, for Lisa, this inherent wild animal instinct saved her life. They're very smart, yes. I was attacked. I came home from work and I was attacked in my garage and my monkey saved my life. A man had grabbed me from behind. Inside my house, on the second floor, they have their two monkey rooms. And if it wasn't for all four of them that came downstairs and attacked him, I, I probably wouldn't be alive today. All I gotta do is give her one sign. And it's a, she becomes the wild animal that everyone sees. I love her to pieces. We are two people that are inseparable. Capuchins are most notably renowned as pets of organ grinders and were in fact introduced as exotic pets from their home territories of Central and Northern South America. These mischievous rascals certainly kept the audience entertained. Plus, they had the ability to carry a cup around to collect money. 
From this, their popularity grew for those wanting an unusual pet. There's pros and cons where exotic pets are concerned because the, our biggest problem is the caretakers and owners that own them don't have the education that they need. Lisa has trained around three to 4,000 monkeys, often referred to as the monkey whisperer. Lisa is the go-to person if your monkey is misbehaving. When I take her to train other monkeys, she helps. You know, it's great for the other monkeys to see that they can actually be loved, that they can be touched without being hurt, or, you know, the mistakes that these owners make by using gloves and using weapons and the shock collars and things like that. I mean, it's still going on today. Owning a monkey is a commitment for up to 30 years or more. While capuchins are the most intelligent of the New World monkeys, in the human world, they are like toddlers. But that's how naive these people are. They think that they're humans and they can treat them as humans. But they're wild animals. They have to have a habitat. Not a little tiny birdcage, a habitat. So they can be free. They can jump, they can climb, they can do, they have things to do all the time. Muggy's surrounded by so many. You know, they need their own kind to be able to communicate, to socialize, to groom each other. That is a healthy animal in captivity. I have a huge facility. A lot of people have come to my door and dropped their monkeys off. A lot of them came that way, and all the monkeys that are there have either been injured, they've been rescued, or they've been dropped off. You have to be a very experienced person to have a primate. It's a huge responsibility. I do believe that any of the larger monkeys should not be kept as, quote, pets. But I do not call them pets, I call them companions. These devoted companions may need a lot of ongoing training, but just like humans, they are always capable of a little monkey business. I studied animals, I studied monkeys, their data, the brain waves, their anatomy. And because they're so human, you open her up, she's just like me. You know, so it's so beautiful, a creature that can do anything that we can do. I mean, she started my van and her and Madeline ran it into my house in the garage. So this is how smart they really are. You know, you cannot turn your back. Mugwai may be a troublemaker at times, but she also knows when to be well-behaved, especially when there's the opportunity to go toy shopping for her birthday. But first, a quick sketch as a thank you gift. After all, Muggy's a very polite little monkey and doesn't want to turn up to any event empty-handed. Her name is Mugwai. Mugwai. Hi, Mugwai. Happy birthday. She'll be 24. Oh, 24, wow. that's amazing. What? This for you. She painted it. Oh, are you kidding me? That is awesome. <laughs> Outstanding. Oh, nice. Thank you. That is really cool. She painted it. Ron may not have a monkey in his store every day, but he's certainly keen to help Muggy find the best present she's ever had. Yeah, we're good. Let's go shopping. <laughs> you like that one? No, no interest in that one. No? Okay. No. When it comes to shopping, Muggy is a girl who knows what she wants and certainly loves all the attention. Hey! Want to check it out? Come here. Come here. Oh, Aww, look at the little princess in her chair. <laughs> look how cute you are. Look how cute. <laughs> you got a chair. You ready? Come on. You have something like this. Why as she might, Muggy's not listening to Ron's sales pitch for these toys. Up, let's go. Up, up. All right. Right here, it's like a little Jeep Wrangler. <laughs> what do you think, sweetie? Oh my goodness. Looks like Ron has finally ticked all the boxes. Ready? <laughs> 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 One, two, three. <laughs> 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 
Seeker? Thrill Seeker Yellow doesn't seem to hold as much appeal. However, the scooter looks like fun. Okay, hang on. Got a good grip of us? Ready? You got a steer. <laughs> <laughs> After all that adventure, it's time for a quick pit stop. Lurch are your favorite? <gasps> oh. What do you think of those, baby? Her ultimate favorite candy. Oh. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, yeah. The texture and the creation yeah, yeah. and everything. I got a few more for you, Bubba. There's a lot of controversy oh, yeah. about owning a monkey. Not all monkeys have a great reputation, and many certainly aren't as well behaved as Mugwot. But it seems the key is all about good parenting. All right, sweetie, your total is $64.94. You see it right there? Yeah. Yeah, that's gonna be for your new car, your new Jeep. What do you think about that? You gonna be a journey girl? You can go on journeys with mama? <laughs> All right. She's like, yeah. Yum yums? It comes down to <laughs> how well they are taken care of, and that is the big picture. I get judged every single day. But what it comes down to when they lose control of that monkey, who do they call? You can call me names, you can say whatever you want to say, but at the end, you're going to be begging for my help, you know? And, and am I going to turn that person away because they were, they were crappy to me? No, no, I'm going to help because it, it does not matter. I don't care about them. I care about those animals. That's what really matters to me. The Greater Winniewood Exotic Animal Park in Oklahoma hosts some of the country's most interesting big cats. And is home to star personality, Joe Exotic. Originally, I was, I was born in Kansas. I grew up in Wyoming. I moved to Texas, was there 16 years, and I ended up here uh, when my brother got killed in 1997. Uh, we built this facility as a memorial to him, because. His dream was to go to Africa. I've been doing this 32 years now. Started actually almost 16 years before I moved here. And that's what me and my brother had was an exotic pet store. And, and that was where I got my first lion, uh, 16 years before we started it. I have built myself my own prison. Kids, you can't leave here. I went to Walmart three years ago. Uh, came back and, and one of my staff members lost an arm. This is Bobby at the DW Zoo. Uh -huh. I need a helicopter. I've got an employee that was attacked by a tiger, and he's hurt bad. I need, is it care flight, I guess? Uh, we have going back here. Okay. I will help them help that way, okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. That's something that I never, ever want to see again. So I've never left here since. It's a potentially fatal attraction, but Joe's captivation with predatory animals has persisted. Animals and it has always been a fascination to me. Um, I, I picked up sick animals when I was little and pretended I was a vet, nursed them back to health. So it's just kind of something I've been born with. Ah, uh, the showman side. Uh, you know, it's just because I, I, I say what most people are thinking and they're too scared to, to say it. And uh, I have fun. Uh, anything I do, you can give me a bowl of Cheerios and a glass of milk and I can, I can motorboat around that bowl all day long. Entertaining, I, I love to entertain. Cause I saw Tiger. Joe's love of entertaining has led him to pursue many careers in the spotlight, which have seen him adopt the stage name of Joe Exotic. Most recently, He's combined his passion for exotic animals with his successful country music career. 
singing is kind of an escape from reality to me, and, and I can write songs about uh, how I feel, the way people act, uh, you know, uh, misery, happiness, and, and that's just something that I use for an escape. Sure, he's a little eccentric, but he does have ambition. In 2016, he ran for president against Donald Trump. I laid in bed one day during the presidential election, and, you know, common people like you and I never get heard. I, it, it, that's a fact. You can vote all day long. You can send a letter. You'll never get a response. And if you do, it's a, it's a form letter. Uh, so I laid in bed one night, and I was like, how in the hell do I ever have a voice? Uh, woke up the next morning, filled out my federal papers, signed up to run for president, and you know, I learned more in 11 months of running for president of the United States than I did in 12 years of high school. So we gave him a run for the money. You know, people are like, you, you lost. I, I didn't lose anything. A, a hundred million people know who I am. Uh, I got my voice out there. I got my opinions out there. I, I think we won a lot. Give me money. Joe's first love, however, has and always will be his animals. The first time I rescued a tiger, and I still have her, she's 27 years old. That was my first real connection. And when you help something, there's a much different connection there than if you buy something and try and make it a pet. Taking unwanted abuse animals, I have a whole lot more sense of being able to work with them. I'm like their savior, and they know that. We are here to educate the world, entertain people, and take care of animals. I don't like the word sanctuary. We're a zoo, we're open to the public. We buy, sell, breed, take in unwanted animals. You know, there's everything here. We have 450 plus animals. We have everything from Michael Jackson's alligators to, to Steve Martin's chimpanzees to just John Doe's tiger out of his backyard. We have a, a diverse family of animals of all kinds and people of all kinds. People ask me every day, well, you know, how do you train these tigers? I don't train my tigers. I walk among my tigers. And, and if they want to be petted, we pet. If they want to be loved on, we love. If they're laying over in, in the shade or the sun, and they have their ears back and they just want to be left alone, they're left alone. The American Veterinary Medical Foundation states that once in captivity, no wild or exotic animal species should be re-released into the environment. For many of Joe's animals, his zoo is their final home, and he believes this is the safest place for them. The only safe place for an animal in the United States is in a cage, in a zoo, or somebody's yard that can properly care for them. Unfortunately, society in today's world won't allow even a rehabilitated animal to be turned back loose in a wild. We just had a bear in Oklahoma a couple months ago, a wild bear, come up on a lady's porch in town. I oh, said, so what do they do? They kill it. You know, they, they hunt it down and kill it because it came into town. And this is the most important thing that, that I hope anybody gets out of anything that I'm saying is animals in the wild have no rights, none whatsoever. We trash our oceans, we, we, we build cities in, in our wetlands and our, in our mountains. We took away their habitat. But if you properly care for and you don't take away from the wild, I believe any animal that's bred in captivity, you have a right to own as long as you take care of it. While animals like the black bear are native to the states, other animals such as lions and tigers have been imported, making their care and welfare once they arrive a hot topic. The placing of exotic animals in wildlife sanctuaries and the motivation behind doing so is a highly contentious issue. The federal government of the United States, and this is what we're working on right now, has tigers and lions on our Federal Endangered Species Act. Okay, 
Our Endangered Species Act was designed in 1972 to protect native species of our lands. Tigers, lions, kinkajous, orangutans have no business on our endangered species list. Okay, but put them on our endangered species list, what that has done is, you know, private citizens are not allowed to possess, own, breed, interstate commerce, which means sell across state lines or anything like that. Two months ago, you saw online that there's too many tigers in America. A month later, we put them on the federal endangered species list. In the meantime, they ship a circus tiger in from Peru to America and, and 13 lions from another country. Somebody's got to make up their damn mind. Uh, have we got too many in America? Do they belong on the, on the endangered species list in America? And why are we shipping them in? Because it makes good rescue stories. We rescued a tiger from Peru and we need to raise $33,000 to care for this damn thing. And they euthanized it six months later because the money train ran out. As yet, there's no central database or requirements for exotic animal owners to record and report on the disposal of animal bodies. The recommendation is for the bodies to be cremated to ensure animal parts don't find their way onto the black market. Between 2000 and 2004, more than $100 million was made from the sale of wild animal imports, making it a lucrative business. Everyone to speak his mind, Joe considers it's the money rather than the care and protection of animals that drives many sanctuary owners in the U.S. It is a controversial opinion, and whether he is right or not is yet to be determined. There's 2,800 registered tigers in America. There's less than 3,000 in the wild. Every sanctuary in this country is the same one. It has nothing to do with helping animals. All you have to do is take the board of directors' names and pull up their tax records of what property they own. And I'll guarantee you, every one of them lives in over an $800,000 house. This ain't about animals. This is about money. Understand this, if you raise money for animals at a particular nonprofit facility, it better be spent for them animals. See, here in America, you have to be licensed by the United States Department of Agriculture and be inspected to make sure that you're taking care of everything right and following protocols and vet care and all that stuff. Only if you're open to the public. Now, if you're a sanctuary that doesn't exhibit and you're close to the public, God only knows what's going on behind them walls. Okay, and see, that's another problem with, with most of these sanctuaries and these organizations is they want animals in sanctuaries with no contact. How would you like to be thrown in jail and never touched or never loved on? As much as Joe loves his animals, they remain at heart wild and unpredictable creatures. Some of Joe's most dangerous residents are his bears, and he knows all too well the potential risk of keeping these unpredictable animals in close proximity to humans. I've not had good encounters with bears. We actually have uh, four grizzlies here and, and three black bears. They're just as personable as any other animal. Ozzy, who is our largest grizzly bear, uh, we'll set up and give you a high five and, and French kiss you and everything else. Uh, Ozzy came from Kansas uh, and back in the early 2000s when Kaylee Hildebrand was killed by a tiger getting her senior picture taken. Uh, Kansas panicked and passed some laws and made it illegal for private owners to have animals and that's where Ozzy arrived to us from. Was, was a, a private owner who just had some exotic animals and this bear loved that guy. Uh, and when he arrived here, he was probably six feet tall, standing up on his back two feet, and this guy walked him around the park just like it was a dog. He is 100% lovable, as long as that fence is there. That is as much his security blanket as it is for our safety. <laughs> I've been in with them, 
he's a 100% different bear. He weighs about 1,400 pounds. Uh, you know, during the summertime, they eat less, they lose a little bit of weight. Uh, during the wintertime, they, they eat more and they put it on. Uh, for a Syrian grizzly, he's, he's pretty large. Bears are not as predictable as a lot of animals are, in my opinion. Bears is something that I, I've really never specialized in working with because they're just so moody. I had a black bear at one time uh, that we raised called Little Bear, and she grew up in the gift shop years ago. And she got out of her enclosure uh, one day and went back to the gift shop and uh, decided to wreak havoc in the gift shop because she was playing. You know, everything on the shelves had to come off the shelves. And I put a harness on her and went to walk her out. And bears are much different than tigers. When they lay their ears down and they do that, you're gonna get bit. Bears may be different to tigers, but that doesn't mean tigers pose any less of a threat to Joe and his team. There's days they don't feel good. There's days they woke up in a bad mood. Like I said, uh, I've built myself my own prison. If people think that you do this because you're getting rich, <laughs> they really need to come work here. <laughs> Uh, you, you can't leave. I wouldn't change it for the world. I have a goal in my life, and that is to be somebody and accomplish something. And that's the way I was raised, and, and that's what I'm gonna do. I saw my brother killed at the age of 32 years old. I buried my first husband here uh, at the age of 32 years old. And, and I'm gonna leave this world leaving my mark. I've dealt with so much death in my life, and life's too short to get tied at. So, so my personality is, I, I, I laugh all the time. Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. They have a very strong compressive bite. They have the capacity to lacerate your skin and bite parts of you off. Wolves are natural predators, and working with them is not for the faint hearted. Chris Edrington from Steve Martin's Working Wildlife, trains wolves for film and television. We supply animals for the entertainment industry. I used to call it the film industry, but that's sort of antiquated. It's work in front of a camera uh, where someone is paying us to film an animal 
that's part of content that somebody else is selling. I would say 90% of the work that I personally do is in front of a camera that way. Mark, stay. Stay. Good boy. Depending on the economy, sometimes 10% of the work or more will be event related. Uh, America's funny that people have disposable income and somebody occasionally wants a lion at their party or a wolf or a baby animal of some kind. Uh, these are gray or timber wolves, and name is interchangeable. They come in different colors, dark like these two, or, or gray like the other one who's wandering around. We have one that's sort of a lighter color too. These particular guys, their bloodline is from North America. Chris's most famous animal pupils starred in the iconic movie, Dances with Wolves. The movie's wolf character, Two Socks, was actually played by two different wolves, Buck and Teddy, who looked so similar, only their trainers could tell them apart. Those wolves uh, lived here. The owner actually had to double the actor Kevin Costner for a couple scenes at, where they interacted. This group of wolves here, we've done uh, True Blood, uh, Vampire Diaries, Teen Wolf. We did three seasons of Game of Thrones, and then a bunch of other movies. Have the card. Chris has worked with a variety of dangerous animals, and while he makes them seem quite safe and friendly, wolves remain wild predators. I've enjoyed everything I work with. I work a little bit with our tiger. It's a solitary animal and I like it, but I like these guys a lot. They give you love. Uh, all animals show some emotion, but wolves show love more than any other animal. You'd have to be devoid of a consciousness not to see that and see how they show that to you. It's uh, quite wonderful. Hello, my love. Come on. Come here. Training wolves is about making the animals familiar with the human world rather than teaching them clever tricks. Quite frankly, as an animal trainer, I find I don't spend so much time training an animal but habituating it to the odd things that occur in society. And on a movie set, we have booms and flags and all sorts of things that aren't natural. So we have to get our animals used to that. We have to get them used to loading in a truck or a trailer uh, or whatever cage if we have to go on an airplane. And, and we try to make that so it's, it's normal and not stressful. Going into a pen with wolves is dangerous. And no matter how close an owner is to their animals, there will always be a risk. The two uh, black guys here are a part of an older group. When we got them, we had a lot of film projects at the time, and they worked a lot, and we just happened to build a really good rapport. The other wolf, he's just two, and so he hasn't worked quite as much, and I don't have as good a rapport with him as these guys. I can still work with him, if uh, a filmmaker wants to shoot with him, we'll go do whatever we have to. But I, I just, these guys have known me better and I've done more with them and we've traveled more places. And they're older too, so they know that I'm the source of fun more. <laughs> He's a young punk. In a couple more years, he might be standing over here because he knows that the rubs are good and maybe we'll go for a walk out into the universe. Dog trainer and canine behavioral specialist, Michael Chill, is known for his expertise with wolves and wolf behavior. Dogs absolutely evolved from wolves, and they share 99.9% .9 of the same genetic makeup. They can interbreed and make fertile offspring, so that's really, from a species perspective, that proves a close relation. Our adult dogs have the similar behavior to a five-month-old wolf. Our adult dogs, are social with strange dogs, typically, are still eager to learn have a prey drive, but not a serious enough one to really do that much hunting and killing. Our wolves evolve beyond that. Once they become adults, they will accept their own family members, but they're highly aggressive to outside wolves with which they are unfamiliar. Uh, they are quite adept predators. They're highly territorial. So when we then go back to the wild to try to redo this and take a wild animal into captivity, we do not have in a wolf a dog with an exotic look. We have a wild predator. Despite the dangers, extreme animal owners often push the envelope. Hello, baby boy. 
And not only do R.C. and Sharon Bridges keep a bison as a pet, they also keep and breed wolves and wolf dogs. We do sell our wolves. You know, we have a, so many people that really enjoy them. And a lot of them, they do make house pets out of them. We have lots of happy customers. And you know, one person wolves. said, you can't keep a wolf in the house. And Sharon replied back, we keep a buffalo in our house. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell me we can't keep a wolf in the house. Yeah. <laughs> the most worried I was one time, uh, we had wolf puppies. And of course, when they're born, the mamas are real protective. And she come running, and I knew I was fixing to get tore up by her because she'd been real aggressive toward me ever since she had the puppies. And when she come after me, they grabbed her and threw her on the ground and held her down. And, uh, and then I, she was growling and stuff, but that, anyway, I just, I just backed off and she was fine. Wolves live by a strict and ruthless social order, and owners must establish themselves as the pack leader or risk a vicious alpha challenge. R.C., of course, as the dominant male of the family, he takes charge, and whenever he feels like he's comfortable with me jumping in, because he won't let me jump in and do anything without his okay first. The way we do them, we keep two to three in a pen, and we never have any problem with them. We do have an alpha problem occasionally, and I got rid of a female lately because she was causing too many fights. I raise these guys, and because of how I've worked with them, I think they view me as the top dog. They live in a sort of interesting structure. Biologists tell us that an alpha male and an alpha female will form, and basically what that means is the dominant pair will be the only one that will be allowed to breed. And uh, nature is really cruel. Sometimes the other ones breed, but if they have a successful litter, the alpha male and female will just kill it. The way we raise them, these are very nice, but they, they're still... We, you can't take the jungle out of the boy. Nature designs them to be a certain way, and they're wild animals. Therein lies the difference between a domestic dog and, and this wolf. Even though this guy is just rolling on his back and rubbing his belly, he's still a dangerous animal. With a bite that can break bones, wolves may look just like exotic dogs, but can they make good pets? I work with them all the time. I see them every day. No, they're horrible pets. I would never bring one to my house uh, because I know they would be enthralled by my leather couch and they would perforate it with holes. They would rip up my carpet. They would tear down my blinds. I have faith that they would do that. I might be able to get them not to do that when I'm there, but if I walk away, I have faith that they will completely destroy everything when I'm not there. Conversely, when I've had domestic dogs, I train them so that I could trust them. We've basically trained our wild animals not only to behave, but just to be able to convey safely around society. But uh, yeah, no, the wild animals I work with, I would never recommend as a, having a, as a pet. Well, personally, for me and RC both, uh, for us, I think it's great. But it's, with these kind of animals, it's not meant for just anybody to pick up and say, okay, I want to make them a pet. You have to be really dominant. You have to be their leader. If you're not gonna be top charge, then no, then they're not gonna be safe for a pet. In spite of the danger, many, including RC and Sharon, still believe that a 100-pound predator can make a good house pet. We bring all the wolves in the house. Um, you know, we play with them, take pictures with them. Certain ones we'll let um, the grandkids play with. There's some of them that we won't let the grandkids play with. Ours make a good pet. It just like all animals, depending on how they're raised from beginning, really, is what makes good pets. When I got in the wolf business, I thought I had a mean animal coming to me and it wound up being the sweetest animal I've ever been around. And we always hear the stories about the big bad wolf. They're just unbelievably a gentle animal. I do think they're dangerous when you let them run in a pack. I find you get what you put out. Conversely, if you have a child, a human, and you put it in a closet and 10 years later open the door, what are you gonna have? 
Uh, if you have a bear or a lion or a wolf and you raise it appropriately and you get it used to the trappings of humanity and you take it everywhere and you teach it things and you love it, you will have a great animal that's capable of safely operating with other people in human society. Don't let their looks deceive you. Wolves may resemble the family dog, but they are an apex predator, capable of taking down large prey and causing serious physical injury and even death. If you're going to house a wolf and they were able to live in a wilderness area and come back to visit, but they certainly weren't put in a captive situation, that's kind of ideal. My wolves became my wolves because people thought they could turn them into dogs with proper training and found out the hard way, doesn't work. You cannot train a wolf to be a dog. The debate about whether circuses keeping exotic animals in captivity is right or wrong is gathering momentum. And circuses themselves are in a situation where they're having to consider their future and how their life could change. Regardless of your position on the subject, circuses are still traveling from town to town, entertaining enthusiastic audiences. Would that all change if the exotic animals were no longer there? Jan is the matriarch of the Stardust Circus, which tours around Australia with exotic animals as part of the show. Her family has been working with the animals for generations. Really a family affair, the whole circus. There are 28 people on, counting all the babies, of course. This circus is family run, and most of them have grown up working with exotic animals. It's a life they've always known, and they treat their animals as part of their family. It's a pretty good life, really. But what's it like to work in a circus with exotic animals? We have the only two remaining circuses in Australia now with exotic animals, and we have both. We have six lions, five monkeys, and that's all in the way of exotics. The others are pigs, goats, dogs, horses. These animals have been born and bred in captivity, so they don't know any other life. So it's not like they've been plucked from the wild and suddenly they're, you know, living this life. It's not that at all. And people don't seem to understand that. They seem to like the life they've got. I guarantee that. The wild isn't as great as what people make it out to be either. In the wild, the lion can live up to 14 years. But at the circus, the lions can live up to 25 years without the stresses that come from living in their natural habitat. Yeah, we treat them like family. They're our, they are our family. When we move to each place, they come first. They're set up before anything else. So to make sure they've got all their comforts of home, the, and even to the point if it's a hot day, the lions have their air conditioners turned on, and if not, they lay out in their yard and snooze all day, and they have a bit of a life of luxury here. <laughs> they don't do any hard work of any sort. And they don't have to worry about where their next meal's coming from. The circus is regularly inspected by the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals to ensure they comply with all the necessary regulations. A lot of councils have banned the grounds for exotics because the animal liberationists tell them so many lies about what we do to our animals, which doesn't happen at all. And they can make up some doozies of, believe me, some of the stories they tell them. And uh, we'd be in jail if we did half of what they tell them. Jan has bred several lions over the life of the circus, which has provided an interesting story to the tax man. We had um, cubs living in a caravan. They had a little bed under, under the table. And uh, I'd say to them, righto, go to bed. So I had some paperwork on the table. And it was, my husband had had the, the tax return sitting on there. Well, it fell down under the table and it, it got all chewed up by the cubs. We had to send it in like it was, put it in with a little note that these were chewed up by lions, you see. And so I was singing after it, I bet they thought, no, oh, we've heard everything now, every excuse in the book, this, this one will take the cake. Public safety and the safety of the lions is a high priority for the circus. And there's a double fence around the lions area for added protection. We have barricades around and all that, and the lions do get locked away at night. We have security right around them with the caravans. So our own people are there all the time, 24 hours a day. And we very rarely ever have anybody 
come around that want to get in with the lions. <laughs> uh, if they do, they probably get eaten. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Uh, they'll probably lick them to death. <laughs> the lions can be found blazing about in a large fenced off grassed area to the rear of the big top, oblivious to the debate surrounding them. With social change, circuses are now under intense pressure from animal welfare groups that say it's cruel to keep animals in captivity, that they shouldn't be kept in small cages. This is the uh, cages that they can't turn around in. They're not big enough, aren't they, Glenn? Yeah. <laughs> they can't turn around in these. Cramped up in this, this, you, some of it's funny. If, if it wasn't so stupid, it'd be funny, but they come out with some weirdo things. These lions have lived like this since they were born at the circus. They have never been in the wild, so this is the only life they know. They are well looked after and safe from other predators and human encroachment to their natural habitat. Matt has worked with the lions since they were cubs, so they have built up an amazing level of trust. He spends up to an hour a day with them, training and the occasional cuddle. You can sense Matt has a special bond with his lions. His partner, Winona, is well aware of the dangers Matt faces every time he goes into the ring with the cats. I feel like he's pretty safe, but it still is a bit of a worry. They are lions, so, you know, you, ne you never really know. Hopefully he's aware at all times of what's going on, so, he's, you know, they do love him, but, you know, sometimes you just never know with animals. Matt has total respect for the lions in his care, and he knows when he enters the training area, there are six lions moving around him. He knows he can never drop his guard around these powerful predators. When you're working with lions, especially if there's more than one in a cage, you need to make sure you know where they all are at all times. Uh, you need to know what, what they're looking at and where, uh, where their focus is on. Their body language is a big thing, so the ears twitching and tail twitching, uh, stance, if they're ready to pounce, if they're not ready to pounce, you know, pretty relaxed. So you just got to watch their eyes, their eyes is a big thing. Usually you can tell from their eyes what they're thinking. So he's pretty relaxed, he's just watching Bart over there at the moment. But they're all pretty good, they all have their own personalities and, and moods and sometimes they're in a good mood and sometimes they're not and as long as you uh, are paying attention, pretty safe. Hello boy. He's beautiful. There is a lot of trust between the lions and Jan. Putting your hand inside a lion's cage is something that Jan doesn't like recommend. That, I wouldn't let any strangers do that. We know them pretty well and how far you could go with them. If they were in not in a really flash mood I wouldn't do it but that's very rare. But now and again just the other two bigger males will have a bit of a barney with each other about who's going to be the boss of the females. They are beautiful, gentle animals, and you would probably um, trust any animal, no more than about 95%, but uh, they're just like it. So a dog even, who knows if a dog could ever turn. So far, the lions have been relaxed, but there is a change in mood in the training area between two of the males and we get a glimpse of what lions are capable of. There's always that very, very, very slight chance, very slight. But so far, they, they've been really good. Hey. Hey! Oh. Some of the wind, they're gonna have a, they're gonna have a barney over the girl that, that... Hey! Hey! Stop it! <laughs> Oi! Stop it! Oi! Hey! 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 Stop it! Stop it! I have a little barney every now and again. They don't do any damage to each other. Uh, just for something to do, I think. <laughs> After the dust has settled and the brief altercation is over, the victor lies next to the female. 
while the jilted male looks across. Today, mating season has a winner and a loser. He's a pretty good natured lion hawk. He's very, very calm and relaxed usually. Does not much scares him, so that's always a good thing. Some lions are very jumpy, which makes it hard to work with. Usually if they're like this, it's, it's, it's fine, but it doesn't mean it's gonna stay like that. Something could uh, get their attention out there and they could just run to chase that, or you know, someone could bite him on the bum while I'm playing with him. So he's gonna be ready for everything. You right there, buddy? You right there, bud? Hmm? You right there, mister? Hmm? 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 Yeah, you big goofball. You big goofball, hey? Yeah, you big goofball. Not everyone agrees that keeping exotic animals in captivity is good for the animals. But Jan maintains they have a good life and are treated as part of the family. Well, this is their air conditioning unit. So uh, on a very hot day, the air conditioning goes on. So they boom, up into there and sprawled out. They've got little ledges and shelves up in there too that they, they sleep on. They like to go high. We hand raise them. They live in Glen's caravan for the first six months. My wife can't handle the smell. So Glen gets the first six months, uh, which is waking up at three in the morning to bottle feed and, and uh, it's just like having a baby. And then they start tearing up the furniture. And the first uh, probably year we trained out here in the yard just to get all the basics down, like staying on the pedestal and, and stuff like that. So we train out here so anybody can come and watch. Every day it's just playtime in here. Here's just mutual ground, you know, in there, I'm the boss, we do the, the jobs, and out here is playtime, so. It's all reward based, so they know what to do, and uh, they're always wanting to do it before I ask them to, instead of waiting for their turn. So it's, it's, they really want to do it, it's just getting to wait is the hard bit. So they eat out of my hand, uh, usually some nice fresh horse or something. And if they're full, they don't want it, and if they're too hungry, they'll, um, take your hand with it, so you've got to sort of keep them at that where the stage where they're not hungry but they're not too full to eat. You can never underestimate the power of one of the largest felines in the world. In the wild, they work together to hunt their prey. Lionesses do most of the hunting for the pride, each having different roles and working together efficiently to bring down their prey, using their vice-like jaw to snap the victim's neck and drag it to the ground. The lions might be the resident stars of the circus, but the rhesus macaque monkeys are another exotic that looks cute at first sight, but can attack if they don't know you. Oh, it's beautiful boy. He's a beautiful boy. He's a beautiful boy. The two in this cage are the youngest two that we've got, but they don't take kindly to strangers. They're not an animal that um, anyone could get in with or anything. Don't get too close to them. They'll grab your glasses off, they're a bit naughty. Especially the people they don't know, more so. We have five now, two of them really love me. The other three, they, they like me, but not as much as the two. <laughs> I have trained Cleo to do hand balancing, so I work Cleo in the show. Some might say it's cruel to make animals perform tricks, but they are never forced to do them. And if they don't want to do it, they'll soon let their trainer know. They do bite, but everyone knows when, they, when they're out just to make sure they keep away from the people who can't handle them. According to Matt, Reese's macaque monkeys are charismatic, but they also have a vicious streak, so you need to think on your feet when working with them. So you just got to sort of work with whatever they, they're willing to put out. Uh, they have a short attention span also, so you can't work too long with them. So when you're training, you do a couple of minutes here, a couple of minutes there, and they'll tell you when they're fed up, and so you move on to something else. They get bored pretty quick. This is Cleo. She's an 11-year-old rhesus macaque. She's the baby. Uh, the monkeys are good. There's always a, a, like an attitude from them, so it gives you something to, to deal with. And they only like a couple of people usually, so they, don't, they get attached to a couple of people, and everybody else is sort of, you know, fair game. Cleo here is, uh, she's pretty smart, she knows how to undo the clip on her collar. So it, sometimes in the show when we just, that we have to, in between tricks, she does just has to wait. And sometimes if you're not watching, she'll unclip herself, go to the table, get a treat, and then uh, head back home, put herself away again. Millie, the, the one in here with, that stays with Cleo, she's got a lot of attitudes. She's willing to attack anybody, really. She's just, 
full on. Uh, family more than pets. Yeah, they're part of the family. Oh uh, yeah, they get all the best of everything. The average macaque can grow up to two feet high and weigh up to 15 pounds. It's a small package, but when aggressive, nasty bites and the risk of disease are consequences of getting too close. Well, they're not really wild. They've been with us their whole life, but there, there is still the instinct in there. Animals don't think like humans. You know, that's where the people go wrong. Animals have their own uh, thought processes and their own and way of doing things. So to us, like something we would think is nice, they think is, is you just letting them do whatever they want. It's showtime and the exotics are preparing to make an appearance to their adoring public. There are preparations that need to happen in the ring to make sure everyone is safe. family enjoy sharing these animals with the public, but today's circuses are finding themselves going through a transition, deciding if they will continue including exotic animals as part of the show or need to bend to the pressures of social change to stop keeping animals in cages. These could be the last of the lions at this circus. They will not be breeding any more of them, so once these unique animals have retired, it is unlikely there will be any bred lions thrilling the audience. Time will tell as to how circuses with exotic animals will evolve under the big top in the years to come. Located in the San Bernardino Mountains of Southern California, the small city of Big Bear Lake is a popular holiday destination. The region draws thousands of tourists and its picturesque surroundings have been used as locations for many Hollywood classics, including Daniel Boone, Gone with the Wind, and even Disney's Old Yeller. But Big Bear Lake is also known as the location of a much more shocking filming project. The tranquil mountains of Big Bear are a world away from the glitz and glamour of Hollywood. They're also home to the well-known Hollywood animal trainer and stuntman, Randy Miller. Randy's company, Predators in Action, specializes in location and studio trained exotic animals. Yeah, I mean, I definitely built Predators in Action with no fear. We still do push the envelope, but back in the day, we really pushed the envelope. And I mean in every way. It could be a stunt doing a staged attack, or even just a simple model shoot with a tiger crawling on a girl that the cat's never seen before. We did things back then we probably wouldn't do today. Drawn to animals from a young age, Randy's family was in the seltzer business, and during the 80s, he helped turn the family business into a $100 million a year company. He lived an extravagant lifestyle and used his successful business fortune to indulge his childhood dream of owning big cats, bears, and other exotic animals. Back in the day, I had great resources to, you know, accommodate these types of animals and to just, just to get the permits and, and permission to have them. Basically have them with me wherever I go. And that's really what I did. We built a house in the Hollywood Hills with a, a three-story glass cage. It was designed, you know, for big exotic animals. I didn't have any animals live there full time. I had a place out in the desert where I kept all my animals and I used to bring them in to visit while I was in Hollywood, just so I could always have my animals around. When the family business went bankrupt, Randy was forced to find another way to both earn a living and keep his dangerous pets. 
He turned his eccentric hobby into a career and began supplying big cats, grizzly bears, and wolves for big budget Hollywood movies and high rating TV shows. His signature stunt was a staged attack where his animals staged realistic but harmless attacks. He created a unique and potentially life-threatening product. My staged attack was not taught. Nobody teaches you that. It was developed back in those days, like in that house with that glass cage. I used to wrestle my animals and play with them. I mean, the reason I used to wrestle and play with my animals was because of the joy I got out of it and the fun it was. But the animals bond so much stronger when you have that kind of interaction. They just do. I mean, the key to an animal's heart is to play and have fun. And those lions and tigers, bears, they love to wrestle and play. So I think most of us wrestle and play with younger animals. As they get older, it becomes much more dangerous. My whole stage attack developed out of playing with these animals as they matured and just learning how to control it. Years of high-risk training with ferocious carnivores yielded the ultimate Hollywood payoff when Miller won a Stunt Academy Award for his role as Russell Crowe's stunt double during the tiger attack scenes in the blockbuster movie, Gladiator. Once I focused on doing film work with these animals and I really focused on training them to be in movies, that's what we were training for was that scene, not even knowing it. But I mean, I would say our whole career put us there. That tiger was raised its whole life to play out all that action you see in that scene. You know, the lunging, the jumping, the snarling, and that staged attack. I got bit on that show. There were a lot of staged attack scenes, and they, it required a lot of takes over and over. Attacks from the back, attacks from the front, while filming one of those attack scenes, um, Tara, the tiger I was using, ended up grabbing the wardrobe, which was leather. So she grabbed it and, you know, she got possessive over it is what happened. And she ended up biting, she tried to take it from me and she bit through it and put a hole in my arm. So at that time they cut and said, hey, we got it, done went, undressed, got out of wardrobe. They, they, you know, they bandaged up my arm. And then a PA comes in and says, hey, the main camera broke. We don't know when it, the film actually broke, so we gotta go out and refilm all that. Like the special effects camera. They got me back out there. They put a steel plate over the wound and we started doing it again. And the only reason I was able to continue doing that attack after getting bit pretty bad was I understood why she bit me. You know, she wasn't really biting me. She didn't go after me out of anger. She went after the wardrobe and got possessive over it. Between 1990 and 2011, there were over 300 incidents involving captive big cats in the U.S. 20 people were killed. Over the same time, captive bears killed six and injured 61. Working alongside predators is never 100% safe for the humans involved. American Humane is responsible for making sure that the work is safe for the animals. Our job is really just to make sure it's done well. We, we're, our primary mission is to oversee, basically police, the care, the safety, the humane treatment of the animals while they're on set. The others want to debate whether it's philosophically okay to use these animals. So when I'm asked, you know, should these animals be used, Look, we could sit here for three hours, four hours, and, and probably not arrive to a, a decent answer. But when I tell you, look, my job is to make sure that the animals that are participating are being used in these environments, are cared for properly, that is really our job and our mission. Big cats, grizzly bears, and wolves are popular movie stars, and they're all capable of removing human limbs in seconds. 
Even a monkey can cause serious lacerations and injury. Strict safety protocols are always in place, but when dealing with unpredictable natural predators, safety measures aren't always 100% effective. You know, on the good sets, in my experience, on the controlled film sets that hire the right people who care for their animals, who've had the time, put in the time to train them properly and, and go through all the preventative measures. In instances like that, I think it's very safe. I think it's very controlled and safe. Now, as it often is, it comes down to hiring the right people, right? Getting the right team around you. Because if you get someone who doesn't have the experience, you're gonna be in trouble. One thing with my line of work, we have developed one of the best safety protocols there is. I mean, you need a fast plan if something goes wrong. And, and we all learned, even with that, the ultimate price can get paid, you know? These animals are capable of taking somebody's life in a matter of seconds. So my position, knowing that, anybody handling these animals, not just owning these animals, but working around these animals, should have the education and experience to participate in stopping or helping save somebody's life if there's an accident or an attack taking place. Many exotic pet owners raise their animals from babies, building a strong bond and creating a sense of trust. It can be easy to forget that such majestic and affectionate creatures can also be ruthless killers. There could be a false sense of security there where you feel, where you, you believe it's safer than it really is. Fire department emergency, how can I? Hi, I'm Brian Lynn with the transfer. She's at Onyx Summit. Off of Rainbow Lane. Down. I'll bring the lane. He's bleeding from his neck heavily. Hold on, ma'am. She's at Onyx Summit off of Rainbow Lane. There's a bear, we think it's an animal attack. At the yes, there's a bear attack. A bear attack. Until you've experienced, you know, what can happen, how fast things can change, you don't really have a clue, you know? And unfortunately, it takes a tragic, you know, accident to, to really experience what I'm talking about. A bear attack, okay. He's bleeding heavily from his neck. Okay. We're trying to get him into the car. We need someone here immediately. And you know, you do this long enough, you know, I, I, I know people that have been doing this for generations, and you talk to guys that have been doing this for a long time, you know, we've all experienced something. In 2008, Randy's cousin, Stephen Miller, was fatally wounded while shooting a promotional video at Randy's Big Bear property. Stevie's co-star and killer was a 700-pound, 7.5-foot grizzly bear named Rocky. The attack was swift and completely unexpected. We weren't ready for what happened. That's how fast it is. That's how fast it can, it can happen. I mean, if you actually time it, once it started, it was like three and a half seconds. It all happened really fast. So we stopped it, and actually Stevie appeared to be okay. We later learned it was a fatal bite, one single bite. Five-year-old Rocky had been trained to wrestle humans and was best known for his appearance as Dewey the Killer Bear in the 2008 film Semi-Pro. Stevie wanted to wrestle Rocky. You know, he had experience in the past. Rocky was a great candidate for wrestling somebody that, you know, wasn't doing it all the time. The authorities deemed it an accident based on the injuries. They could tell by the injuries what type of attack or bite took place. They ruled it a single bite in, in Rocky's case. Although that single bite left a profound scar on Randy, incredibly, he still lives with and cares for Rocky the bear. A lot of people love animals and say they love animals, but some people, like myself, love them so much they have to be with them. And I think that's the difference, you know? It's easy for somebody to criticize what we do, but they may not have that same desire. I know from experience, I have that desire. That's more important to me than anything else, having, keeping my animals, caring for my animals. 
my animal's welfare. I mean, that's what got me into what I do. You know, it really is. It started out as a hobby and it turned into a profession. You hear about an animal that attacks somebody that had never, you know, had an incident in the past until that moment. And that was the moment with, with Rocky. Working so closely with these types of animals, owners develop a close relationship with an animal that, in the wild, would see them as prey. Perhaps surprisingly, American Humane's Quan Stewart sees that bond as beneficial for the animals too. This gets into a very big ethical debate, you know, should these exotics be in film? And, you know, if, if you have the right people with the right expertise, it can provide the right long-term care for these animals, yes, I think it's okay. Uh, a lot of these animals are domesticated at a very young age. They're used to human contact. They enjoy human contact. I mean, there's a reward there, you know, especially with a, a creature that could take your life in a matter of seconds, you know? Maybe part of that starts, you know, from the adrenaline rush you, you get with, with it, but there's a lot more to it than that. There really is. You know, these animals do show affection and exotic cats, I've always said, are the most affectionate creatures on earth. And they are. They will sit with you for hours showing affection. I mean, they're moody, and that's what makes them dangerous. It's kind of like a dog, you know, where they're very friendly and fun. And it usually takes a while before you see their instincts come out, but eventually they will. And all these animals get possessive and it might be something you didn't see until that moment. And when they get like that, it doesn't matter how much they love you, they'll kill you over, over anything. That's how, that's the, it's just in their instincts. It's, it's just in their DNA. Today, Randy remains close to his collection of unusual and dangerous pets. Seven big cats and several bears, including Rocky. I can tell you this, if you put somebody near one of these animals, there is a chance something could go wrong. There is. Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. The entire perimeter of this rural Nevada property is surrounded by 10-foot chain fences topped with barbed wire, making it seem more like a prison compound than a family home. But Scott and Susanna, the couple who live there, aren't worried about possible burglars. They're more concerned about protecting the public from their unusual and potentially deadly pets.
Their 10-acre property is home to a variety of exotic creatures, including tigers, lions, wolves, and other predators that many would consider too dangerous to keep at home. You don't eliminate the danger. What you do is you mitigate the risk. When it comes to safely keeping predators as pets, the more familiar the animal is with their handlers, the safer the interaction is. Oh, I know. <laughs> oh, look at that way. <laughs> Susanna is clearly very comfortable with her feline companion. And although the lioness is obviously unsettled by the presence of our camera crew, she shows no sign of threatening behavior towards her keeper. Yeah, that's my girl. That's my girl. <laughs> I know, I know. She can knock me down. When Scott first met his partner, Susanna, she already owned some unusual pets, including reptiles and big cats. How did I get this? Uh, I met Susanna. I was actually a defense contractor working at the Air Force Base. And when I met her, she was downsizing. She had two tigers and five dogs. And one or two that could have been considered wolf dogs. Even though she is trained in business and economics, Susanna spent most of her life being hands-on with animals, starting as a child riding horses in Eastern Europe. She has been keeping reptiles and dogs since the early 1980s and big cats since the mid 90s. Shortly after I met her, I found out she had tigers, and it was a case of, you, you know, would like to go see my tigers. I was like, oh, okay, we'll go to the zoo. And, you know, she has some that she treats as her own. And what does she do? She hands me a milk bottle and go here and give her a bottle of milk, and you know, I was milk feeding her. At first, Scott was understandably apprehensive about meeting Susanna's bigger cats, but he quickly became familiar with the unique requirements of owning exotic pets. To me, they're like extra large dogs, but that do weigh 400 pounds, 500 pounds, 600 pounds. And you gotta take that into account. Uh, when we get animals, we start right away when we get them, no matter if they're you know, three weeks old or six months old, training them on a leash, teaching them that no, they don't jump on us, no, we're not a play toy. We're here for love and affection and, you know, to move you around. But, you know, we're not going to roughhouse with you and play. You know, we'll give you all the toys you need, give you the playmates or give you the entertainment you need, but not with us. Those playmates generally come from the local dog rescue and act as companions and teachers to the exotic animals. Actually, some of the dogs we got are wilder than the tigers because they're actually born in the wild. And a rescue group picks them up and you know, we rehomed some of them. And they've ended up with either tiger or liger. And part of the reason we do it is, well, first we do it at young, but it gives them a companion, gives them a playmate, and they learn from the dog how to play because the dog won't allow the rough tiger play. So it tones the tiger down a little bit. My worst animal bite was from two dogs fighting, and I was breaking it up, and I got in, in between, and I got bit instead. They have disagreements, usually at, at feeding time, who gets the biggest piece. It, you'll see that, you know, dogs do that together anyway. And they're very respectful of each other, and the dog is usually the boss. And it's not just the dogs that come from rescue situations. Some of the animals here have been surrendered by private owners who learned the hard way that keeping an exotic pet is not at all like keeping a domestic dog or cat. It's a lot of work, a lot of dedication. I know it's not for everybody. It's something you gotta put a lot of thought in if you go into it. But 
if you want it, you got to be prepared to deal with a lot of issues. Uh, it's not just, I have this animal and it looks great. No, you, you have this animal and you've got to take care of it because they're completely dependent on you. Scott and Susanna are well aware that taking care of their animal's welfare is a full-time job. You know, you don't do something like this just because it's a cool thing to do. It's not like I can take two weeks off and go to the beach somewhere. No, I gotta worry about them being fed, being watered, being clean, veterinary care for any reason. I'm always sore. <laughs> uh, there's always something to do. Every day is different. It depends on the time of year in the winter because the property is so vast and we have to have water to all the animals. Is you know, If we have freezing temperatures, check to see if water hoses are broken, if water manifolds are broken. Make sure that animals haven't destroyed something. It's never dull, I can tell you that. We've taken in a lot of animals and we just take them in like you take an animal from the shelter. It just needed a new home and we treat them like a pet. In fact, Scott and Susanna even take the unusual step of making sure their pets get enough exercise by walking their big cats on leash. It's a practice that most pet owners are very familiar with, but when the animal you're leading weighs between 300 and 600 pounds and is capable of killing you within seconds, it's a risky activity. And when your predator pet is weary of a camera crew, it's a practice that could be life-threatening. And he's the one that came from Las Vegas Zoo. Yeah. He's an attention hog. He wants to be on camera everywhere. And he's the only one we don't don't leash leash walk because you they were hands off with him so he doesn't know what a correction is. Um, and he's just perfectly happy and he's really easy to move because he'll just follow me anywhere. So uh, I'm gonna put a transport cage up to his enclosure and he'll walk right in for me. Yeah, you really hate it here, huh, buddy? The relationship between human and pet takes on life-changing importance when the animals you're dealing with are highly effective predators with claws sharp enough to sever blood vessels, teeth that can rip through flesh and sinew, and jaws strong enough to crush bones. Certain people don't want us to have these animals. It's so special that, you know, or so dangerous, I, I shouldn't have it. Well, are you gonna take away my chainsaw too? Because it's so dangerous, I shouldn't have it. I understand some of the stuff on the animal welfare issue, but that should be for any animal. You know, don't have one standard for exotic animals and a different for your dog or house cat. It should run across the gamut. Making one animal more special than the other, it, to me, is wrong. You know, they all should be treated well. American Humane is an organization dedicated to protecting the welfare of animals. Their focus is on the care of captive exotics more than on the debate over whether or not they should be kept in captivity. I am not okay with people who take on private exotics that haven't give a lot of thought to what it's going to entail long term. Because eventually they're gonna to run into a problem with resources, with care, with land, with security. And unless you have given a lot of thought to that, you're just not in a position to own an exotic like a tiger. The problem is, with a lot of people here in the U.S., you have some money, you have some means, you have some curiosity, and you think, ah, I'll take on a tiger and see what happens. But it's, it's not a good deal for the tiger, and, and sometimes it's not a good deal for the person. Even those highly experienced with keeping dangerous exotic animals agree that it is not for everybody. The thing is, can you get a tiger? Yes. Uh, can you get a Ferrari? Yes. Is it for everybody? No. A Ferrari's not a good family car. I don't think a tiger's necessarily a good family pet. Never, no. Nope. And you know, this is someone who loves the animal, loves the species. In fact, my favorite animal, and I get asked this a lot, it's not a dog, it's a cheetah. So if I could own a big cat, it'd be great. But like for most who own tigers in the US, it's a novelty. They shouldn't own them. 
you know, they don't deserve that privilege of ownership with these animals. I don't think it's thought through in a lot of cases. No, no, even with my experience, my expertise, 20 years as a vet, I would not own a tiger. There are an estimated 10,000 big cats living in captivity in the United States. The majority are privately owned. And in many jurisdictions, people can keep a big cat on the property without reporting it to local officials or even to their neighbors. People think, hey, you have a tiger, what if it gets out? Well, the fact is, especially with tigers or any big cat, if they've gotten out, nothing's happened. There's no record of any big cat attacking, much less killing, anybody off the property. It's always on the property, on their territory. More of a case of you, as a person not used to being around tigers, would not know how to react properly if a tiger charged at you. Versus me, is I know what to do, you know, I can break it off in two seconds. You will turn and run, and all of a sudden, you know, you have a tiger crawling up your back. Animal attacks often occur when people react in a way that the animal doesn't understand or simply hasn't seen before. Like with the wolves, part of their greeting is mouthing. And they'll just come up, you know, put their mouth on your arm. They're not biting down or anything, but if it was anybody else that doesn't know that, they'll yank their arm away, and all of a sudden they got mauled by a wolf, and when the, the wolf had no intention of doing that. Animals put in unfamiliar situations are often more afraid of humans than we are of them. And that's when an encounter can become deadly. In other cases, owners are teaching their pets bad habits. And a lot of it comes from not knowing what they're doing. And some people just do the wrong things uh, in raising them. I remember seeing one video of a, one guy that used to play tug of war with his tiger at feeding time, you know, play tug of war. Well, his daughter ended up putting her arm in the enclosure and the tiger did what it was trained to do, played tug of war. And it's instances like that where, you know, the injuries and deaths come along. And the people being injured are the handlers, owners, or people in and around the big cats. And it's very simple. It's sort of like, if you don't want to die by skydiving, don't go skydiving. If you don't want to be injured by a big cat, don't go where the big cats are. So just why are Scott and Susanna willing to go where the big cats are? For the love of the animal. There's nothing like it when they come up and seek a reassurance from you. Something makes it nervous. It's like, is it OK? Yeah, yes, it's OK. Yeah, you can go do it. About 95% of what I do it for is for the animal whichever animal may be. Some animals are more affectionate than others. You build a stronger relationship with certain ones. The ones you raise from three weeks old or one that you get four months old, it's just how the relationship develops. Australia is made up of two-thirds of desert. It's a harsh place for any animal to survive. This one has adapted perfectly to its environment. The dingo is a carnivore that was introduced from Asia around 5,000 years ago. And it has thrived in Australia ever since. A subspecies of the wolf, they can be seen as a pest by farmers and are known to kill livestock. But can they be a good pet? Dave Graham recognizes the dangers, but has chosen one as his companion. While it's rare to see a pure white dingo, what makes this one even more unusual is that the owner has fallen in love with her. Do I consider Alice uh, a pet or a best mate, I think, I think she's like my girlfriend. I can't be without her and I don't think she can be without me. She owes me, she controls me, she's, oh my God. We have some arguments, but she always wins and she runs the household, she runs everything that we do. Dave is a farmer and a qualified animal behaviorist from Queensland. 
And from his experience working with dogs, he totally understands the genetic makeup of the dingo. The dingo is quite literally a dog that has gone back into a wolf-like state. When they first came to Australia, they went straight back into the bush and have become that wolf-like creature with the five elements that all the dogs that we now have have been bred out from. Dingoes have everything. They track, that's sniffing out their prey. They stalk their prey, which is where we've now got all of our herding breeds come from. They chase down their prey, which of course is our hunting dogs that we now have. Uh, they consume, rip apart their prey. And then of course, they also have that social aspect. They do work together. They really do work in packs. Using their paws, uh, using their teeth, really rip anything apart and they can get right inside, get the exact part of the, the animal that they want to eat with the amazing dexterity that these guys have. Farmers have blamed dingoes for causing large amounts of damage to livestock. As a farmer, Dave has witnessed some of the damage done to his sheep by wild dogs. When you grow up in the outback on uh, the inside of the, the dingo fence, uh, you have a difficult relationship with wild dogs. So my entire life, I've always seen uh, wild dogs as an enemy because I've seen the damage that they've done on our livestock, on my sheep. There were some nights that, um, that they would come in and, and take out 90 odd sheep, but not kill them, just, just rip them apart. And my job, of course, was to come through and, and uh, and put them down in a humane way. And uh, that was always difficult for me to um, appreciate the beauty of the dingo in the bush, but also the, the damage that they can um, bring to our farms. The dingo fence, the world's longest fence, originally built in the 1880s as a rabbit-proof fence, was converted in the 1940s into a dog barrier to protect sheep and cattle from dingoes. Over 5,000 kilometers long, and spread across three states. It has been partly successful in stopping dingoes from crossing the border and killing livestock. The dingoes that managed to get through were often shot by farmers as they were considered pests. So how does anyone consider this a safe pet? It's been a long journey for me to appreciate how beautiful and how valuable dingoes are to our bush, but I I'm under absolutely no delusion whatsoever that, uh, that wild dogs and vulnerable animals um, mean lots of blood. There is a contradiction. In his farming life, Dave had to destroy wild dogs that were killing his livestock. Alice was the one dingo that stole his heart. Alice was found uh, about three and a half years ago I was on the inside of the dingo fence in the outback of New South Wales, where wild dogs um, are exterminated. A farmer came across a litter of pups in a den, and uh, as he was uh, putting them all down, after he'd already put the mother down, of course, one of these offsiders, who was a contractor from the city, said, no, I really want to keep the white one. So he did, and took it back to the city, and learned very, very quickly that dingoes are not dogs. You have to be extraordinarily skilled and you have to have extreme management plans and also very, very, very good fences to be able to keep a dingo in because they are wanderers and they don't require human interaction. And that's what uh, allows these relationships to flourish. In a well-managed situation, it is possible to have an incredible relationship with a dingo as Dave has with Alice together with an appreciation of the role of the dingo in the ecology of Australia. Look, she has 100% trust with me. Yeah, our whole relationship is built on a mutual trust. She knows I won't drop her or hurt her, but it's her favorite thing. Hold her upside down and she's happy. She'll be there for hours, <laughs> but just loves it. <laughs> but all dingoes love it. Anyone that has a dingo, that's what you do, you hold them upside down and then they're, they're happy. Mark from the Armadale Reptile Center looks after two dingoes, Kai and Jay, who were both previously kept as pets. When the owners discovered how much maintenance was required to keep them, Mark agreed to take the dingoes into his care. This is the great problem with a lot of people with pets. They don't think about it first. 
they go by feelings, not by their head. You can't just buy them on a whim. They're not like pups. Pups will fit in. They're very, very forgiving. Dingoes aren't really forgiving. Mark has had to work with the dingoes to gain acceptance from them. In particular, the older dingo, Kai, who is the alpha male, took longer to accept him. I've had Kai growl at me to start off with. Eventually he accepted me, but I couldn't go near Kai. Jay was fine. He was younger though, he's a little pup. That's the way he acted, but the other one backed off and he growled a little. And when they growl, you stand back. Unless they're humanized, they'll keep away from people. But in areas like Fraser Island where people feed them, they get used to it. And uh, if you don't feed them, they'll attack you. Fraser Island is a heritage area situated off the coast of Queensland, which has a population of protected dingoes. The public are giving guidelines to be dingo safe while on the island, for very good reason. There have been many cases of people being bitten by dingoes on Fraser Island, including a nine-year-old boy who was fatally attacked in 2001. Look, what I try and do with Alice is educate people that you need to be respectful of any wild animal in its environment. It's king, and you have to respect it. Don't go near them, don't feed them, don't do anything except for appreciate that they are doing their job by existing in the bush as Australia's apex predator. When you start to feed a wild animal, it's gonna to start to lose the fear, and then as soon as it loses fear, well then it's gonna look for food uh, when you're not supplying it, and you may come into conflict. Alice is an albino dingo, and it must be remembered that at her core, she is a pure blood, and there is always a risk that the wolf within could come to the fore, something that Dave never forgets when he takes her into the public domain. They are predators. There's no two ways about it. They develop their wild instincts as well. One of the ways they show their being alpha is height. They like to get up above you, looking down on you. As you notice, our fences are six foot high and they angle back into the enclosure. That's so they can't climb out because they can climb a six foot fence. They're a wolf. Anything that gets in their enclosure is food doesn't matter what it is. A rat runs through or something like that, they'll eat it. A bird flies low, they'll catch it. A young child could upset one and it could snap, and they do have very powerful jaws. They'll kill very quickly, and you can't stop that. While attacks on humans are relatively uncommon, one of the most well-known dingo attacks occurred in 1980 near Uluru, Central Australia. Lindy Chamberlain, mother of nine-week-old baby girl Azaria, was convicted of her murder. The Chamberlains maintained their baby was taken from their tent by a dingo. And in 1986, following the discovery of Azaria's jacket near a dingo lair, Lindy Chamberlain was immediately released from prison. In 2012, following years of speculation and inquiries, the coroner concluded that the cause of Azaria's death was as a result of being attacked and taken by a dingo. When you ask people instantly, they think of Lindy Chamberlain, the terrible death of her daughter by the jaws of a dingo. So that's prevalent in people's minds. But I think we do have a love affair with dingoes because they're just so strange, so distant and so rare. I mean, you would be hard pressed to find too many Australians that have seen a real dingo in the wild because they naturally just blend in to the environment. That's the job and that's why for hundreds of years of white settlement and of course the thousands of years that they've been here during Aboriginal settlement, they have just inserted themselves into the ecology. But at the same time, these guys are using those jaws every single day to um, get through life. And uh, when you need to eat to survive, it 
brings you up against humans because we're growing animals out there, sheep, cattle, goats, pigs, and of course these guys are hunting in that same territory. So we do really have a love-hate relationship in Australia. Alice has a natural tendency to investigate her surroundings, a trait that's typical of a dingo. She uses her highly tuned senses to great effect around the house. One of the things that makes dingoes different from dogs is that dingoes love to climb. They're up on top of everything, into everything. It doesn't matter how small the surface is. They need to check it out thoroughly and know what's going on in their environment. Yeah, she loves getting up on top of things, but it's really this super investigation and this crazy brain that just needs to know exactly what's going on. They always look like they're chilled, but I think it's because, well, they've got a lot to think about that they've just investigated and they're just going through all their different TV shows that they've got inside their head of all the different adventures they've been on. One could be easily mistaken after seeing Alice's relationship with Dave that dingoes make an ideal pet. The reality is that Alice is a wild animal and by her very nature is a predator. Are we ready? You're being very good to I love my dingo, but uh, they do not make good pets. They are a wild animal that belongs in the wild. It's just that at the moment I belong to Alice. They don't bark, which seems great but they do everything else that could possibly drive you crazy. They shed continuously. Everything gets covered in dingo hair. They get into everything, and of course, trying to contain them is almost impossible. But at the end of the day, they don't need us. They don't need to be looked after us. And when you've got several hundred breeds of dog to choose from, I'd stick with dogs. It's clear that dingoes are a high maintenance animal and anyone who tries to domesticate one will have limited success. Dave, who has a license to keep Alice, has worked with dingoes for many years and knows what's involved to keep Alice under control for her own safety and the safety of others. It doesn't matter where I am, Alice will always be tethered to me or tethered to one of my domestic dogs. It's just a case of if she feels that she needs to run off on a trail, she will run off on a trail after a rabbit or after a rat and she's gone. So I've got to make sure that she is absolutely safe at all times. At the end of the day, she is magnificent. She is an incredible, loving, adorable friend who, um, she's just so sweet. But it, you've got to always remember, she's a wild animal. And not that she could turn in any second, not that she's unpredictable, but she is predictable. She will fight to survive. And uh, that's what they've been doing in this country for five to 8,000 years. So it's not that I don't trust her, it's that I do trust her that one day she could bite and could really do some serious damage. 68% of American households own at least one pet, and many are choosing to own animals that could be considered exotic. The legal definition is subject to local jurisdiction, but generally an exotic pet is one that is rare, unusual, or a wild animal, not typically kept by humans. Often, that's because those animals can be deadly. It's better to be bitten by an angry snake than a hungry snake, because a hungry snake won't let go for a while. But, uh, but they're, they're very popular and should not be kept around small children uh, because the small children are edible. More than 20 years ago, Ken Foose opened a reptile and exotic specialty store. And it's the type of store that is getting harder to find in the U.S. The animals he sells range from those that can just give you a nasty bite to those that can kill in a matter of minutes. This is our second largest selling animal. You would think us being a reptile store, it would be all reptiles, but this, this is a, a, a pygmy hedgehog. They're very popular. We sell hundreds of these, and I wouldn't own one if you gave it to me. But, um, but we sell a lot of them. It's basically an animated rock. Regulations around owning exotic pets are different in every state of the U.S. In Nevada, pretty much anything goes. There's not a lot that we can't have. Uh, I mean, I can have a tiger in here for sale. Why would I? 
I, I'm not qualified to own a tiger. Most of the people I know are not qualified to own a tiger. It's the same thing with primates. We used to sell, we could sell monkeys here. We can sell chimpanzees. We can sell anything we want. But 99% of the people on this planet are not qualified to own a monkey, period. And I'm, I, I sold monkeys for five years, and I just got tired of looking for that 1%. Foose's biggest selling pet may not look frightening, but as a carnivore, it certainly can bite. It can also be dangerous to the environment, and that's why it's illegal to own one across the border in California. You can own a snake, a tiger, or even a bear, but you can't own a ferret. Many of Ken's customers are committing an offense when taking their new furry pets across the state line from Nevada. But Ken is very careful that he doesn't break the law when selling animals, including ferrets. He even plays a role in lobbying government to ensure that regulations surrounding the keeping of exotic and dangerous pets are relevant for both animals and owners. My, my biggest concern with keeping dangerous reptiles and amphibians, I'm talking about rattlesnakes, uh, the large constrictors like, like him or, or something that is potentially life-threatening. If someone comes in here and buys a rattlesnake from me, I, of course, quiz them. How are you doing this? Where do you live? I ask them where you live because in the county, they're not going to let you have one. In the city of Las Vegas, you're required to have a permit. And I wrote the regulations for the permit. If you live down the street and you said you were qualified to keep a rattlesnake, I'll sell it to you. And if you die, or your wife dies, or your kids die, your dog dies because of the snake, I don't care. I mean, you know, your choice, I don't care. If the three-year-old girl living three doors down in her backyard gets bit by the snake because it escaped from your house, that I care about. And the reason is people die from hamster bites. People die from all kinds of animals. And when you accept the risk that comes with owning an exotic animal, you've accepted the risk. Animal ownership laws and regulations are constantly changing, and Ken's whole team are passionate about supporting animal owners' rights. They went from, we were able to keep any size snake, really, to, okay, well, now you can keep a snake that's typically under 12 feet, but you need to have this permit and this, and the permit's the same as where you would have on a sloth, or a um, hi, buddy, or anything bigger that requires bigger space. I have to sit there and notify every one of my neighbors. I have to measure from my front door to the edge of my street, from the back door to the edge of the street, the back door to my fence line. It's just government overreach, wanting to know everything that you keep in your house and why you're keeping it. And it's something that we fight for. I mean, all of us that are passionate fight for and come together and try to make sure that those laws don't pass. Staff member Georgia has 48 reptiles, including several ball pythons, a reticulated python, a couple of boas, some iguanas, some red-footed tortoises, a water monitor, and that's not all. Um, nine ferrets, the genet, five dogs, three cats, and a bunch of rats. <laughs> like many exotic pet owners, George's life would be turned upside down by more restrictive animal laws. I think I would do my best to move because I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to give up that's like my thing, that's, you know, I love them all, so I wouldn't, I would leave. <laughs> as fun as ferrets may be, they'd be easy prey for many of the other animals in Ken Fusa's store. Though Nevada has strict ideas about which snakes locals are allowed to keep as pets. Only venomous snakes native to Nevada and rear fang snakes are allowed to be kept in the state. There are two types of venomous snakes those that inject venom through fangs in the front of their mouths, like rattlesnakes or cobras, and those with fangs at the back of their mouths. They chew the venom into their prey. And then there are the snakes that can literally squeeze the life out of you. All right. Hey, Kim, what are you, what are you pulling out here? This is a uh, tiger reticulated python. Uh, it's about 15 feet long. Air gas grabbed the other end of this, my back wall, cannabis. 
Uh, they do very well in captivity. Like I said, the only real downside to them is they get too big. Um, if a snake like this bites you, you're gonna know it and you'll bleed. They're not deadly. They won't kill you, but they'll, they'll, they'll hurt you a little bit. And snakes aren't the only creatures in store for a venomous bite. Uh, this is a beaded lizard. They come from uh, Mexico and Central America. Uh, they are, they are venomous. Uh, they've got these um, venom glands in their lower jaw. And they don't have fangs, but they have very, very sharp, jagged teeth. They're actually really easy to keep, and they're generally pretty mellow. But it's also the excitement you've got a beaded lizard. They, um, you know, there's something romantic about having one. Beaded lizards can grow to three and a half feet long and are related to the Gila monster. They're the only two venomous lizards in the world and can deliver an extremely painful bite. And they just tend not to let go. Uh, they will hang on to you uh, forever. There is no anti-venom for this. They, they won't kill you. Years ago, we had um, someone break into one of the cages and stole one of our beaded lizards. Uh, and it was a baby, it was about four inches long. And he put it in his pocket. As he reached into the cage to grab it, he got bit. And then when he put it in his pocket, he got bit again. And ended up uh, going to the hospital. So he recovered, he made a full recovery, and in fact came into the store about a year later and stole something else from us. But we caught him that time. Yeah, but they're very, very cool, and, and people like them because they're a novelty. They're different, they're not lethal. Uh, it's not an animal that can kill you. It's almost like the throat, same thing, there's a lot of people that keep rattlesnakes and cobras and, and things like that. And I think it's just the novelty of it. People that just really like venomous reptiles. Uh, I can understand it, I don't own any myself, uh, but I used to. And there's kind of a thrill there and they're very, very neat. And it's not just venomous reptiles that people consider exciting pets. Arachnids, better known as scorpions and spiders, are also a popular, if not unusual, companion. Nothing elicits as much fear in so many as the spider. Yet, exotic pets staff member Gaz has been fascinated with them from a young age. I was about eight years old and my, my first pet was uh, two leopard gecko lizards. And then after that, it was a tarantula, a rose hare. Yeah, that's, uh, they, they were my first kind of pets. And then like, my mum didn't like snakes. So I got a corn snake from a friend of mine and I had to keep it hidden. I had it hidden for a year before my mum found out. The largest of the spiders, tarantulas, may appear deadly, but their venom won't kill you. That's not to say that their large fangs won't cause some damage or that their venom is completely harmless. You know, there's certain species of tarantulas that it's not recommended to handle. Um, like some of the old world species, like the Pocletheria. You know, they're, um, you know, from like India, Sri Lanka, those areas. Um, they, they, they've got a pretty potent venom. It's gonna make you feel pretty rough for a few days if you get bitten by one of those. That's a Goliath 30, and now they are very big, very big fangs, and very aggressive. So it's really not recommended to hold those guys. Large fangs and potent venom aren't a tarantula's only means of inflicting pain on their human owners. As a defense mechanism against larger predators, many species of tarantulas inflict tiny hairs off their abdomen. These hairs can irritate the eyes, nose, and even the lungs. So this is a new world species, so they've got these urticating hairs, which is their first line of defense is to flick these hairs. So they're they're a little bit docile, you know, so they're not prone to bite. Their first line of defense is to flick hairs, so I wonder if it'll do it. See how he's, he's rubbing his back legs now, gives his abdomen? That flicks up these hairs. So he's a bit of a hair flicker, but usually his species is not too bad. Oh yeah, they've got fangs, and uh, you know, they've got venom, just like all spiders. There are more than 1,700 different types of scorpion, though only about 20 of them have venom powerful enough to kill a person. The most dangerous scorpion, the Indian red, could kill you within 24 hours. Uh, yeah, I mean, just a few weeks ago, I was stung by an emperor and a nation. I was, you know, I was just being foolish, you know. But yeah, they're actually a really easy going. 
Yeah, don't threaten them, and they do pretty good. Yeah. I mean, the things with these, you want to be more worried about their pinch than the sting. Their pinch is really hard, and they don't let go. They'll, they, they'll make you bleed. Yeah, they'll make you bleed, man. It's real hard. But their sting, like I said, got stung by them. Once again, it was like a wasp sting. You know, a little bit of irritation for about 30 minutes, and that's it. As long as you don't, because uh, that's a big stinger. See yeah. the stinger in there? It's like a nail going into your hand. And it's not just teeth and fangs you have to watch out for. Many of the animals, Ken sells, can hurt you in more than one way. There's a risk to anything. I mean, it's like I said before, it doesn't matter whether it's a hamster. There's always an inherent risk. Uh, of course, we would tell people this is a rear fang state, be careful. But, uh, but beyond that, this is not another animal that could never hurt you. The, the venom is, uh, is, is not strong enough to do more than like localized swelling. Um, the snakes, the, the, the animals that I have in here, quite frankly, that, that hurt you the most are things like these. Claws. It's, it's, the, the, it's the teeth and the jaws and, and the claws. These, these are not from snake bites. These are from these people's, these animals' toenails. Now these, the key thing here, there we go. The key thing with these things is you control the legs. And that way you don't bleed. This is what I call tame. Um, uh, when they first came in, there's no way I could hold them like that. I would be bleeding all over the place. Uh, I've never seen one try to bite, but they rip you to pieces with these very sharp claws. So many of the animals in Ken's store have bites that can rip skin or inject venom or claws that can draw blood. Why would anyone want to own them? They're just such cool animals, you know? It's just, they're, you know, they're, I've always found them fascinating. Um, from from the, the tiniest of little, like, common house spiders, you know? It's just beautiful, they're just fascinating animals, man. I've always been fascinated by them. It's the thrill. It's it's why do people race cars or, or hang glide? It's everybody has their own adrenaline fix and that they've chosen, and this is a lot of people, this is it. And for as long as there is a demand for exotic pets, Ken Foos and his team will continue to fight for the rights of animal owners to keep them. Not everyone should keep a lizard, not everyone should keep a dog or a cat or even a mouse. Uh, why would anyone have the big python or have, have this or have that? And I'm like, people jump out of perfectly good airplanes every day. Why? Are you going to ban skydiving? And there, there, a lot of these legislators say they're trying to protect us from ourselves. Well, if you're going to protect us from ourselves, uh, ban smoking, or ban drinking, or ban skydiving, or car racing, or football. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we do to hurt ourselves, and we do it on purpose. So it's it, it makes absolutely no sense to uh, you know, ban something that actually as benign as this. Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits. 
others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. You can go take him over to the log there, Chris. In the course of raising animals and having certain ones, sure, I've gotten bit before. You, you can't be in it 50 years and not have had an incident here or there for, for whatever reason it might have been at that time. And generally, it's been my own fault. Here, come here. Easy, ah, ah, easy. See, that's him. He's actually very happy about that. He just wants to play in the worst way. Although this attack was unexpected, for Luke the Lion, this was apparently playtime. See, like that, jumping on me, that was all, he's all happy. But you see how he was stalking in the bushes. He thought, oh, and it's a big game to him. Yeah, it's, it's all him saying hi. He has his claws, but he didn't use them. I mean, because a lot of times, just, just in play, I, 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 you see that? That's hot. You can't go under the trailer. Steve isn't too bothered by the game Luke is playing. He's worked with exotic animals for around 50 years, and he's seen this kind of behavior before. Lions are quite social animals, and within their pride, they are often affectionate with head rubbing, licking, and purring. However, no matter what your experience working with lions, these animals are quick and they are predators with speed on their side. Very, very quick. Say if you were uh, clear at the other end of this pen and he was here, you would never outrun him. He would catch you for sure. I mean, they are extremely fast when they want to be. A lion can run up to 50 miles per hour, but only in short bursts. So they need to be close to their prey before they attack. But generally, lions are a sleepy bunch, and they like to lay around with their pride for around 18 hours a day. They look at us as the dominant member of whatever species. We're talking about lions, so it's lions. They want to do what they do to their fellow lions. We just don't like it when they bite and claw us. So we curtail that. Hi. Yes. Chris Edrington works alongside Steve Martin, training animals to work in film and television. This is a job that requires incredible skill, knowing what makes these beasts tick. Easy. He's like a teenage boy. They stretch the limit sometimes. It's the energy you see is a lot of that. By the time they're five or six, they're much more mellow. They might be more mellow as they get older, but getting up close to a lion isn't for the inexperienced. If you didn't know what you were doing, it could be very dangerous. I mean, because he, ah, 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 ah. you got to watch that. He'll jump up and grab it. Oh, he's watching the, the rabbit in the sky. Oh, no, he eventually would jump at it and <laughs> go crunch, crunch. The boom is a great game for Luke. Luke is an experienced animal actor, so the boom is a familiar sight. But Steve knows he needs to keep the boom well away from Luke's reach. This is all part of professional animal training, and Steve Martin is one of the best trainers in the business. See, we teach him a mark. It gives him a place to go to, like if the director said, we need him to come out from behind the bush and come stop there and then run off. We teach him a mark so he can call him to an exact spot. Then I tell him, all right, and then Chris would call him off. If you watch uh, a lot of shows, you'd start picking up on that, that, oh, OK, I get it now. Because you see him come up, skid to a stop in an exact spot. Usually, it's always a trained behavior to go to that. When it comes to training, it's all about repetition. If you want to train a lion to perform on cue, it needs to be second nature for them. As they get older and as they learn stuff, mm -hmm. ah, 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 no, mm -hmm. go on, go back on. He wants to rub on me and say hi. As they, uh, as they get older and they learn stuff, they learn how to learn. And where that might have taken us 20 or 30 times of doing it before he goes, oh, oh I, I got what you want now. You notice how he went out and got on it right away? After a while, you get on set and they go, oh, we, can he do this or that? And I said, well, he doesn't really know us. Give us a few minutes. 
and usually we can get them to do it. Lions have been used in the film industry for many years, from Leo, the MGM Lion, and the black and white era, to a wide variety of blockbusters still being made today. When the lion forgot his lions. Maybe he was tired of retakes, but he suddenly turned on Bigford and gave him a bad mauling. To Bigford, however, it was all in a day's work. Lions have long been associated as the fierce aggressor in popular culture. But there's also a softer, more daring side, as well as being the star of slapstick comedy. In the business we're in, we don't say they're pets, they're working creatures, even though we have a very strong attachment with them and them with us. Usually we always try to get an animal and, and hand raise it. Because it's not like getting an animal, oh, this is no good, we'll get rid of him, get another one, yeah, get rid of him. Usually when they come to us, they're here to stay. <laughs> and we do this as a business. And also, you know, I've been in it, I hate to even admit, since 1967. So I've been in it a lot of years. And, you know, we like our animals. We spend a tremendous amount of time. These guys are here every day, seven days a week. And, and uh, I have other trainers, too, that are very dedicated to all of them. So you build up really strong bonds and relationships with these guys, as you can see. Luke was donated to Steve as a baby from a park in South Carolina. So this young cub has grown up with Steve by his side. This relationship makes it hard to believe that in the wild, a lion can be so dangerous. Oh yeah, he's, he'll be a real good animal. He's, uh, you know, like you can see how excited he is all the time. As he gets older, Hopefully the, the excitedness will settle down a little bit <laughs> because I've been gone for three weeks, so this is pretty normal for him to constantly want to greet you. Oh, I know, it's okay, just relax. Really... <laughs> the relationship between Steve and Luke, like all Steve's animals, is one of great respect. But for Steve, he prides himself on being able to create such a wonderful bond with his movie stars. I'm relaxed, but I'm also aware of what's going on. I mean, there's a lot of people that really think they know what they're doing and don't. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the private sector that do have animals, you know, they get these animals and they raise them as babies and, and they're real rambunctious and, and they think, because my little girl was around it when it was this size, that she can be around it, my daughter, my son, or whatever, when they're full size. It's a whole different mentality. Animals, like humans, grow through varying stages of maturity. Playful when young, but when the predator instinct kicks in, these trainers need to be on their game. The cats are a bit more of a predator than a lot of animals, like bears, for instance. They're not necessarily a real predator like these guys are, and they're a little more intelligent in, in that direction, where these guys basically, they respond out of you know, contact and, uh, and uh, well, their main drive is being fed for what they're doing. You see what he's doing right now? He's going, he's begging. He says, Chris, Chris, give me a piece. That's it. Is it a good boy? No, quit. Juan Stewart is a vet with American Humane. And part of his role is to ensure the safety and well-being of all animal actors. I frequent sets and even the animal companies that provide these dangerous animals to the films. I've had experience and time around a lot of them. You can go back and forth and you may have a moment where you're with someone who's very experienced, has the expertise, and you would say, I feel safe. I think the people around these animals are safe. And then you'll have a moment with someone else who doesn't have the experience or the wherewithal. And you know immediately that that animal poses a threat, potentially a lethal threat, to that person and the people around him. For Steve and his team of professional animal trainers at Working Wildlife, every animal is special. Whether it's a big cat, chimpanzee, or even a bear, this is one of the top go-to companies for animals in high-end TV commercials and blockbuster movies. For such a setup, being vetted is important for their reputation. The American Humane 
We have them come up all the time. They brought somebody from Australia, from New Zealand, and around the world. And they want to see how you handle your animals, because they have humane departments throughout the world. And we call them and ask them to come, because there are certain groups out there, which I won't say their names, <laughs> but uh, are highly against what we do, because they think we starve and beat our animals and all that. So. I don't know how you could take an animal you abused on a set with like 200 people and not have it kill you, <laughs> you know? So it's, they're all, it's all a positive reward system in all the training that we do. With so much experience, the working wildlife training is a slick operation. But for the animals, it's often about playtime and fun. They know there's a reward on offer if they hit their mark. These creatures leave it up to the trainers when it comes to the serious side of the business. When we're on set, we usually are pretty strict. Like, I always take three people. Those other two people, they're not just watching what I'm doing, they're watching what's going on. I'm watching exterior things, and sometimes I'll see somebody, like with these guys here, if you had somebody, one person, you got 50 people here, and one person out over there, like, peeking behind a tree or something, they pick up on that right now. And right away you'll see them like this, uh-oh. I said, who's, and you can see them out there. So we try to keep a handle on all exterior stuff that's going on when we're working. One of the stars in the animal lineup is a Kodiak bear named Tag. He's obedient, playful, and likes a crispy treat or two. But when you're working with bears, it's always best to be cautious. Bears can be very dangerous, I mean, under the wrong circumstances. Even though he's real nice, very, uh, he's very good about things, very forgiving. No matter what, he's still a bear. You know, and you always have to take that into respect. So you do the wrong thing and at the right time and you could you could set them off for one reason or another. So we're, we're very careful about what we do and how we do it. And we've actually had him in houses and various things. And, but, you know, we go and check everything out before we are ever going to do a job in certain situations and make sure it's safe for him and for the people. Tag is clearly one of Steve's most beloved bears. And he is so switched on that he's worked out it's very much to his advantage to be well behaved in order to get a few extra rewards. He's not real keen on chocolate, usually. I like that. It's because it's got peanuts in it. I mean, sometimes I offer him like a chocolate bar and he'll put his nose on it. Yeah. Well, bears are very, very smart. And you can teach them a lot of things. One of my favorite is lions. I really like the cats. But these guys are, they have a different intelligent level compared to a cat. A cat's more primitive where these guys are they're, the primitiveness isn't as strong in them as it is in the cats, so they're a little smarter. I, th I think they, they definitely think about, if they didn't like somebody, it's always back there in the back of their mind, you know, and if the opportunity arose, they could probably take advantage of it. But you have to be careful because they do have their claws. You know, none of these animals, as you can see, would be clawed. Tag is so popular, he even travels overseas to take a starring role in the movies. He's very socialized with people. I mean, actually, we, him, we can work in close proximity, like the thing we just did in South Africa is with Johnny Knox and him, and we taught him to drink beer. I mean, it wasn't beer, it was, uh, we put to Dr. Pepper in a beer can. But the two of them are sitting down drinking together, and they high-five each other with their beer. We had two days prep down there and did all the sequences they wanted, so he's a very adaptable bear because he's had so much exposure that he's, when he goes to a new place, he knows it's a, it's a game. Oh, here's my name. Here's your animal cracker. Come on. You're too lazy to get up and get it, though, huh? Bears have different appetites depending upon the time of year. In spring through to summer, they'll eat three to five gallon buckets of food a day. But in the cooler months, it's about a half a bucket. Well, it's, yeah, their whole system slows down this time of year. You're a lazy worker right now, aren't you? 
It seems Steve has Tag well trained. However, these animals all have predator instincts that should never be disregarded. But with safe practice in mind, the working relationship between animal and trainer can be full of rewards. You can see in this guy, he picks up on things real quick. So, you know, at first when we start teaching him, like I said before, it's it's a, a slower process. But as as they learn how to learn, they they kind of like these bears. They'll just kind of look at you like, oh, okay, and so you pick it up real fast. Shake it, shake it, shake it. Good, good boy. Good boy. The animals are always the number one priority at working wildlife. And Steve has an incredible setup where the animals only spend a small amount of time in their enclosures. On a property this size, the animals get to roam in dedicated open spaces while they prepare for their next starring role. The fear of snakes is one of our most common phobias. Why do we have such an adverse reaction to snakes, even though most of us have never seen one in the wild? Snakes are found on every continent except Antarctica, and there are over 3,600 species slithering across them. Most are non-venomous, but the ones that are venomous can kill, which gives all snakes this bad reputation. However, John can and his snake-loving family find them irresistible. People are scared of snakes because of the unknown factor. And even when you fully explain it to them, there's no danger if you're careful. They've still got that phobia there, they're concerned. The main thing is you don't try to pick him up, you don't tread near him. A lot of deadly snakes, you can tread near them, they'll escape. A lot of them will put up and, and have a go at you. They're not aggressive, they're defensive. And their defense is being aggressive. Given the deadly reputation of venomous snakes, why is it that snakes are the most common exotic animals kept in captivity? John's unique family story goes some way to answering this. John Can has been living with snakes all his life. The Can family has worked with snakes for almost a hundred years. And John's father, George, took over the snake show at La Perouse from 1920, which is still operating today at the same site in Sydney, Australia. The original show was promoted as the snake pit of death, guaranteed to draw a crowd. John and his brother George Jr. have been extremely close to snakes their whole life. So much so that John is a leading expert and author on the subject of snakes and other exotics. Since his retirement from the snake shows in 2010, John has had more time to concentrate on writing books about these cold-blooded reptiles that have fascinated him since childhood. Dad started when he came back from the First World War. He was still in the Army in uh, February 19. Come back from France. There was nobody doing the snake show, and he was the snake man by then. So he went and caught a few snakes and set up the pit at the La Perouse. And Mum used to be the Cleopatra. She was the first snake show lady in Tasmania when she was 13. Mum worked on the same showground as Dad and down the track they got married. Whenever Dad was bush, Mum used to do the show at La Perouse. Never with real bad snakes, I can assure you. She probably had pythons and a few black snakes. It's uncommon for exotic pet ownership to cross over many generations. But for John Can, the handling of dangerous snakes is a family tradition. The collection of snakes includes some of Australia's deadliest species. We got most of our snakes from around here, but we used to travel the country a lot when we was getting snakes for milking. We used to go to different lake countries in New South Wales, down into Victoria. But uh, generally speaking, we used to get local snakes. When they weren't using local snakes in the show, 
John and his dad regularly traveled into the countryside looking for new exhibits to include. When I was a kid, I was in a swamp in Nara one time. I was probably about, I don't know, eight, nine year old. And dad used to always hunt with his trousers that roll up around his legs. And he was in the water where this big black snake was. He was over two meters thicker than your arm. And dad was battling to get that snake in the bag. But he said, pull my trousers down. And before he knew it, I unbuckled his belt and pulled his trousers down here. His trousers were floating in the bloody water. And he didn't see the funny side of it. Later on, he always said, roll me trousers down. <laughs> The diamond python has a stunning skin coloration, which makes it an attractive option as a pet. They can often be found in the roof spaces of houses, an unwelcome surprise for unsuspecting homeowners. The keeping of dangerous snakes is a risk, and yet their popularity as pets is grown worldwide. In the wild, snakes avoid humans, whereas in captivity, they spend a lot of time being handled. But are all snakes the same? Is it possible to completely tame a snake? They all have their own temperament, whatever mood they're in, but some of our deadliest snakes do quieten down in captivity after a time, and people in my opinion, carelessly put the venomous snakes around their neck and as I photographed in one of my book, a friend of mine kissing a tiger snake and that's the snake that killed him. So you can never be certain they're not going to bite even when they're quiet. I have had friends of mine in comas for weeks and weeks after a spitten by a snake they reckon would never ever bite them. So. Rob, who is one of the current snake handlers at La Perouse, also works as a professional snake catcher and knows what's required to safely manage these reptiles. The experience of being bitten by a snake can sometimes be uh, a good lesson. Best avoided, but I have been bitten by venomous snakes. Out of thousands of snake species, that are many of them are harmless, I could have been bitten by many harmless species. But I think what people are trying to ask is, have you been bitten by venomous snakes? And the answer is, yes. I'd, it'd be sort of weird if you hadn't, in a way, to be so involved with snakes and never actually experience that part of, and I don't recommend it in any way. Don't go and get yourself bitten by a snake. Our only highly venomous ambush predator is this historical snake. But it's got the worst name of any snake in history. This snake is called the Death Adder. One of the fastest striking snakes in the world. And they are quite venomous. If you measure the toxicity of their venom, and the best way I can describe how venomous a Death Adder is, is by how many people used to die from its bite. The death rate from death adder bite before the invention of anti-venom was apparently 50% fatality rate before the invention of anti-venom. Even when you're an expert with snakes, it must be remembered you could be dealing with a venomous snake that won't hesitate to bite if they feel threatened. John's dad survived the ordeal of being bitten by a tiger snake. He got a very bad bite from a big tiger snake on the, on the ankle there, and the snake really hung on and gave him a lot of venom, and all he did was say to his friend who was with him at the time, don't tell the missus about it, you know? But she knew, she could see the look on his face that he was, he was bitten. But that bite would have killed a normal person, I would say, could have been within 10 minutes, it could be an hour or two. 
but it was a bad bite from a big cranky snake. Tiger snakes. One of the world's deadliest snakes are highly venomous and found in subtropical and temperate regions of Australia. Tiger snakes are dangerous, but people do keep them as pets. They appear intimidating and fearsome, but it is mostly a bluff. Experts will say that you do need a high level of experience in snake handling before you even think about keeping a venomous species. Is a snake recommended as an ideal pet? As with most exotic animals, it requires a special kind of person that's prepared to provide the right environment for them to live in. But unlike a domestic cat or dog, a snake will never come looking for any affection from its human. If you like snakes, that's the only way you can call them a pet. They course, say, they'll never get to know you. A lot of people get the impression that snakes do know you, I don't believe it. They'll I'll come to you when you open their cage or their door or whatever. They think you're going to supply them with food. Some snakes will bite you when they're really hungry uh, by mistake, but soon let you go. We're talking about non-venomous snakes. But generally speaking, they make a good pet, you know, as long as you can look after them properly and you've got the right facilities to do so. Yeah, I would definitely say snakes make good pets. Depends on who you are but they're more catered to somebody who has an interest in natural history. See, a dog or a cat is for people who just need something and it has to do something for them. With a reptile, especially a snake, it's more of an interesting creature from a scientific point of view. They're interesting in their reproductive biology, in their behavior. They're low maintenance. So they, they actually make quite good pets. John Cant is a responsible owner with an enormous amount of experience. He has always been around snakes and other exotics. And in some way, this has definitely enhanced his lifestyle. Snakes evoke fear, but for John, they are a constant joy and a pet that in most cases are easily handled. Knowing how to handle a snake properly is important. Allowing them to move freely is recommended, as it will soon let you know if it isn't comfortable. You never restrict their movement. If I stopped him from moving, he would get cranky about it. Maybe not bite me. If I held it long enough, he probably might. I don't know. I'm not going to try it out. But irrespective of that, you never restrict a snake from moving unless it's a venomous snake and you got him by the tail and you're trying to keep his head away from you, you hold him by the body. But um, as a so-called pet or that python, you don't restrict their movements. John's diamond python is from the python family, which are non-venomous and known as constrictors. Tightening slowly around their victim, constrictors coil their body around the prey until they are suffocated and ready to consume. Pythons can swallow prey bigger than the diameter of their own heads, which broadens the possibilities of a hearty meal. The snake pit at La Perouse provides the opportunity for the public to get up close and personal with some of Australia's deadliest snakes in a controlled environment. Rob recalls the impact his snakes have on the public that come to see the shows. People react here to snakes a lot better than they do when it's in their house. The snake in a snake show is always, people react to it much better because it's in a controlled situation. Uh, and there's a snake handler there. If you bring the snake over to the wall to show them, they step backwards at the same rate. And some people even scream uh, when the snake heads in their direction. So the people are as highly variable as the snakes are. <laughs>
Well, they're all very curious. I often used to get the impression at times when people would be disappointed you never got bitten, <laughs> which is probably could have been true. I, I, I'd like to think I was wrong, but they're interested on the educational aspect of it. The shows at La Perouse have been entertaining people for generations. These days, the shows educate people about some of Australia's deadliest snakes that are kept safely tucked away in bags at the snake pit, waiting for their turn to draw gas from the spectators. As each snake is displayed, Rob explains the characteristics of the species and exposes some common misconceptions about snakes. Safety is always top of mind when working with these reptiles. And even though he knows their behaviors well, there is always the slim chance he could get bitten. They have to be respected at all times. But as far as John is concerned, a lifetime's fascination with snakes proves that even this misunderstood and often feared predator can become a unique part of the family. Just don't expect them to fetch a ball. Australia's largest island, Tasmania, is home to some of the world's strangest animals. And sadly, it's best known for the demise of the most well-known marsupial, the Tasmanian tiger. Extinct since the 1930s, it may come as a surprise that they were once kept as pets, but even this could not guarantee the species' survival. The debate around exotic animals as pets is now centered on the other recognizable Tasmanian animal, the Tassie devil. The keeping of native animals in Australia is a hot topic, but maybe the best opinion on this comes from someone who works with the devils every day. Alicia looks after a colony of devils, and one in particular is young Hurricane. This here is baby Hurricane. He is a Tasmanian devil. He's approximately five months old, we believe. Um, so he is being hand raised by me at the moment. So he comes to work with me every single day and then when I go home at night he comes with me as well. He's being bottle fed around five to six times a day every four to five hours. So uh, he needs constant care, constant warmth. He's got a little hutch that he lives in when he's at home with me which has a heat pad and, and lots of blankets and, and soft toys and things in there for him as well. Hurricane is cute, but Alicia does know that his bite is as bad as his squeal. Tasmanian devils actually have the strongest jaw of any animal relative to their size. The second strongest jaw belongs to the tiger. Therefore, pound for pound, Tassie devils can actually bite you harder than a tiger. An average adult male weighs in at around 18 pounds. Its muscular build and strong jaws mean it can tear into wombats weighing up to 65 pounds. You pop him down on the ground and it's natural instinct for him to want to chase you. So what he'll do is he'll chase me for as long as he needs in order to, to find my leg and climb back up my body. So he comes home with me and, and terrorises my living room. <laughs> He likes to intimidate you, so that's Tasmanian's devil's game, basically. They like to open their mouth wide and show you their big teeth. They like to make really terrifying noises in front of your face. He likes to approach and likes to try to scare you out of his territory if he doesn't want you to be in there. If he does bite you, it's going to hurt. <laughs> um, it's probably going to scar as well, so you need to watch those signs really carefully and make sure that you are safe while you're in there. Devils could be good pets. The 
their size, the sleeping habits, and what they eat is similar to that of a pet dog. But unlike dogs, when Hurricane reaches sexual maturity, a different approach is needed. He's going to be fine for at least two years until sexual maturity kicks in. And, and then he's not going to be aggressive. He's just not going to be friendly anymore. So I would not be able to hold him up like a baby with his face next to mine and feel confident um, that there isn't a chance that he would bite me. Once sexual maturity kicks in, he, he turns back into a, a wild sort of devil and um, his sexual instincts kick in and, and that becomes his main priority. If I enter an enclosure where a female is or where he can smell a female, then I then become a threat to his chances to having that female and he does become a little bit more aggressive and, and will want to remove you from his enclosure. I actually hand raised Hurricane's mum and dad, so I was comfortable with them for a long time. His dad was very comfortable with me until sexual maturity hit uh, at around two and a half years old. I could still pick him up, he'd climb up my leg and, and be happy to have a cuddle, um, just like your friendly dogs and cats at home, until about two, two and a half years old. And then once he started to feel like a, a big boy, it became very unsafe to go in with him then. So that's his natural instinct, he wants to grab on. I have a little bit of arm in there, <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty painful. It's like a vice-like grip at the moment. Um, he doesn't want mum to leave him behind in the wild, so he needs to latch on with all his might. Uh, obviously, if another animal wants to come by and eat him, uh, they're gonna wanna pull as hard as they can to get him off mum's back. So uh, once he latches onto something, there's a vice-like grip there. Um, so if he gets my finger or if he gets my arm, just gotta leave it there until he's done, basically. <laughs> There's little doubt that a tight grip could cause serious injury. The devil's bite force is an obvious deterrent to human contact. It's less damaging, but when they're adults, you definitely don't want them to bite you. So you're always watching their behavior to make sure that they're not showing any aggressive signs like that. As adults, if they were to bite you, it's usually just a warning bite. They'll bite you in an attempt to scare you and then they're going to let go straight away. So they're not going to hold on, uh, which is wonderful because otherwise you could end up with some broken bones depending on where they were biting you if they really wanted to. Welding gloves is one good thing that you should always be wearing if you are going to have to handle the devil. It's not going to help you too much, um, but it's going to help a little bit. Holding them at the base of their tail is the safest place if you can get to it. Although it's illegal to own any endangered native Australian animals, it's more the Tasmanian devil's temperament that protects it from private animal ownership. Usually people do try to push the boundaries with things like that. Probably people are a little bit too scared with Tasmanian devils. Tasmanian devils tend to have a really bad name. They'll stand in front of you, they'll open their mouth really wide and they, and they want to try to intimidate you. <laughs> People will tend to see that sort of behaviour and, and tend to think, I don't want to go anywhere near that Tassie Devil, so I don't think anyone really even wants to have them as pets, which is good. Sure, yeah, so Tasmanian Devils, of course, you cannot have them as a pet. You can't have any native wildlife as a pet. The Australian government just does not allow you to do that. It encourages then people to illegally take those animals out of the wild, which you want to decourage, of course. So Tasmanian Devils especially you cannot have. They're an endangered species. They're quite a tricky species to look after and they're dangerous as well. So if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know those warning signs as they get older, a lot of damage can be done um, to yourself, younger children, other animals and things like that as well. Some believe that devils could be taught not to be so aggressive and be as calm and domesticated as a family pet. Twinkle was one such pet. She lived with her owner, Mike Jago, for many years. Her behavior was perfect, up until just after her first birthday. Mike came home one day to find Twinkle had destroyed his leather lounge. When the thylacine died out, the Tasmanian devil took over the title of the largest known carnivorous marsupial. 
but where the thylacine's relatively docile nature made it suitable as a domestic pet. Even hand-reared devils are far from safe to be around. Some experts say that had devils been domesticated for generations, they may have become more predictable and better behaved. Domestication may also help in saving the species. It is estimated that 90% of all devils in the wild are affected by an aggressive cancer which is threatening their existence. Many believe we are witnessing the demise of a species and that captive animals may be the only way forward. Private ownership may still be a possible solution to the conservation of other species, but the issue remains contentious. Is domestication really a viable solution? In some states here in America, it is outright legal to own just about anything, but that doesn't make it okay and it doesn't make it beneficial to the animal. Just because it's legal doesn't make it right, and we know that. You know, animal ownership is certainly uh, you know, underscores that, and it, it's an evolution. You know, the understanding of the care, uh, the welfare that goes into a lot of these animals, it's an evolution and it takes time. Tigers and lions, for example, have been successfully bred in captivity, but none have ever been reintroduced to the wild. To save cats, you've got to have that entire ecosystem intact. Any part of that food chain is out and the cats are going to die. So uh, keeping animals in their own habitat is by far the, the best way. Alicia and Hurricane have formed a bond that may just be a positive sign for this much maligned species. I'm mum to him now, yep. So he knows my scent. Um, he's pretty happy to be hand raised by me if somebody else has to give him a bottle uh, for any reason, just for one of those times. He tends to be a little bit more frustrating because uh, it's different smells to him. Um, obviously everyone has a little bit of a different technique as well. So he prefers consistency. He likes to be hand raised by only one person. Uh, it does work best for him um, in order for him to, to grow and develop as he's supposed to. I feel like I'm really, really lucky. Tasmanian devils are obviously an endangered species, so being able to work so closely with a species that's so special and so unique um, is really awesome. And also working with them, you know, you're actually doing something to help them in the wild as well. So um, I also help run the Devils in Danger Foundation. So Hurricane will be an ambassador species for, for that foundation, encourage people to fall in love with him um, and Tasmanian devils in general, which is going to, of course, encourage people to want to donate and to want to help save them in the wild really, really important to let people see them and, and gain such an appreciation for a really special species that people tend to overlook a lot of the time. Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues on both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. Standing next to an elephant is an awe-inspiring experience. There is a thrill that comes with being so close to a wild animal, a mix of fear and excitement. 
No matter how exhilarating it is, there's always an element of danger. Charlie Samet is the founder of Monterey Zoo in Salinas, California. It's because of his experience and incredible way with his animals that working not just so close to, but actually amongst the herd of elephants is even possible. Christy, Paula, Buffy. There must be a convention going on down there that I wasn't made aware of. Hi, girl. Come on. You ever been in a stampede? This is the first time for everything. Atta girl, move up. Ah, what's going on here? Hmm? Atta girl. Christy, that's Buffy. Buffy was a carnival elephant. Christy was a circus elephant. And they just both found retirement homes here. I do have to say though, from the entertainment industries they came from, they came to us very healthy, very sound, um, very well taken care of. So they weren't what I would consider a rescue by any means. They were just done working in those environments and uh, needed a, a place to retire. Had it not been for Charlie, there's no way we would have felt comfortable enough to come so close to these potential lethal heavyweights. Somebody once said that the day you get elephants, your life changes forever, and they couldn't have been more right. So our entire lives revolve around these elephants. If we're on a boat somewhere in the Bahamas and I get a phone call that one of them is down, we're on a plane home. Doesn't matter. Nothing comes before the elephants. It's, they're, they're literally your children. They're very demanding. They're, uh, you know, they are dangerous. When you first get them, you have to move into their lives very carefully. This is Paula. She's our old lady, and it's really kind of funny that she's here right now because she's usually so bashful. What are you doing? Huh? Charlie started out in law enforcement with no ambition to work with exotic animals. What are you doing? I was a police officer here in Seaside. We served a warrant one night and arrested somebody. And he had a pet mountain lion in the back in his garage. And uh, long short of it, I ended up with it. I took it home that night. Stupidest thing I ever did. I threw a mountain lion in the back of a Toyota pickup truck with a camper shell and took it home with me. I put it in my dog kennel in the backyard. That's where it all started. Hey, what are you doing? Of course, once you've got a mountain lion, why not also get an African lion? Charlie did, and it would change his life completely. The lion turned out to be an extraordinary animal named Joseph, who led Charlie into a new career, working with Joseph and other animals in the film and entertainment industry. Still, he certainly never imagined he would end up owning elephants. No. Really? How rude. My personality does tend to lend itself to doing well with them. I'm, you know, fairly aggressive, fairly dominant, and they respond well to that. They're very comfortable with that. So we've always done very, very well together. But I gotta tell you, we've had some horrifying days, sad days that, you know, we've lost two, and uh, it's taken weeks to get over. What are you doing? So I guess some could argue that this is probably my favorite place in the world. You know, it's just one of those things where you can't imagine what it's like to have friends like this. Highly intelligent animals, elephants form deep family bonds and live in tight family groups called a herd. Charlie is part of the Monterey Zoo herd. Well, I mean, I actually do feel like one of them. So as soon as they get to me, they do what they need to do, they say hi, and then I'm just one of them, and then they start doing whatever else around me. The thought of them going out to our driveway 
and us not seeing them again just couldn't happen. Couldn't imagine it. Elephants are often seen as placid, gentle animals, but there's no doubt they can pose a very serious threat. Charlie's elephants are hand-picked in a measure that helps ensure the safety of his team. We never brought anything here that we thought was gonna be a threat to our staff. Uh, we do have one, this one here, who had hurt several people before she came here. Um, she didn't kill anybody, but she dumped a few people, so she took a little more work to be around. So my staff doesn't go in with her if I'm not here. Uh, she's just a little pushier, a little typical, if you will. But she's also my, my smartest. She's my thinker. Uh huh, I saw that. What's Butch doing? Now, here's a good example. These were somebody's pets. They were getting expensive. They were getting to be a lot for them to handle. Um, they didn't really have to get rid of them, but they called and asked one day if we didn't have a better situation for them. And the only answer I had was, you know, we could put them in with the elephants, and if they got along fine, if they didn't, we'd have to turn around and bring them right back. That was, what, 10 years ago? And there are days we come out here and the elephants are resting their trunks on them. Now you're gonna hear a lot of noise probably when the boy comes forward. changes quickly as there is a sudden commotion from the elephants. is there was a tractor back there that spooked Butch. He obviously told the girls and they ran running over there to help him. Huh, you big dork. So you see, in a lot of the larger organizations, accrediting organizations, what we're doing right now shouldn't be happening. But where I come from in the entertainment industry, you're never gonna remember knowing elephants from looking at them from a barrier in a zoo like you will today. Um, you gotta meet them to know them. And you gotta know them to wanna help save them. And so, hey, there's humans back here. Charlie has worked with exotics for more than 30 years, and the trust these animals have in him is remarkable. Surely, it must take a special sort of person to be so trusted by a herd of elephants. I do think you have to have the right personality for it, um, but they're smart. 
So there is somewhat of a science to it. And if you apply the science, if you learn it and apply it, it works. Uh, we don't do, we don't handle them the way we used to. It's evolved like everything else. Uh, it's a far, a far kind, kinder training now than it used to be. But for the most part, um, yeah, I'd almost say it's somewhat easier than big cats because they're so smart that it removes a lot of the things you have no control of. And uh, you, can, you can actually apply a little tiny bit of trust. They're like a horse. They're, they, you, know, you, try, you try to get a horse to step on you or to run you over. I had, to ha I had a scene once where I had to have a horse charge into me and knock me down. It took us days to find one that would do it. Um, they just instinctually have no interest in hurting you. Um, but on the other hand, they're like children. You have to be their parent before you can be their friend. So you have to find that balance where they respect you enough to know that they have to listen and they have to behave, but there's a reward for it, you know? And they're smart enough to learn real fast. It works a lot better that way. Charlie spent years building up his rapport with his elephants, and keeping elephants is a full-time job. In fact, it's a full-time job for several people. Well, here's the problem. We're working with them all day. They're working, their minds are being kept busy. 24 seven, we're working with them. And if you don't, they start pushing you around. And then it gets out of hand. Then you lose control. And that's when they become real dangerous. Butch says, I just want to help. Huh? Huh, big dork. So, again, you can't go to work every day and spend what little time you have left with an elephant. You, you have to be doing it full time. You have to be doing it professionally for a living to keep them manageable. Um, but, on the other hand, do we treat them like pets? We treat everything like pets, but we do it professionally. Spending so much time with his elephants, Charlie is completely at ease with them, but he's always alert to possible dangers. Now, when they all came running, when they all went running that way towards Butch, and Christy was in the middle of it, uh, I won't lie to you, I had a little concern there. That's a lot of elephant and very little Christy. So I headed that way. But once again, we've never had a a bad day, we've never had an incident. They did just what I thought they were gonna do. They ran to Butch because they thought he had a problem. Charlie's closeness to his elephants is as much about enriching their lives as it is about enriching his. The best mental stimulation they have is us. The second best mental stimulation they have is the other animals. And the third is themselves, uh, the, the group. So, but they have a lot of things to do here. In the morning, my elephants deliver breakfast to the bed and breakfast. Um, so they go up and they visit with people. Their breakfast baskets have bags of fruit that they get to share with the elephants. So there's the positive. That's why they walk up there with us and they're happy to do it. In the afternoon, people get to come and help us give them baths. And then um, at night, they go to bed. They get their treats and they go into their barns and they go to bed. So. This elephant is normally so shy, she'd be standing back over there and I don't even try to make her come visit people. I have no idea what she's doing right now. She's obviously a camera hog. Paula, what's this about? Paula and Christy came together. Both came from circus. Christy back. Christy back. And there were some things we've changed. Like in circuses, they're not allowed to touch things with their tusks. Whereas in our environment, it was okay. So it took a while to teach her that this was okay. We're, uh, we're far more lenient than they needed to be in circus. So uh, if you will, they get away with a lot more. But we just cut it off at a certain point so that we keep the control and we keep enough respect so it's still a safe activity. There are more than 100 exotic animals at Monterey Zoo, 
and Charlie claims not to have favorites. Watching him with his elephants, it becomes very obvious that maybe, just maybe, he does. Some, some might say they're the flagship of our zoo. Uh, a lot of elephants, a lot of zoos have elephants, but I, I don't know. I, you know. Everybody finds their magic in a different animal. Some people adore elephants, but some people would get on a plane and travel here for nothing more than those sloths. It's, it's just wherever you find your magic. Ethan may only be a child, but he's about to do something many adults wouldn't ever consider. He's about to risk his life. Ethan is at his grandfather's rural property where cattle would not be out of place. But these are not your average cattle. Ethan's grandfather, Dwayne, raises about 40 Watusi cattle on his Utah ranch. Putting a 10-year-old within reach of an animal of this size and temperament is a risk. But for Dwayne and Ethan, it is a calculated risk. Also known as the cattle of kings, an average Watusi weighs around 1,000 pounds, and their horns are the largest and most dramatic of any breed of cattle. That's exactly what makes them one of the most dangerous. Even Dwayne is wary. I can get a little bit closer, but this cow's getting ready to have a calf, and I know her. I get halfway over there, she's gonna chase me out. That cow there will just take her baby and run. This new baby here, her mother would probably let us go up to her, but they are threatening because they're showing you. When they have a baby, you respect that, okay? Uh, you do not play with the babies. We play with one here because we know this cow. I mean, she was bottle raised. These cows here, you know that they're not gonna let you play with their baby. These cattle through the years, because of a lot of times, the predators that are in Africa, the hyenas, okay? The mothers have become very, very protective. This little cow behind us, she's showing you, she does not want you to play with her baby. And so as protective as the mothers are, the bulls are really docile. They don't care. You can take that baby, but with the mama, you're not gonna play with it. So why does Dwayne let his grandson climb into a pen with one of these potentially lethal beasts? It seems a common theme among owners of dangerous animals. Familiarity breeds trust. This little cow's name is Tina, and she was bottle raised, okay? And that's why she's so gentle. Uh, my grandson Ethan here, he raised her on a bottle. This is his cow. And she just uh, had a little baby calf just three days ago. Do you want to catch the calf, Ethan? Now, you can see the little horns are already starting right here. You can see some real good growth on them as a year old. They'll be uh, a year old. They should be out, you know, anywhere from uh, eight to 10 inches long and have a base on them probably like that. The breed does well in the Utah climate and it is prized for its good looks its robust and drought-hardy nature, and for those, massive horns. Uh, we started raising these in 1982. We've uh, learned a lot about the Watusi, and uh, you know, actually, uh, uh, a few years ago, we, we sent semen back to South Africa, where these animals originally come from, uh, to get new bloodlines in, into the, a herd over there. We've understood that in Africa, uh, they're after you know, it, it's a thing of economics. Great big horns, great big long horns is harder for the animal to travel, to feed. And so they're in Africa, they're breeding the horns smaller. Yet in America, because we have an abundance of feed, we want our horns bigger. 
<laughs> and Dwayne certainly succeeded in breeding cattle with bigger horns. The world's largest, in fact. Dwayne's bull, Woody, earned him a place in the Guinness Book of Records for the largest horn circumference ever recorded. Woody's left horn far outsized its right-hand counterpart, growing to a massive circumference of 40 and a half inches. Although it didn't cause him any pain, it weighed so much that Woody would often rest it on the ground. Dwayne has also managed his herd to maintain the breed's distinctive markings. If you'll notice the markings on this cow, she'll have this, uh, she'll have the straight red over the back and the white down the sides. This guy will hold steel. There are pictures of uh, Watusi cattle on Egyptian walls. They date back 7,000 years, and they have this same design on them. And y you won't find any other cattle that's got this design on them unless they've got some Watusi bloodlines in them. In Africa, you'll see a lot of the dark red colors in the tribes. The kings, they, they liked uh, the white Watusi. And a white Watusi is very valuable to them. The herds were seen as a status symbol and played a significant role in tribal life. In Africa, the more Watusis you own, it's kind of a, one of those things, I have more than you, or you know, I have a whole bunch of Watusis, and it's kind of like money in the bank in, in Africa. The size of the horns are intimidating. I think in Africa, if a hyena come up or a lion came to a Watusi cow, you know, they're gonna look at that. They're gonna look at their defense first, you know, and I'm sure, I'm sure depending on what would happen over there, uh, you know, but through the years, the Watusis have developed that real protective instinct to their young. The Watusis' giant horns also help to keep it cool. Hundreds of tiny blood vessels cover the horns close to the surface, allowing heat to escape the body. Uh, where these cows originate from, they take the heat very well. And uh, in the summertime, they'll slick right off, and they've got kind of an oily skin to them, which again, through the years, they've developed uh, kind of a natural pesticide. You can actually rub them and brush them and smell the oil on your hands. They are a hardy cattle. Uh, in the wintertime here, because we have so much cold, we make sure that they have all the feed they want to eat and we provide shelter for them. They don't have a lot of hair on their ears and they don't have a lot of a long hair like a, a normal cattle would. But you put fat on them, put some meat on them, and they do better. The majority of incidents involving cattle occur on ranches and other sites where people are working with livestock. Hundreds of people are injured and 22 killed each year in the U.S. alone. Knowing the risks of accidents and that the cows can be easily provoked, Dwayne is always mindful of the danger. There is an element of danger. It's the same as any other animal. You take a, a beef cow, they're gonna protect their baby, okay? Some of them are not gonna be as aggressive as others, okay? The same as a dog that just had brand new puppies. Some of them are gonna let you play with them puppies and some of them are not. Again, maybe the breed of a puppy or the breed of a different cattle is gonna determine how protective they're gonna be with their babies. The Watusis, normally you gotta remember that they're protective. You know, you notice how long the horns are and how big they are. And yet you'll, you'll notice these cows don't use them as like a spear. I've seen so many little tiny sharp horns do so much damage to people, and yet these bigger horns like this, they'll actually, when they want another cow out of the road or if they want you out of the road, they'll swing it and use it more like a bat. While Ethan has never been hurt by his cows, Dwayne himself has learned some important lessons the hard way. I had my uh, knee replaced 
and I got too close to a brand new baby and the mother beat me to the fence <laughs> and she hit me and all she did was just, she just hit me and turned around and went back to her baby and that you know that that's when I learned I can't I can't move that fast stay away <laughs> like any large creature no matter how familiar you are with the animal its unpredictability is an ever-present danger the thing you always want to remember is know your animals they're having babies and they're protective We have a couple of new babies over here. The one, the mother took it and left. The other one is a new mother, and she's kind of, she doesn't really mind if you're, you're around her baby, but you, again, you have to know the animals. It's obvious Dwayne takes great pride in his unusual herd, and he treats his Watusi with just the amount of respect horns like theirs deserve. One thing to remember, if I run, you run. Yes. <laughs> Please run slower than I do. <laughs> it may come as a surprise to some that the hills on the edge of the Cleveland National Forest, just outside of Alpine, California, are home to lions, tigers, and bears. Bobby Brink is the founder of Lions, Tigers, and Bears, a no-kill, no-breed, no-sell, exotic animal sanctuary. The white tiger cub is one of the recent rescues. Well, I thought I was going to be in the hospitality business. I, that's what I went to school for. It's funny, God sends you a different direction when you think you know what you're doing. Bobby began working with exotic animals in 1992 when she took a job with a breeder and exhibitor she quickly realized that it was not the dream job she had expected. I met a guy with bears, and he taught me how to take care of bears. And then he would disappear all the time. And if I wouldn't go feed the bears, they wouldn't have food or water. And he'd be gone like weeks at a time. So I followed him one day. I followed him up from South Texas to the Texas-Arkansas border. And what he was doing is he would set up a ring and they were wrestling bears, so you could pay $1,000 for the man to wrestle the bears, and then all the other men would bet who was going to win, I guess who was going to win, the bear or the man. And then I just, you know, started seeing more and more and more. Because it's just amazing some, some of the places we go and, and the way people treat animals, and, you know, they'll have no fur from urine, and they're laying in their own urine, and they're drinking their own urine, and they don't see anything wrong. Like, they don't see that they're doing anything wrong. That amazes me. Lions, Tigers, and Bears was founded in 2002 when Bobby rescued two endangered Bengal tigers. Only Bobby's direct intervention and negotiation with the owner saved them. They were backyard pets. They were housed in a six by 12. Uh, no shade, no shelter. You and I couldn't live like that for five or six years. And the guy was threatening to shoot the animals if the fish and, U.S. Fish and Wildlife didn't leave him alone because he considered them his property. But they worked it out and he decided that we could take the tigers and U.S. Fish and Wildlife gave us 30 days. And that's when we built that first small enclosure, you know, because we only had 30 days to get the permits, cross the state lines, build something to house the tigers and get them, and get them here. And that, that was the start. We like to say here they go from rags to riches because the animals we take here are usually the, the ones that nobody else will take. There's no place for them to go because we work all over the country with the first responders. I've probably moved 400 animals, all lions, tigers, bears, cougars in, in the last five years to different sanctuaries across the country. So we work with a lot of sanctuaries, work with a lot of first responders, a lot of state authorities, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Fish and Game. Oh, even private owners, you know, and we don't judge. If you have got an animal and you're in over your head and, you know, you're ready to find that animal home, and, you know, 90% of the time, that's what we see happens with private ownership. Seeing tigers for sale in a Walmart parking lot and at cattle auctions, and seeing big cat cubs used for photo opportunities, Bobby knew she was on the right path. You know, I went to one place on the East Coast, me and my, my friend, and the one 
photo facility had 22 cups. So you know they, they can only use them till they're, they're so big and then they've got to replace those cubs with more, more cubs. So where do all the, all the babies go? I believe some of them go to canned hunts, which is, you know, small area for people to shoot for a trophy, or they go as backyard pets, they're disposed of. Some of them are probably just killed and buried. There's no federal tracking of these animals. The lucky ones get to come to a legitimate sanctuary where they're not gonna be bred and at least get their dignity back and, and live out their life. The majority of animals Bobby now takes care of have been rescued from private owners and even from other sanctuaries. An appointment with the vet is one of their first experiences at their new home. Most of the animals that we go in and get, they've never had any medical care, never, no dental. Like the, the two leopards we have right now in the quarantine, we've spent six months of medical, you know, and then the female couldn't put any weight on her front feet because she had been declawed all the way around to, so they could use her for the photo ops. And so she was literally trying to walk on her back feet. So when we went in to do the surgery on her feet, we ended up finding a, you know, a lump on her, on her abdomen and it ended up being a mass on her uterus. And so, you know, it just seems like one thing after another medically for her. And we're still trying to get her up here with the other cats since she's been here a year. And that looks like it's cleared up. So that's usually the best sign. The white tiger cub also had severe health problems when first rescued. And after weeks in quarantine, her final vet check before going to a new enclosure is a great game. Now that she is, her lesions are growing, or coming back. We can do another fungal culture with the, that little DTM stuff. Have you seen it? It's like a special locker. Bobby's 93-acre sanctuary is now home to a variety of rescued animals. And for many of them, the sanctuary was the first time they had ever seen the sky or felt sunshine. This is the first time the white tiger cub has ever been on grass. But rescuing exotic animals is dangerous work. Honestly, I think the first few weeks when I worked around these animals, I didn't think they were as dangerous as they are. I think the fear comes in after you experience, you know, a few things. And I think for myself, the danger is when we go into dangerous places and get animals out. Because a lot of times the cages are so dangerous, we can't dart because if they jump, they'll go through go through the cage. Or people have them housed in their dining room or their garage or their basement. They never really think about getting the animal out. Like there's no way to get a transfer cage down the basement stairs or in their little gates. Our cages don't fit through. You know, those are the more dangerous circumstances for my staff. Rather than send her staff into dangerous situations, Bobby often puts herself in the line of fire. And when I first started working with the animals, I worked free contact inside the cage. I've just chose not to get anybody hurt. And a lot of times when you're rescuing animals, we don't even know, you know, these animals past, how they were raised. It's just better safe than sorry because the way we've set up everything here is pretty safe. They work in twos, uh, they'll shift the animal, which means they'll put it in an empty cage, and then the second person goes back and checks all the locks, checks that it's empty, and then they'll go in and clean. And then the same thing, when they go to put them back in the cage, they'll check the locks and then put it back, and then the second person will go back and check the lock. But that doesn't mean that human error can't happen because if something happens, it would be human error. Somebody will make a mistake. That's why your buddy's so important, because that person has to have your back. These animals could kill you in a second. <laughs> in a second. For Bobby, the benefits far outweigh the risk. Sometimes an animal's rehabilitation requires a lot of patience. You know, like we had one bear we brought from Ohio and he was fine as long as you kept him locked up. Like when we brought him in the trailer, 
we all the way across the country we'd open the door and feed him and he was fine clean him out and no problems and then we brought him here we always put animal in the quarantine and do all their medical he was fine but when we put him out in the habitat and opened the door to let him out he was scared to death and he just run back and forth and pace so we would just open the door for 15 minutes and the next day for an hour and then you know a couple weeks later for half a day and until the door was just left open and then finally he would touch the dirt because he'd never touched dirt before and then finally he would go out in and out you know make sure his little safety place was still there now he uses the whole habitat bobby's priority is always the welfare of the animal but how is her sanctuary any different to a zoo I think one of the biggest questions we get here is why don't you give the animals to the zoo? And I think we do something totally different than a zoo or two totally different organizations, but a lot of people don't realize these animals originated as surplus animals from the zoos, from the breeding programs, and that's how they got out into the private sector. Bobby has strong views on the breeding and keeping of captive animals, views that have been established through many years of experience and firsthand knowledge. There's approximately 220 AZA zoos in our country, and that's who holds the SSP plan, the Species Survival Plan, in our country. So supposedly this is the legitimate breeding that's going on in our country. You know, that's 220 zoos breeding. It's a lot. And you know, these are not animals that can go back in the wild. So there's really not much conservation value. The breeding is for the animals to stay in captivity. You can't put a lion or a tiger or a bear back out. They're going to walk right up to you for food. And I don't think a lot of people realize that these animals are not being put back out in the wild. There is no proven plan to put them back that, that's working. And a lot of them, they don't know how to be a tiger. I've brought bears in here that are scared to death of space. You know, it took us six months to get the white tiger to walk out in the open space because she had never been out of a 10 by 10 and she was used for nothing other than breeding. So when she came here and there's the green grass and the pool, and the, she was afraid of the waterfall. So it just, a lot of TLC, a lot of time, and you know, now she'll use the, the whole habitat, but it took a long time. You know, one of the most important things we can give our animals is dirt. You know, it's like the difference of standing on a tile floor all day versus standing on carpet all day. There's a huge difference, and it makes a huge difference in arthritis and, and how their joints feel, and especially when it's cold. Seeing distressed and mistreated animals takes an emotional toll. And Bobby also struggles with the idea that even the sanctuary she offers isn't ideal. It's just a glamorized prison. That's what it is. You and I wouldn't want to live in there. I mean, it's beautiful. But you wouldn't want to stay in there for life. You know, when I first started working around the animals, I really didn't see anything wrong with the way they were housed and, you know, people having them as pets. And I think it just grows on you. Like myself, I've been, you know, working around these animals almost every single day since 1990. And it's really obvious they don't belong in a cage. So part of Bobby's goal is to ensure that the animals live as closely as possible to how they would in the wild. They don't make good pets. It's, I think it's selfish, you know, and that's one thing that I've questioned myself about, you know, am I being selfish by, you know, wanting to have the animals? And I had to like get in check and make sure that there's a reason for every animal to be here. You know, just like the little bobcat that we took in Diego, if he could have went back out in the wild, that would have been the best thing for him. But unfortunately he can't go back out in the wild. So he needs a place to, to live out his life. Rescued grizzly bear Albert suffered from malnutrition that caused permanent neurological problems. And not all of the rescues turn out well. They've destroyed part of his life. You know, the MRI shows he has no pain, but he still has to really think and rock back and forth to get up. And then he has to really think, you know, his brain has to think where he's putting his, his paws to, to walk. I've, of all the animals I have moved, I had to euthanize one lion. And it, that was very heartbreaking because it was just a big, beautiful lion. And he was literally dragging his back legs, you know, to the, to the point where he was open wounds, you know, from drag. He could not move his back legs at all. 
that, that was hard. And it was really hard because he was in with two females. So not only did we have to euthanize him, but then we had to move the females out of their home. That was hard. Bobby will continue to provide safe and enriching environments for abused and neglected animals already in captivity, leaving future generations to continue to ponder the question of finding a better solution. I always tell my students and my interns, they're the ones, the younger generation, they're gonna make the decision. Do we work on saving the wild tigers in the wild? Because we only have about 3,000 tigers left in the wild, and it would be really nice to keep the ones that we have in the wild protected? Or do we continue to breed these animals for nothing more than to live in a cage? It will go to that generation, and again, they'll, they'll make that decision, but these animals, they live 20 years. So, you know, I figure I can do this a good 20, 30 more years. And, you know, hopefully there'll be some more laws in place to protect the animals, and there won't be as many animals in need of sanctuary. I mean, that would be ideal. Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. My father was very much of a naturalist. I traveled extensively with him. My preference of a boat is to be in the middle of nowhere. I like the outdoors. I like animals. I like to live amongst them. Martine Collette grew up surrounded by wild and exotic animals. As a child, she spent time on safaris in catching camps that trapped animals for zoos around the world. As an adult, she decided that helping animals would be her life's calling. In the 1960s, Martine was a successful Hollywood costume designer. By 1976, she had 50 animals and had purchased 160 acres in the Angeles National Forest, creating the Wildlife Way Station. I was probably the first sanctuary of this type uh, created in the United States. However, my start was in Hollywood, it was fashionable to have exotic animals as pets. And my husband was in the motion picture industry. And so I got to meet a lot of the people who had exotic animals. And pretty soon, generally sooner more than later, they had issues with having those animals. And they would call the zoo and they would say to the zoo, I would like to donate my ocelot, my monkey, my leopard, my whatever. And the zoo will say, well, no, thank you very much. We have all the ocelot, leopards, monkeys that we could use, and um, thank you very much. So what do you do then? And then the Hollywood phone lines began to ring, and then somebody will say, well, didn't so-and-so marry some gal that came from Africa? And that made me an expert in every field right off the bat. And I took my first animals in the early 60s. 
and um, they have not stopped coming into the 2018s. Since it opened, the Wildlife Way Station has rescued, rehabilitated, and given permanent sanctuary to over 76,000 wild and exotic animals. Yet Martine still recalls the sanctuary's first acquisition. Yes, it was a mountain lion. It was on exhibit at a show in this very small cage. I felt sorry for it, and I said I would buy it from you. And it wasn't until some months later that I realized that by purchasing, I was contributing to the very issue that I didn't want to see happen. And of course, we learn. Four decades later, Martine has won many awards and accolades, and Wildlife Way Station is home to more than 400 wild and exotic animals. Still, Martine considers improving the lives of the animals to be her greatest achievement. Being able to make a difference for however length of time to the quality of life for the animals. Animal care is always the most important thing. Animals require everything we require, food and shelter and an opportunity to raise young and an opportunity to be able to move and an opportunity to be able to live a life for which they were designed to live a life. And being somebody's pet in a household is not necessarily giving them that. I'm not going to say a blanket statement that all pet owners are bad people. They're not. But when you look at the amount of unwanted animals that are exotic animals, you sort of have to say and ask yourself, maybe you should take a piece of the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. And I'll give you some examples. You buy a baby monkey, and it's the cutest thing in the world. I tell people, don't buy a baby monkey. Have a baby. They'll leave home sooner. You'll have less responsibility. Because while it's a baby, it's amazing. And it's all yours and it requires you. When it grows up, it becomes a mature animal. Instincts kick in. Reproduction desires kick in. A man who owns a female macaque is fine until he brings in a girlfriend. And the girlfriend now has to compete with this macaque. The macaque doesn't understand that there is a problem. So sooner or later, it bites the girlfriend, then it has to be quarantined or it'll be taken away by the authorities, and the man that has a choice, you choose a girlfriend or you choose the monkey. I recommend they choose the monkey. I am not against the people, I'm pro-monkey. I want the monkeys to have a chance to be who they are and live a life that they're supposed to live. Martine aims to provide the animals with a habitat and lifestyle that is as close as possible to life in the wild. But where many sanctuaries are non-contact, Martine doesn't discourage human interaction. I believe captive animals should have human friends because they're never going to go out in the wild. And this is a controversial subject. Some people don't believe it. Some people do. I happen to believe it. Um, I like the animals trusting us. When I want to look in somebody's ears, I want to be able to have them come over. I want to look at their ears. I want them to open their mouth for me. I want to see the rear end. I want to be able to give them a hand injection if I need to. I want them to be comfortable enough so that we don't have to tranquilize them as many times to do some basic performances that need to be done. Those basic performances are usually carried out by the way station's resident vet, Rebecca. I feel incredibly privileged that I get to go to work every day and you know, see the tigers. If I have a bad day, I can go and visit with the lions. Um, to me, it's a privilege to get to, to work on them. Um, but it's also constantly stimulating, intellectually, Working at the way station is physically stimulating. It's a lot of climbing and hanging off of things and working outside in this environment. So it's fun and different every day. 
I have two favorites right now. Bolero, who's our big male lion. He's wonderful. <laughs> Although he marked me in the face not that long ago. I walked over there with my coffee cup because I go say hi to him in the morning and he was snuggling at the fence with me mooing and then he just turned around and got me in the face and the coffee and I was offended and he turned around. Um, Bolero, and then we have an elderly hyena named Gulliver who is in, uh, has chronic heart disease and um, in the wild, hyenas usually only live about 10, maybe 15 years, but in captivity, we keep them well into their 20s, sometimes into their 30s. And um, we almost lost him a couple years ago, and we hand fed him several times a day for months thereafter when he was not eating and um, facing death. And so I just got to where coming out and sitting there and scratching him, he's a pretty special. This place has a unique history. And I like the idea from a veterinary perspective, my mandate's very clear. We're not breeding, we're not exhibiting, we're not selling. I need to keep them healthy and give them a good quality of life while they're here. And that means I have carte blanche to do what they need. And as a vet, that's what you want. Much of Rebecca's work needs to be carried out with the animals under a general anesthetic. After all, the Wildlife Way Station's residents are dangerous wild animals, and incidents at sanctuaries are common. In 2013, an employee at Joe Exotic's Greater Winniewood Wildlife Park lost a hand in an incident with a tiger. In the same year, an intern was killed by a lion at a sanctuary in California. And in 2016, an employee was attacked by a crocodile in an Australian wildlife sanctuary. As you'd expect, Martine has strong feelings about exotic pets. A lot of people like to keep reptiles. And by and large, reptiles can make excellent pets. They can. There are things like ferrets, and they're very playful, and they enjoy, and they have a wonderful time. So yes, there are smaller animals that make great pets. But it can scare the neighbors. It shouldn't be able to eat the people. It shouldn't require such care that you are being cruel to this animal. The animal has to get something from it for their own life. It's got to be good for both parties. And yes, I know there are wonderful pet owners in the world. There are. But when you look at a whole, when you look at the entire animal welfare. Again, I go back to my Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. And if you cannot guarantee that every animal is going to be well and happy, and, then you probably shouldn't do it. Although Martine is against keeping wild animals in captivity, she's realistic about the possible benefits of captive animals. This is a very difficult argument and it's been, there's lots of pros and cons, and it depends who you talk to. I find that most people, unless they have seen something, smelled something, touched something, felt something, basically it's not in their world, and it doesn't mean a lot to them. I think children need to see the wonder and the magnificence of animals. They need to be able to connect to animals some way. And I know a lot of people will say, yes, but there is films and there is pictures and there is books. It's not the same. There are pictures of apples and there are pictures of trees, but it's not the same as an apple and a tree. So I don't know what the future is going to bring, but for the sake of the animals, I think for people to care about something, for them to protect the animals, they need to care about the animals. And to care about the animals, they need to be able to relate to these animals. They need to be able to identify with them. They must have some connection. Otherwise, why would they care? So I think it's important that we always maintain a connection with wildlife as well as domestic life. Whether that be wild animal parks, or whether that will be zoos, or whether that will be some other arena they will yet to be developed, but I think people need that. 
And after 40 years in animal rescue, Martine also applies her pragmatic attitude to the future of facilities like hers. Ideally, all of us should be striving towards putting ourselves out of business, ideally. But then there is the real. And I'm not sure it's going to happen in my lifetime. Perhaps it will, but I doubt it. I would never want to see a world without animals. I would never want to see a world where children do not live amongst animals. To me, it is absolutely critically important that people learn where we come from, who we are. We are a species like any other species. We're just smarter. But our roots are in the same place with everybody else. The moment I met Allie, I mean, the moment I met Allie and the moment we started rolling around and hugging and playing and this and that, I knew that I don't want to be an orthopedic surgeon. I want to be whatever this is. I want to do this. Bob Ingersoll never realized his ambition of becoming an orthopedic surgeon. And Allie would turn out to be the chimp that changed his life. Allie was the older brother of a chimpanzee named Nim Chimsky. In 1973, two-week-old Nim was given to a family to be raised as a human. The story of the controversial experiment was told in the 2011 documentary, Project Nim. It was the most joyous experience of my entire life to be with chimps. And I, I knew that that unconditional kind of a, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, the, the relationship that the space between the chimp and you is a beautiful spot if if you do it if you understand it if you recognize it and I did pretty much immediately and uh, and it was it was something that I didn't want to give up and I'm here I am 40 years later I uh, became a primatologist and I have a master's degree in primatology from the University of Oklahoma under the psych department and an undergraduate degree in psychology the experiment involving Nim and several other chimps set out to explore the concept that only humans use language. The chimps were all taught American Sign Language. The chimps involved were more than just pets. They were raised as human members of the family, taking pet ownership to a different level entirely. I saw them as my friends immediately. I mean, I, I interact with Allie on the first day as if he were my gonna be my friend forever, just like a human friend, no different. And, I, and it surprised me, because I thought it would be like a dog or a cat, or you know, it wouldn't be like it was. And I can't explain that to you. Chimps engage you in a way that you're engaging me and that I'm engaging you. The NIM project drew a lot of criticism. Much of it centered around the way head researcher Herb Terrace saw Nim and his fellow primate participants. He lived a hard life, and he got bounced around a lot. And he was looked at by the people of powers that be as, as the subject of a scientific experiment, as Herb Terrace says in the film. He never saw him as anything other, and this is a quote directly from him, anything other than a, the subject of a scientific experiment. I thought that was fairly arrogant of him. Scientists' understanding of chimpanzees and of animals in general at that time was still emerging. Knowing what he does today, Bob would have done some things differently. We've come a long way in the last 30 or 40 years in terms of animal behavior. We know they think, they plan, they feel, they, they have emotions that are very similar to ours in their context, uh, but you don't know what's going on in the back of my head any more than, than we know what's going on in their head, and we can't think for them. Bob was involved in previous similar projects with chimpanzees at the University of Oklahoma. 
working with Washoe, who in 1966 became the first chimp to be taught to sign. I worked with Washoe and Allie and, and several other chimpanzees uh, over the course of the time I was at the University of Oklahoma. You know, I, I saw myself as a scientist and someone who was interested in finding out about chimpanzee behavior. Uh, it didn't occur to me that, that captive animals have baggage that, that really kind of transcends the, the, that ability to collect data that isn't tainted by captivity. Chimpanzees are unique in the animal kingdom. They're as intelligent as a five or six year old human and capable of abstract thinking and planning. This often leads humans to forget that they are still wild animals, including some of the humans involved in Project NIM. It was one of those baptism by fire. If you can do it, you are, you do it, and you're good at it. And if you can't, you're weeded out fairly quickly. I mean, lots of people worked out there briefly and got bitten or, or got scared or realized it wasn't for them or chimps are stinky and they, they smell like chimp poop and, and this and that. The average chimp is five times as strong as a human and many people have been severely injured in attacks by chimps. Although Bob and his human colleagues were somewhat naive to the dangers at the time, there was never a serious incident. No. No, Nim never, never once bit me. He occasionally came close, like rolling in rough and tumble play, you know, but I knew when to slow it down and when to go, hey, 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 Nim, Nim, hey, hey, buddy, you know, and then calm him down and, hey, you don't want to bite me, you know, and, and my method is not, because I'm obviously not a big guy, my method was you don't want to disappoint me. And that worked for me, you know, and so I, I was one step ahead of that. You know, I don't want him to react or do something that he would not want to have done, but sometimes they just don't have the cortical control that humans do. And so in the heat of play, there might be, a, you know, a, a situation where, where he goes a little bit further than he should. So I could read that, but, but he never intentionally ever tried to bite me or attack me or any of that. No, we were, we were buddies. And, uh, and, and that's not always the case with all chimps, but Nim was a special chimp to me, and I think I was a special person to him. When the research project came to an end, the chimps, including Nim, were sold to a pharmaceutical testing laboratory. I call this the chimp wall of fame. So these are all chip friends of mine. Uh, this is a, a painting by, or a drawing by a chimp named Moja, one of the smartest chimps I ever met in my life. These are Washoe paintings, I think. This was in uh, several museum shows, but this is uh, signed by Richard Leakey, who did this painting with Washoe. So, uh, so I've had an interesting and uh, somewhat rewarding uh, career with chimps. Uh, I, I don't know about the word rewarding, but more than at times trying and emotionally draining and, uh, and very difficult emotionally. But, and some people couldn't stay in it because it was, it was tough. It was tough to, to see this happen to your friends. Uh, but I, I don't know, I felt like I needed to do what I could. Being friends with chimpanzees, you might think Bob would be willing to take one on as a pet. Well, you know, there's literally millions of dogs and cats out there that need a home. You know, let's let's solve that problem before you go out and get a monkey. You know, we don't we don't need exotic animals necessarily. I just think that you can get almost as much from a dog or a cat as you could from any exotic animal, and you don't put baggage on that the dog or the cat. So uh, so I'm glad things are changing. I feel very, very strongly that, uh, that the emotional side of this is, is part of what leads into a situation like that. And, uh, and like uh, Charlotte Nash, for example, who was attacked by Travis the Chimp, uh, I think that, uh, 
that, you know, those folks are, are caught in a weird spot, you know, because they got their animals uh, not in a malicious way or not with any bad intention. They just didn't know and, and were misled by a breeder or someone who, who gave them the animal. And, and then they found out that, oh no, that monkey loves me, but not my grandkid, you know, and that puts people in danger. I mean, capuchin monkeys, as little as they are, they can put a big hole in you. And uh, I've actually been bitten by a capuchin monkey. And I can tell you this, it was a three-legged monkey, weighed about two and a half pounds. And it was one of the worst bites I've ever had. I actually had to consult my doctor. <laughs> when the NIM study ended and the subject sold to medical testing, Bob's life path was again decided by a chimpanzee. He began to get involved with animal activism in an attempt to save his chimp friends from what he saw as a tragic fate. Legislation passed in 2015 making it illegal to use chimps in invasive testing. And private owners, too, began looking for alternative homes for their chimpanzees. You know, nobody wants a three- or four-year-old chimp. Maybe, but a six-year-old chimp you definitely don't want. I mean, because big chimps can be dangerous. They're not as fun, you know, because most people are looking for a child replacement. You've heard it, I'm sure, a million times. It's my baby. That's a good baby. Her's a good baby. Her getting tired, isn't her? Those brothers are so crazy. Come on, sweetheart. Ugh. It's not your baby. That animal had a mother, a real mother, a real chimpanzee mother. And to suggest that, like in Project NIM, I mean, Stephanie Lafarge was like, he's my baby and all that sort of thing. I'm like, no, he wasn't. That was Carolyn's baby, Carolyn the chimp. And when we took that animal, you're stealing that mother's baby. How dare us, you know? And then say that we're cross-fostering or any of that kind of stuff, which is complete bullshit. Uh, and, uh, and I just don't agree with that. This is Sequoia Washoe's baby. He, uh, he's a special guy and didn't last more than a couple of months. But he's right there. Uh, and uh, he, he meant a lot to a lot of us. And unfortunately, uh, because of our arrogance, we thought that we knew better. Uh, he ended up being, you know, not, not making it. This is one of my chimp friends, and uh, they were drawing on the back of this, and then this chimp got it, chewed it all up, and they put it all back together for me. Bob and his colleagues eventually succeeded in getting Nim released from the testing lab and placed in a sanctuary. He lived alone in that sanctuary for almost a decade. That's Onan's footprint. You can see how big his foot was. Uh, that, that means a lot to me because I remember that day. I remember taking his foot, putting it on the paint, and then, come on, Onan, let's make some footprints. <laughs> you know, so uh, back when I, uh, I hadn't come to the spot where I am now. I mean, like, here's Moja holding a camera, very similar to yours. And she was a great photographer, actually. Uh, she knew how the camera worked and all that. Nim had a Polaroid, so uh, we would let him take, my idea was that we were gonna let Nim take pictures of his favorite places and then place them on a map or whatever and uh, on the floor of his in enclosure. And then we would also have a book and, and we would you know, figure out exactly because planning and that that sort of thing in the 70s was not you know not something that we knew or understood much about in terms of chimps so I thought well he wants to go to a certain place let's see if he can tell me where he wants to go in pictures and sign and all that cognitive mapping and that sort of thing but uh, but then the then the the ethical issues started to creep in and I started to realize that's really silly Nim eventually lived out his life with some of his chimp companions, and he died of heart failure at the age of 26. Bob maintained contact with him whenever he was able. I feel that I uh, am a lucky guy to have had this kind of experience in my life, and that uh, not very many people get to inter interact with chimps on that level. And uh, one day, maybe 200 years from now, uh, people will look back at this and see me uh, and, and 
and understand exactly why I did it because maybe all these problems will be solved and chimps will be, you know, in the wild and it, you know, still there if if the planet exists at all in 200 years and and they'll look back and go, wow, that guy was one of the last people to ever get to interact with chimps on that level. Not that I'm proud of that because if I could go back now, I would probably, if I were God, I would go back and stop importation of chimps at all into any country and all that sort of thing, but I'm not. In the 60s and 70s and 80s when there wasn't a moratorium on breeding and that sort of thing, now we are, we're pretty aware of, you know, because captivity is the enemy. I mean, for all exotic animals. I mean, you put them out of, you take them out of the context that they should be in and put them into a cage, uh, that changes that animal profoundly. She was crushed. Because it's like she just lost her husband all over again. I think that's how she felt. I never thought it was going to happen. I always thought she was always going to be here. I never had a problem with her. It's like an empty space in your heart, you know? In 2015, not long after her husband Jim passed away, Laura Matson lost another family member, taken from her suburban Los Angeles home in a dramatic raid by authorities. Jackson, an eight-foot alligator, had lived with the Matsons in their yard of their North Hollywood home for 38 years. Jackson and Laura's story is an incredible account of a very unconventional friendship. She was a gentle animal. I mean, she never attempted anything, but when you're raised with an animal, they, um, I think they know not to be aggressive or whatever, because she never was aggressive at all. So um, when she wanted something, she let me know. She just opened up the sliding glass door and walked on in. Listening to Laura, it's easy to forget that she's talking about an alligator, a 300-pound apex predator that could easily kill her. I would take her in my bedroom at night if I could. <laughs> you know, but that would, someone told me to get a man. <laughs> <laughs> Laura comes from a large family, and while she was struggling with losing her companion, Brother Ron offered unwavering support. He, too, had formed a strong bond with Jackson, the alligator. Oh, I loved her. Good animal. I was aware, so you got to stay aware. I mean, it's an alligator. And we were just used to it, you know, coming out, getting into the pen doing what we had to do as far as cleaning the pen and feeding the alligator was an everyday thing for us. But while Jackson wasn't Laura's first unusual pet, Ron has never kept any exotic animals. My sister. <laughs> she got every animal. All I had to do was walk across the street. <laughs> A little dog named Herbie. <laughs> and rats. <laughs> well, that's because my husband had a boa constrictor and I had to save the rat. <laughs> and then, of course, he populated. <laughs> I had a raccoon and a quail. <laughs> so I had a beaver. <laughs> but I had to give the beaver back. But, uh, and a groundhog, or one of those things underneath the ground in Thousand Oaks. Well, he was so cute, <laughs> you know, but, uh, no, they need special places. <laughs> so, now I'm thinking uh, no, <laughs> a beaver. <laughs> Everybody's trees are missing. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they'll be pointing at my house. <laughs> <laughs> It was Laura's husband, Jim, who first brought Jackson home in 1977. Over the next four decades, the potentially deadly reptile became part of the Matson family. He loved Jackson. 
he looked for Jackson, <laughs> just like he looked for his 50 Merc. <laughs> you know? So it took him a long time to find him. He first found a caiman, which is like an alligator, but he was mean. <laughs> so um, he ended up getting Jackson. This is where Jackson lived for 30, 38 years. <laughs> well, the first couple of years she lived in the house. Well, she was in the bathroom, in the, in the bathtub, and she loved the water. Uh, she would get out, and finally, when she was starting getting out more and more and more and going out to the bathroom door, that's when we decided to give her own little thing out here. So, and she loved it out here, I think. Most animal experts agree that reptiles barely recognize their owners, let alone form emotional attachments but Jackson seems to have been an exception. I think she really missed my husband after he passed because I would see her. She seemed, she almost like went into depression. She, I, mean, I didn't. I thought, Ronnie, something's wrong with her. You know, she's not coming out. Something's wrong. And so he'd go in there. No, she's she's okay. She growled, <laughs> but she did, she she did, was in there for a long period of time. She didn't come out. I don't know if they sensed something, but she changed a little bit because he wasn't there every day. After Jim passed away, Laura continued to care for Jackson, although she did try unsuccessfully to rehome their immense pet. To Laura, Jackson was a placid animal who never showed any signs of aggression, not even towards her own pet cats, one of whom still lives with her. They're not predators. I'm sure if they're out in the wild and they're hungry, of course they're predators when they're well fed, they're a beautiful animal. Laura may have thought Jackson to be a beautiful animal, but how did her neighbors feel about living so near to a dangerous predator? Everybody knew about her, so even the neighbors across the street, everybody knew about her. Everybody wanted pictures of her. Once they saw her, they were fine. No one ever went and turned me in or turned us in all those years. Jackson was not a secret. And for some reason, I didn't think she needed to be a secret. While most of Laura's neighbors felt safe enough having Jackson nearby, not everyone would be happy living next door to an alligator. Best known for her role as Mary Ann on the classic TV sitcom Gilligan's Island, Don Wells is one North Hollywood resident who wouldn't want a prehistoric predator in her neighborhood. I'd move. <laughs> I'd sell my house and move. I don't think I could talk them out of it. Remember the little ones that you used to get? Maybe you are from America, but you used to circus. You used to get little tiny alligators and you take them home. Really? In a circus, yes. Yes, little turtles and little alligators and people put them in their bathtubs. I don't know if they ever grew up. I don't know if they died because they weren't in their habitat, which is awful. But yes, you used to be able to take a little alligator home. Jackson the alligator had lived peacefully in the Matson suburban backyard for more than 30 years without incident and without being reported until a man passing the home saw Jackson and reported her presence to the authorities. Ron, recognizing the danger to his sister and her pet, confronted him. I didn't handle that part too well. You know, he did what he had to do because he thought he was saving the community. Uh, I don't know how he really ended up back here in the backyard, but he did. She got a broken heart. He must have got some type of satisfaction from it. But, uh... No, someone I didn't even ever knew. He didn't even live in the neighborhood. He went up my driveway and he saw Jackson, and he was right on the phone immediately. I can't believe anybody could keep an alligator. You couldn't train an alligator to be a pet. If he wants to eat you, he's going to eat you. Two days later, authorities visited Laura's house, trying to confirm Jackson's presence and to make arrangements for her removal. But their first visit to Laura's home saw them leave empty-handed. The second day, I started seeing him kind of trying to come over this wall over here. Then they came up, tried to come over this wall, but I stopped both of them. They had to have a warrant. 
can't just come on somebody's property without a warrant. How I noticed it wasn't good for us is because they had a car here, here, and on the corner. So I, like I told my sister, it's over. Okay, so I already knew this was the day, which ended up not being the day. They couldn't find Jackson when they came in here. So three months later, I said, I think we should do something quickly because they go, no, they're going to come back. <laughs> the report about Jackson claimed that Laura had been feeding her feral cats, and even some neighborhood cats had gone missing. When authorities canvassed the suburb, only 11 reports of missing pets were recorded over the previous 40 years. Never aggressive, never. She was well fed too, so there was no need for her to look for food. And plus she was picky. She only liked chicken hot dogs. I tried to give her fish. I tried to give her other stuff, no way. She just threw it out of her mouth. Local police and officers from Animal Control and U.S. Fish and Wildlife soon returned with a warrant required to search Laura's property to find and remove Jackson. I heard some commotion out here, and I just knew from the voices that it was something was going to happen. They weren't going to settle for anything. They were, Jackson was gone, no matter what. I knew it. I think my sister knew it, so... No. <clears throat> I'm not saying we were, we broke the law, uh, but we did get attached. So uh, they did their job, we did ours. Let's, let's put it that way. It was horrible, especially when they, they um, got a warrant. And they, they went through everything in my house. I'm thinking, there's no alligators in my kitchen drawer. I mean, they went through every drawer. I don't know what they were looking for because Jackson was outside. I wish I would have thought about putting her underneath the house. <laughs> you know, but I didn't think about that till later. So, but they probably wouldn't have left because this guy took a picture of her. That turned me in, so. Laura was right. This time, the authorities were not leaving without Jackson. Once I seen the warrant, I knew we had a problem. I knew my sister was in here sleeping. I knew I had to get her out because they weren't leaving. My job is to protect her. And just one thing led to another. And next thing we know, we got them all over the property. Right. The police officers, uh, animal control, uh, the zoo ended up coming. So I had no rights whatsoever. It, it, they wouldn't tell me anything about her. They wouldn't let me see her. Nothing. They came back. And they finally found Jackson, and well, we helped them put it in the truck, and off to the zoo it went, and then. We uh, set up a habitat for her. So she's doing real well now, real well, yeah. Jackson was rehomed at an alligator park in Colorado, and a GoFundMe campaign was launched to create a new habitat. We were the biggest uh, donors. <laughs> OK. <laughs> But she's, she's happy, and we will get it back out there to see her. Despite taking good care of Jackson since the 70s, by not having the relevant permit, Laura was breaking California law. But as any animal lover knows, losing a pet is hard, let alone a pet that has been your constant companion for nearly 40 years. Now that they ran their law down, how it really works, OK, I understand now. But at that point, you don't think about stuff like that. Even if they would have told me afterwards, I wouldn't have cared about that law. I just kept doing what I was doing. Because 
You get attached, and once you get attached, it's it. I think she probably misses me. She, I'm sure she misses the chicken legs yeah, and the hot dogs. When I go to bed at night, I think of her because that's when she would make the thumping noises. And I miss that, so. But um, I'm glad where she's at. She's in a beautiful place, so. Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. His mum actually has put me in hospital for 24 hours where she bit me when I was feeding her and damaged uh, a tendon. And if I, if I release any pressure off him, he will know that, he'll feel it, and he will then react to that. Extremely strong, extremely strong. You can stress him out um, too much, yeah. But when he's that little, he's okay they're not going to attack you just because you're there, but if you land on and get too close, it's like anything, you're in their space, they're gonna let you know. But look at that, it's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. okay, yeah, okay, okay. I might put him back so he doesn't stress out too much. Australia has a reputation as having some of the most dangerous animals in the world. Gain Doyle has been bitten by almost all of them. I'm not pulling out the other all of that because then we'd have a lot more blood shots. <laughs> At over 12 feet long, the olive python is Australia's second largest snake. And although it's not venomous, it regularly preys on rock wallabies and even small crocodiles, ambushing them from under the water. These um, have got, of course, large teeth. There's, a, there's over 100 teeth in the mouth of one, on one of these. Um, very, very strong, extremely strong snake that can make you feel uncomfortable. This one here has wrapped around my neck once and um, made me feel quite uncomfortable. Now, one of the things that we do here is so that the snake knows it's gonna be picked up and not being fed is we use our hat. That's why we always wear hats. He now knows, because they are intelligent, he now knows he's not getting fed. The danger is not from the snake's razor sharp teeth. It's the sheer strength. If that wraps around your neck, it can cause you to black out without any problems. I can feel the, um, the strength around my throat at the moment. Uh, he wants to go back to his warmth. A extremely strong snake. 
This particular snake, I had him out at the other end of the shed, just doing a display, and he reached up using me as a perch, and I could feel myself blacking out, because he put so much pressure on my neck, it was slowing the blood circulation off to me, to my brain, and I started to feel a bit, a bit woozy. Here you go. I'm trying to shut the door back in. Cool. Gain and his father run the family business, the WA Reptile Park in Perth, Western Australia. He's grown up living alongside Australia's apex predators, venomous snakes, crocodiles, and dingoes. Not all the animals here are deadly, but the majority can do some serious damage. There are some you could keep as pets at your own risk. There are some pythons that have a few attitude problems and want to bite or wrap around. You just got to be aware of all that. But, you know, as a pet, they're pretty easy to keep. Yeah, um, I mean, Lacey there, he's really easy to keep and he's quite friendly, but there's always that chance that something can go, something can go wrong. I like him. Yeah. yeah. What have we got here, Dan? This is a lace monarch from the Eastern States. A lot of people in the Eastern States have these as pets. And um, this one here has bitten me. Got very sharp teeth, but that was only because I was feeding it. it missed the, um, it missed the, the rats that I was feeding it that day and grabbed all five fingers on one hand. Your claws and the teeth are extremely sharp. Um, when this fella bit me, and again, it was only by accident, uh, he did do a bit of slice and dice in my fingers, but there was no, he didn't cause me any problems to go to hospital or anything like that. Yeah, I may have needed stitches, but I stayed home. I don't like going to hospital too often. <laughs> oh, this one's pretty cool. When you actually feed this fella, we um, give him a scratch on the back. He arcs up the back like he, like he enjoys it. Emotion, no. Personality, yes. This fella has his own little personality. And uh, yeah, look at that. He's beautiful, isn't he? Closely related to the Komodo dragon, Lacey may be a friendly monitor, but the tools he uses to prey on small mammals and birds in the wild leave their mark on his handlers too. He's just using it and he's just hanging on so the points go through. I mean, our skin's soft compared to them. So that's, yeah, you get that all the time. I, I never worry about any little scratches or anything like that. It's part of the job, you know, getting bitten or scratched or whatever, you know, it happens. It's not the nicest of feelings, um, you know, being bitten. Yeah, but yeah, with this type of job, it can happen if you make, you, know, you don't pay attention to what you're doing. A small scratch or even a large bite from a monitor lizard or a crocodile may not bother Gain too much, but surely a tag from one of the world's deadliest snakes would slow him down. Australia have 17 to the top 20, and this is one of them. And this is one of our, our local uh, snakes for Western Australia, which is a dugong, which is a brown, but it's our, our local one around the Perth area. This one here got me in 2016. Uh, he wasn't in this cage, he was in another cage, and I was cleaning him out. And I had the words go through my head, turn on the light. And I didn't turn the light on, I hooked him, and he grabbed me. So I don't know which end I was trying to lift, and he actually bit two fingers and, and envenomated me. It was about 25 minutes before I felt any effects and then spent 30 odd hours in hospital getting one lot of antivenine and um, my kidney stopped working. So I, I guess now that we've got a special relationship, me and him, he's had a piece of me and I've had a piece of him. <laughs> it's just, yeah, just uh, extremely nice, nice snake. Not only does Gain still consider the snake that could have killed him to be an extremely nice snake, he takes full responsibility for the incident. He knows only too well how serious the consequences can be if you make a mistake with a deadly predator. If you get too, you know, a bit blasé or anything like that, and you take your brain off out of, out of gear, you can pay them and make a mistake. And um, every now and then you do that. And, some can be fatal or you can end up being crook. I mean, I've made two mistakes with two venomous snakes in 40 odd years. And um, yeah, it's knocked us around and all the rest of it, but my fault.
not not the um, not the snake's fault because I was choosing to do something that I shouldn't have done. While it's certainly unconventional, it Gain forms rewarding bonds with animals that many would never consider having as pets. Well, I used to have my first tiger snake. You know, when when he passed away, I was I was quite upset because I used to go to um, do displays and talk to these kids and say, instead of on theory, I now had practical experience of what a snake bite felt like. This was the one that did it. And um, yeah, when he passed away, I was quite upset because we had that special relationship, that bond of, um, that was my first bite. Again, it was my fault, but you know, it was still okay. I've now, one of the people had been bitten by a venomous snake and survived. <laughs> This one's bitten you as well. This one has bitten me as well. But he's still a nice snake. He's still a nice snake, yeah. And in a very Captain Hook moment, we meet the mother of the crocodile we saw earlier. The one that sent Gain to the hospital and could have easily taken his hand. She bit me when I was doing a feeding display. Um, in here with 45 kids. And it was the first chicken of the day and I'd normally feed her in. 12 o'clock, but I decided to do it later. And when I put my hand out, over with the, with the tongs, we use tongs for these little fellas, had a chicken on the end of the tong, it saw the hand and just grabbed hold of the hand. I went through all the scenarios of what should I do to get it off? And I thought if I pulled my arm up and put it on the balcony that see if she would release, but then I realized with those teeth that they, they slice, she would have done more damage. So I just hung there and just waited. Our eyes met, so we had a moment for a little bit. And then eventually um, she let go and slipped straight back in the water. I swapped hands and continued on feeding them. It severed 80% of one of my tendons and went through the knuckle. So it wasn't too bad. If it had rolled or twisted, it could, you know, could have severed the tendons or severed a few more. But I was all okay. I didn't lose any fingers or any movement. Yeah, just out of action. But does this croc remember his human prey like the crocodile nemesis remembered Captain Hook and Peter Pan? I think she does. I mean, she's had a taste of me, this one. She knows what I taste like, so yeah, she likes me. Young girl. This is my girl. Gain's experience working with crocs means, despite their previous encounter, he's not concerned about getting too close this time. She stays there, um, but I'm not moving any further to her. Um, she's already let me know that she doesn't want me any closer by a bit of a, a breathing and huffing at me. I feel quite safe here. She's not going to move any further um, from where she is. And again, it's, it's the colder weather. And if she was warm, she'd be straight into the pond if I was getting too close. They're not going to try and attack. I've been closer to one and actually fed one closer. Um, and it did get me when it jumped up to, um, when, when feeding. It jumped up, missed it, and just caught me on the uh, uh, hand. And I was right next to it feeding it. That, yep, that's the, the boy and the girl. They're the dingoes. Go and see them. Australia's wild dogs, dingoes, are sometimes kept as pets most owners will tell you that they can never be completely domesticated. This is Blondie, and she's a good girl. When we first got Blondie, she broke out of her, her, her pen. She found a very small hole, about six foot off the ground, and climbed out. But she's so blonde, she showed me where the hole was so I could fix it. Didn't you, girl? Hey? Hey? How about we go and see Max? Later, later, coming, Max. Come on. Hey. He was brought to us um, to the park because the people, their situation changed. We normally don't take them on if they're uh, over 18 months old because they, um, their personalities are really set. But Max was really good. He bonded to us very easily, so I decided to take him on. I don't 100% trust him, but yeah, I can pick when he's not right. 
Come. The only thing with dingoes, you can't train them. They don't come when you call, but they're highly intelligent. The dingoes are as close to pets as any of the animals here at the WA Reptile Park, but Gain remains alert when around them. They still have that killer instinct. They'll still knock off other animals. Yeah, people do have them as pets, but they just gotta be aware that they're totally different. If you really bring them up right, they, can, they are extremely nice pets, but you just gotta, you gotta treat them nicely because they don't ever forget. Having been strangled by a python and bitten by crocodiles, lizards, and deadly venomous snakes, there's still one animal here that Gain won't get close to. I never trust a wombat. Never turn your back on a wombat. They are dangerous. It's automatic. Get out, especially the males. Breeding season, they change, and they they will attack, and and they jump up, and it's pretty dangerous for a bloke because they can jump up about a metre high, and if you're facing a wombat and it jumps up a metre high and grabs what you don't want it to grab, it's gonna hurt. It has happened in the eastern states. The bloke had a lot of microsurgery, but yeah, um, no. Nah. I go and play with a croc any day. You know, some people don't want to live next to a 400-pound pot belly pig. Uh, so, in, in fairness, when you, when you do live in a kind of a built-up city, you know, choose the right pet. Riverside County Animal Services are an animal shelter organization and vet clinic servicing one of the largest counties in California. We cover everything from the city of Riverside, which is a large metropolitan area, all the way out to areas out in the Coachella Valley, which are just undeveloped open areas of natural desert. So we get a little bit of everything. Each year, they respond to thousands of calls from the public, picking up stray dogs, cats, and the occasional more unusual lost pet. Riverside County Animal Services uh, we are uh, a sheltering service uh, to all the stray animals that come in. And of course, we, we handle a lot of field service work, and that's our officers out in the field uh, retrieving mostly stray dogs and stray cats and the occasional stray crazy thing, you know, whether it be uh, the occasional monkey, alligator, a Burmese python, or somebody keeping a, a deer as a pet. We got a call one afternoon that a woman and her two dogs had cornered an alligator in her backyard. My dispatcher gets on the radio, dispatches it to me, and I kind of made a smart aleck remark of, sure, I'll go pick up the iguana, thinking that they just saw an iguana and thought it was an alligator. I rolled up to the house, got out of my truck, see two dogs barking at something in the corner, walk over, tell the woman to grab her dogs, and sure enough, there's an alligator in her backyard. It's interesting because we get a lot of different snakes that come from like where they come into people's yards, but we have interesting calls too, where someone will call for a snake like this. I had a snake just like this uh, Southern Pacific that a person called us that they found this snake in their yard and they were in the middle of the city of Riverside and they conveniently had it contained in a terrarium. <laughs> And so when I GPSed the address to try to re-release the snake, I was just thinking to myself, there's no way that this snake ended up in the middle of downtown Riverside, surrounded by blocks and blocks and blocks of residential housing. So they obviously went on a trip to the mountains, who knows what, took the snake out of the wild again and then probably the wife or something was like, hey, the heck no, you're not keeping that snake. And so they called, you know, animal control and said, oh, I found it in my yard, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, but stuff like that happens fairly frequently. You know, well, most of the time it's a legitimate call where you can see, you know, their house is butted up against, you know, natural landscape and, and it's like, yeah, if you're going to build your home on their habitat, they're going to come into your yard. But occasionally we get these strange calls. I have personally got one call uh, where someone had a rattlesnake that they had caught um, and taken it home, stuck it in a china cabinet, 
put duct tape across the door of the china cabinet and stuck a brick in front of it and had it in there for a week. And then they re quickly realized that they couldn't safely open the door to feed it and didn't know how to care for it. So they ended up calling for help and I ended up having to go in and uh, remove the rattlesnake out of, out of a uh, china cabinet. So that was a pretty poor, poorly thought out plan. And it's often poor planning and lack of knowledge that puts exotic pet owners and their neighbors in danger. The animal, when it ends up doing something really bad, the person always says, but he was always so calm and, and, and never showed any signs of aggression. But um, it just takes one time, right, for that person to suffer serious injuries, and in some cases, death. So. It really, the onus is really on that person that owns the exotic, legally, if they have it permitted, um, to protect their, their fellow neighbors. In 2009, a 330-pound pet tiger escaped from her enclosure and was discovered in the backyard of a very surprised 79-year-old woman in Ingram, Texas. A 275-pound pet cougar escaped from his cage in a Florida backyard menagerie and killed a neighbor's dog in 2012. And in 2017, a classroom of third graders were surprised to find a four-foot-long boa constrictor inside their classroom. Officers believe the snake may have been an escaped pet from a nearby house. Well, you know, when people are having um, a pet, that's a dangerous, you know, they know how to handle it, but the neighbor doesn't, or the little kid next door um, has no clue on, you know, uh, that you have a dangerous exotic pet. That's, um, that's where you, you as the pet owner need to make sure, just like, you know, in the dog world, if you have a large dog, uh, you wanna be responsible, make sure it doesn't get out. And same thing, if you have a dangerous exotic animal, and it doesn't mean it has to be a big animal. A monkey, for example, can bite people, which we ha had happen in, in one of our cities that uh, we had to respond to. Um, a, a monkey bit a, a, a person at a pizza place because the person thought it would be fun to have a monkey on their shoulder at a pizza place. And, and so you, you gotta draw the line sometimes with having a cool pet that's cool for you to have but making sure your your community members are, are protected and safe. And that would be our message to those folks is, make sure that exotic is not gonna harm anyone. One of the most common exotic animal escape artists is the snake. And the Riverside team are often called to retrieve venomous reptiles from suburban areas. So both of these guys are from the local area that were brought in by our animal control officers. And I keep them purely for the purpose of using them for training, for rattlesnake safety and handling. So this one is, is a Western diamondback rattlesnake. And how we came across this one was that um, there was a woman in Palm Desert who uh, who had to be put into a care facility. And when they went in to get her out of the house, um, she had this snake in an aquarium in her house. And it was a little 10 gallon aquarium. The snake was a really tiny little baby, probably just born that year. And so it was a little 10 gallon aquarium with a, um, a, an aqu a fish toy in it like the, you would see in a fish aquarium, like a sunken ship toy. So she was trying to keep it as a pet. And, and so because we don't know the exact location of where it came from, you can't just take it and relocate it and throw it back outside. So for us, the only uh, the only options are either, you know, you find a home for it with a research facility or um, maybe an educational institution. Otherwise, it has to be euthanized. Unless we know of the natural area where it came from and we could relocate it within its home range. While Kim provides Riverside officers with venomous snake handling training, there's no way they can train for every possible animal encounter. Uh, Burmese python is a common home pet, or at least in the state of California it is. Another county officer, she got a call in the middle of the night that a 30-foot snake was going through these person's front yard. 
Uh, she shows up on scene, calls me in the middle of the night, wakes me up, and says, hey Dylan, I need some assistance. I have a 30-foot snake. So I thought she was just joking with me at first, and sometimes we joke with each other and give each other prank calls and stuff like that. Uh, but I made it down there, and sure enough, there was a large snake under these people's, uh, I believe it was a eucalyptus bush that was going alongside the, uh, the fence line. All I did was grab it with a, a catch pole, got that around its head. The, the snake obviously coiled up around the pole, and then we just carried it to the truck like a, like a rotisserie rack. For one person on one side, one person on the other side, we put it in the truck like that, we'd let go of the loop, and it hung out in the truck for the way back. You know, a lot of the, the training for some of these exotics kind of happens like that moment in time. Uh, you don't really respond to a domesticated deer call every day. When it comes to like a Burmese python, it's, you know, the officers, they're really good with their control stick, their, or the catch pole, as it's known. Some of these are uh, just really kind of bizarre calls that they just have to use their instincts. Bear in mind, the officers are dealing with some of the most vicious dogs that you might see um, walking the street. Some of them are, are bully breed dogs. Some of them are very aggressive. And these officers don't scare easily. In fact, I think the Burmese python scared that one officer more so than, than a, a large pit bull coming at her. Uh, those are just such weird, odd calls and you don't really know how to handle the Burmese python and you don't want to get choked to death. So those, those types of calls are sort of like, you know, you learn as you go sometimes. Every call out comes with a risk and Riverside officers can just never be sure what they'll encounter when they arrive at a scene. At the time of it, it's a little hectic and scary just because you don't know if it's fully domesticated. A lot of people, they have these quote unquote wild animals for pets and never socialize them properly. So sometimes they will bite or do other things that aren't foreseen. Much of what Riverside County Animal Services does also involves educating the public about choosing the right pet and then providing that pet with the appropriate care. Those folks that like, for example, to have a Burmese python, sometimes they get them when they're young and then they're not really fully educating themselves on, on just how large those snakes can get. And it's not the easiest pet to care for once it's an adult pet. I mean, they get 20 to 30, you know, they get very long and very wide. And when you go out of town and you ask your buddy, to you know, feed your pet, uh, make sure the buddy knows how, how to close the, the tank of the Burmese python securely, because that's when you get into problems where you know, the next door neighbor finds out that you have a 20-foot Burmese python. Educating the general public on exotics is important because some people um, like to have interesting pets. And then when it comes to animals like a tegu lizard, uh, quite an amazing uh, critter, but um, they can get big too. And your neighbor may not want to see that tegu lizard knocking on their front door. So, you know, it's really making sure that your that exotic pet is going to stay in your property and not wander off because that can really scare the heck out of somebody if they are finding out that you own that tegu lizard and they didn't know that. Another one, I had a, a tegu running down Wood Road. Somebody called for a large lizard in the road, so I arrived on scene, and sure enough, there was, uh, the body was probably only about two feet long, but the tails were, tails about three feet long, and their tail is stronger than heck, so they can whip you and cut you open with that. It's kind of like keeping a, you know, some of the more uh, aggressive dog breeds. Uh, you know, it, if you've got a responsible owner that knows what they're doing, you can keep some of those safely. Um, and then there's some things that you just shouldn't have. You know, when we walk into a house and somebody's caught a rattlesnake from out in the desert and it's in an aquarium, it's a venomous snake. Nobody should be keeping those as pets. Um, boa constrictor, you know, there are responsible people out there that can keep them as a pet, but it's not a pet for everybody. Most people probably don't have the skills, the ability, the finances, just the space to keep something that can potentially get as large as those are gonna get. We're in the business of promoting um, responsible pet ownership, whether you own a dog, a cat, or a rabbit, or a horse, um, a tortoise. 
we always want people to love that animal uh, and make it part of your family. We don't really um, have any strong opinion one way or the other when it comes to exotic pets. We just don't like when somebody uh, no longer is interested in being the pet owner of said exotic pet and then they just re release it into the wild and uh, scaring their neighbors or also uh, shamefully allowing that animal to suffer because uh, it could get hit by a car just like a dog or a cat or it goes off into the wild and gets killed by other critters. But, but it's shameful when the pet loses its charm and then they, they think, oh, I'll just dump it in the riverbed or, um, you know, I'll just release it. If you have an exotic pet, know how long that pet will be in your life. A tortoise, for example, can live 70, 80, 90, 100 years. So you might want to put the tortoise in your will and know that your son is going to be caring for the next 50 years of that tortoise's life. That's the only thing we, we'd like to share with people that are interested in, in exotic pets is know it's a part of your family. And, and when it loses its charm, don't forget, you're still the pet parent. The officers at Riverside County Animal Services have dealt with everything from escaped emus to roaming reptiles. And when it comes to exotic animals, they've seen firsthand that too little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. I think that, at least here in California, for the most part, with stuff that could kill a human being, I think that those who have them that do it legally are able, you know, okay but they have to reach such a bar, it's such a high bar for them to get to those proper permits and stuff. It's a, you know, I'm kind of okay with those people. It's the backyard person who doesn't know what they're doing and doesn't have that training and hasn't gone through all the permitting process and the inspection process to try and keep a lion or a tiger or, you know, you know something else along those lines that it's, it's a recipe for disaster. You can go to any zoo, any private place in the United States or around the world, and as soon as there's a fence, you don't have to treat them like a tiger. They're not predators anymore. They're just beautiful, interesting, and here for our enjoyment. From the fashionable Victorian menagerie to the animal stunts we see in modern movies, exotic animals have long performed for our enjoyment and entertainment. But what happens to the animals when they can no longer perform? Many end up at sanctuaries like the Performing Animal Welfare Society, a 2,300-acre natural habitat wildlife sanctuary located near San Andreas, California. This unique facility is currently home to nine elephants, four lions, one black leopard, seven bears, 22 tigers, and co-founder and president Ed Stewart. This is Kim, and she's in there with Roy and Claire. She's 15 years old, came out of a roadside zoo in New Hampshire, and was scheduled to go to the pet industry. Somebody intercepted her and brought her to us when they were just cubs. Hi. Hi. Hi, <laughs> I know. You're a wonderful girl. Yeah, you're good. Paws provides homes for retired or mistreated animal entertainers and investigates reports of abuse performing in exotic animals. Unsurprisingly, Ed has strong feelings about exotic animal ownership of any kind. I know that there are some good facilities and some are good, some are bad, but the ultimate goal for all of these places is a little murky to me. Is it to return animals to the wild? Is it to teach people about animals? I think all of it is ineffective. In the history of the world, nobody's taken a captive tiger and put it into the wild. And with the shrinking habitat, it's never gonna happen. So reintroduction is a pipe dream. It's, it's not gonna happen. And while some may argue that captivity is a valid way of preserving a species or educating the public about conservation, others, like Ed, believe that captivity changes an animal to the extent that it is no longer anything like its ancestors. Our mission is to give the animals that we take the best life we can give them, knowing that we can't give them a normal life. We can't give her a natural life. 
She's 15 years old and she has never had to catch her dinner, never had to hunt for her food. We have provided everything. You put an animal in an enclosure, whether it's a big enclosure or a small enclosure, you have totally changed their life. She's an apex predator. She would hunt almost constantly looking for enough food. She would be raising babies. She would have an incredible responsibility in the wild and she would rely only on herself. Their natural history is so ingrained in them to perform their duties and you take all that away in captivity. As soon as you put a fence up, you create disrespect for that animal. It's something of a contradiction for Ed. On one hand, he's against keeping wild animals in captivity. On the other, he keeps captive animals. We're honestly looking at these animals every day. We really want to do the best we can for them. But the best thing you can do for them is not promote it in captivity, because they're just not designed to live captive. And it's, it's a black and white issue. So we don't look at her or him like a tiger. We look at him as an individual. They're so far removed from a real tiger in the wild. We know we have to do absolutely the best we can for them and give them the nicest place we can to, to live and, and the best vet care. But if, I, if we had a breeding pair, I would, I would be heart sick if I was the one responsible for creating a litter of baby tigers that would have to live their whole life in a cage. You know, it's just basic freedom for a tiger to be wild. PAW's Director of Veterinary Services, Dr. Jackie Guy, has the job of ensuring that all the animals are kept healthy. Many of the problems she sees are a direct result of captivity. Animals in captivity, especially wild animals in captivity, can develop all sorts of problems that are unique to captivity that aren't found in wild populations. So as a captive wildlife veterinarian, I would say probably 95% of the problems that I'm seeing in my patients are related to captivity in one way or another. An example of that is um, this is a tiger. These are um, radiographs or x-rays of a tiger's spine who is, he's an adult. He's not an old man by any means, but he's a mature adult. And he's got significant, significant arthritis um, that, you know, would not be seen in a wild tiger. This is an early onset of really, really severe arthritis. And the problems Dr. Jackie sees associated with captivity are not just physical health issues. Confinement is very hard on animals, regardless of the size of the cage. Um, being confined brings with it all sorts of um, challenges for especially formerly wild animals or wild animals. Wild animals are not domesticated. In other words, they're not used to being held captive. And so there are instincts that they have that are, um, they're not able to express and that leads to frustration. It leads to a lot of behavioral problems, a lot of anxiety and stress, um, which sometimes they'll end up pacing or tossing their heads or doing various repetitive behaviors. And we've all seen that. We've all seen a pacing bear in a cage or a tiger in a cage. That's abnormal. They don't do that in the wild. Also, a really sad thing is when an exotic animal begins to self-mutilate or damage itself, pull its hair out or pull its feathers out, um, and that's, that's an unfortunate consequence of stress, of being in captivity. Winston, one of the sanctuary's current bear residents, has only recently stopped displaying those telltale signs of captive boredom. Captivity, it's a challenge. When you look at California mountains, that's where they should live. The Smoky Mountains, Florida, they're all over uh, the United States. And when they're in captivity, a lot of times, they're one of the worst pacers, one of the worst at rocking their heads. They, they just don't have anything to do. As former pets or performers, the animals here are accustomed to being around humans and many involved in the exotic animal ownership debate believe that they should continue to enjoy human companionship.
Hey, girls. Come on, let's go. Come on, girls, let's go. Come on, Tika. What a good girl. What a good girl. Mara, let's go. Come on, young lady. Good <laughs> girl. Nice <laughs> Oh, boy. Oh, boy. See their teeth are they're made for eating. You can see it in there. They're made for eating branches and hard brush and eating a very low protein, high fiber diet. We don't ever teach them tricks just to teach them a trick, but in order to check their teeth, it's good to be able to handle them a little bit. We don't go inside with them, but we do it from the outside. Elephants are actually, can be really, really excellent patients. They're very intelligent, they enjoy interacting with us, and we use positive reinforcement training with our elephants, meaning they choose to participate in their own health care, and they're rewarded for that, they're never punished. And so, consequently, it's actually quite easy for me to provide veterinary care for such an intelligent species. They're very easy to work with. They voluntarily will allow me to draw blood, take x-rays, uh, work on their feet. Even more invasive things like collecting a small biopsy, things like that. They have learned um, that you know we're not here to punish or harm them in any way, so they're actually really good patients. But not all of Dr. Guy's patients are as cooperative as the elephants. It can definitely be dangerous being around dangerous exotic animals, dangerous wild animals in captivity or free ranging for anybody, including um, an owner of an animal, but certainly for the veterinarian. And so again, it, it takes somebody like myself who's had specialized training to know how to safely treat these animals, but there's always a potential for you know, somebody to get hurt. And although Ed feels that captive exotics are no longer the predators they would be in the wild, even he has no doubt they remain potentially deadly. Predators know that they're predators. They don't know why, maybe, that they're focused on vulnerable things, but they do. Somebody with crutches, somebody in a wheelchair, somebody who's lagging behind, they know even though they don't have to it's just part of their nature to stalk and maybe hunt. And while many owners of exotic pets do provide for all their needs, caring for such unusual animals proves too difficult for many, and they often arrive at sanctuaries with a host of health issues. We have right now the second oldest African elephant in the country uh, living here. It's almost like a retirement home in some ways, especially for elephants. You know they're getting old. You know they have arthritis before they get here. Sometimes they have foot problems, toe problems, infections or bone problems. And so you just want to give them as many good years as you can. We, in a sanctuary situation, you rarely see you know, young, healthy animals in need of placement. They are oftentimes the product of almost what I would call a puppy mill for tigers, where they're just breeding and breeding and breeding, sometimes for photo shoots and things like that, with no regard for what happens to them after that function is complete, when the tiger is too big to handle or too big to use in uh, public contact or films, a lot of times they're viewed as disposable, and most of them are unhealthy. They'll come to us with all sorts of issues, uh, vision problems, um, crooked legs, arthritis, um, early kidney disease is very common, um, and some of those conditions are um, genetic. They're congenital um, problems that are passed on from generation to generation. For many animal advocates, freedom is the ultimate goal. But once an animal is already in captivity, options are limited. We do what we can, but we can't give them what, what they should have, and that's their total freedom. Nothing would make us happier 
than to release these guys to where they should be. But the fact is they would not be able to do it. They wouldn't have a herd, they wouldn't know what to do. And they'd probably die within a few weeks or less. Okay, we gotta go. We gotta go, you can't eat this whole bucket. Our happiest times are when we see them up on the hill like this, grazing on fresh green grass. When you have a sanctuary, you live for moments where the animals are doing something that they would be doing in the wild. So if they're in a mud hole, if they're grazing, if they're pushing on a tree, if they're tearing branches off, those are all kind of rewarding times for us. But it's, it's not a substitute uh, for the wild. While Ed may be able to provide the illusion of freedom to the animals in his care, he's very aware that true freedom is something they'll never know. If any of these animals could go free, if all of them could go free, we would load them up tomorrow and take them, take them home, take them back and let them go. And I think it's a responsibility for us to tell people the truth about captivity, at least our point of view. And if we don't win the argument, that's okay. We're not gonna beat anybody over the head, but I think if you take a step back and look at captivity, it's, it hasn't worked. It's bad for individuals. It's not helping species. So it's time to change the model. Go to the woods, go to the creek, turn over some rocks, look at the animals, teach your children respect for nature, just basic respect for nature. I think that's the starting point. And if we can't turn it around, we can't turn it around, but let's not make tigers and bears and elephants live in enclosures for the rest of their life, generation after generation after generation for really no reason. Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. Birds of prey are instantly recognized as predators. They are built to hunt and are some of the fastest animals on Earth. One man in Utah, USA, is closer to these birds than most of us are ever likely to be. Martin Tyner is not only a recognized expert on birds of prey, he also shares his life and his home with some unusual bird friends. Uh, this is a prairie falcon, her name is Cirrus. She is uh, one of our desert falcons here in, in North America. She does live in the house. Basically, the reason she lives in the house is, is these animals are very wild, very high strung, very difficult to deal with, and they require um, a lot of socialization, a lot of interaction with people uh, in order to be uh, comfortable, especially when I'm out doing wildlife programs in an audience of 500 to 1,000 people. The birds have to be comfortable. And so she, she comes in, she goes out in the daytime, but she comes in the house and hangs out and watches TV with the family. And she's just truly a member of the family. 
She's very sweet. She loves to talk to me. Hi, baby. Martin is a master falconer and an educator, and he is heavily involved with the conservation of birds of prey. But he is very aware of the dangers of keeping these large birds, and he never forgets where they have come from. Uh, this is this is in every respect. This is a wild animal. Even though, even though you know she's worked with me and and we get along wonderfully together, she still is wild. She still has a very strong fight or flight instinct. She still has. She's still instinctively afraid of humans. And so, but you know, being again in the house in her location, strangers and cameras and things. That's 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 pretty tough on her. Uh, and so the hood is actually her protection against stress. Um, it just covers her eyes, so now she can kind of just sit quietly and, and she doesn't feel frightened. Putting a small leather hood over the head of the bird instantly quietens them down and gives the bird a sense of security. Martin is an expert on the handling of birds, so taking his feather friend back to her pen is a simple procedure. Having a bird of prey as a pet might be a different story altogether. It actually isn't quite like a dog or cat in, in that with a dog or cat, uh, they have been um, domesticated. They want to be with you. They want to be your friend. Uh, when it comes to apex predators like this falcon and my eagle and my hawk that I fly, these animals don't necessarily like you. They don't necessarily want to be with you. They don't necessarily uh, respect you in any way, shape, fashion, or form. But what they do is they exploit you. So the truth of the matter is she's the hunter, I'm her dog. You know, falconry is one of very, very few relationships between man and wildlife that's mutually beneficial. Uh, we don't own these birds in any way, shape, fashion, or form. We serve them well. And that's the only reason they come back. Many of the birds here are rescues or long-term patients needing rehabilitation. But some have been bred in captivity. This is about as high-strung and difficult as you can deal with. And I've loved the challenge. She's really an amazing animal to work with. In no way is she a pet. She's strictly an apex predator, and, and you have to love that, but you never consider this a pet. You, she'll hurt you. There's my, there's my little BG. And as, as you can see, her posture is very, very different, even though I raised her. And this is, the, this is probably one of the most important things I can show people, is even though I've raised her, and even though she is as captive a bird of prey as you'll ever find, hybrid hawk, every ounce of wild instinct is there. She acts very, very much like the wildest birds of prey that you'll ever see. And this particular bird, as long as we're hunting, she, she's, sheer, she's a joy. But if I'm not serving her well, then, then she's a bit of a brat. The body language that she's saying here is that I will allow you to come hunting with me, but damn it, don't touch me. She is absolutely in charge. Now, uh, again, on the head, I can touch her breast slowly, but even at that, hey, sweetie. Yes. But I have to watch those feet because that's what she kills with. Those razor sharp talons is what she uses to kill with. And so she can bite, but the bite really isn't nearly as, as bad as, as the feet. Hi, oh, baby. Yes, you're such a brat. But you're a goshawk, that's why, huh? There is no doubt that Martin loves his birds. But one of them is his favorite. Scout is an American golden eagle and has been with Martin for over 15 years. Their relationship is unique and crosses the borders between pet ownership and a mutual respect between animal and human. Settle down. Here we go. I know. Come on. Settle in. That's my boy. 
So this is an American Golden Eagle. Yeah, this is the Golden Eagle. Yep. They are protected under the Federal Eagle Act, which is actually protection above the Endangered Species Act. And so the Golden and the Bald Eagle, Scout, I know, they're okay. I know, you said, I don't know what that stuff is and I don't like it. It's okay. It's my boy. It's my boy. It's okay. I know. Strangers in your house. This is the Golden Eagle. The farmer up in Wyoming was threatening to shoot him and I was called in by the federal government to rescue him before he got shot. So this is, a, in every respect, a full-grown wild eagle. Shall we start from the bottom, work our way up, big guy? And you can look at these feet. You know, 600 pounds per square inch of crushing power in those feet. He can drive those talons through my glove and crush the bones in my hand. So it's really good he likes me. We appreciate that. These large chest muscles are the motors that he uses to drive that beautiful six-foot wingspan. That beautiful six-foot wingspan that allows eagles to fly where hawks and falcons cannot. Eagles have been spotted at altitudes greater than 30,000 feet. Their strong eyesight is what enables them to be such precise and accurate hunters. My eagle can see eight times further than you can. And not only does he see eight times further, he has six times the number of light sensitive cells, the rods and cones on the back of the eye. So everything he sees is six times clearer. This eagle can spot a jackrabbit five miles away. And he does. We go out on the desert just north of town here. He flies free. He goes thousands of feet in the sky. He flies with the wild eagles. And he follows me as I flush out jackrabbits for him to catch. And so he flies like an eagle and hunts like an eagle. And, uh, and then if we don't catch any rabbits, he knows he can fly back, land on my glove, I'll feed him anyway. One day he got a little confused. Thousands of feet in the sky, no rabbits to be found. It was time to go home. So I blew my whistle, threw his toy out on the ground, and my eagle went into a wonderful dive. Headlong, vertical, about 145 miles an hour. It was impressive. But it became apparent very quickly he wasn't going for his toy. He was coming for my arm. When I woke up, I was six feet back, laying face down in the dirt, with my eagle standing next to me, looking down at me to say, why are you laying there? I had a long talk with my eagle that day, how I could not withstand the impact of an eight pound bird at 145 miles an hour, and I would appreciate if you'd never do that again. He dislocated my shoulder and damaged my back and knees. Looking after eagles does have its challenges. They are, after all, a major predator and can leave a nasty bite. He's the hunter, I'm his dog. And, uh, and he and I have been together now for 15 years. And so he's kept me for 15 years, so that's, that's wonderful. This is truly an honor to be able to have literally your best friend as a wild golden eagle and wild in, in every sense of the word, and, and to have the privilege of that wild animal coming right out of the sky, coming back to me, landing on my glove, and uh, being able to, to understand him is, is something that, uh, that's almost beyond words. Martin often hand feeds sick or injured wild birds, nursing them back to health. But sometimes his care is not enough. Those times when I do have to euthanize an eagle, um, you know, it just, it really tears me up because, you know, I've dedicated my whole life to rescuing them. And so quite often I have to just uh, grab Scout and we'll just sit, sit out in a shady spot and, and we'll talk. Yeah, we'll get our feelings out. And, and to be honest with you guys, he doesn't care. You know, it, it heals me. He doesn't understand, but it, it, it allows me to, to vent and to feel better. Yeah, he's such a good boy. It could be easy to leave the story of Martin and his birds here, but there's much more to this man than just his love of birds. As we drive out to a remote desert area with a rehabilitated hawk in the back of his car, Martin is at his happiest. This is why he does what he does. The thrill of releasing a bird back into the wild is something he has experienced many times, and he passes this joy 
onto visitors and bird lovers whenever he can. The Southwest Wildlife Foundation of Utah was started by Martin to assist in returning eagles and other birds of prey back into the wild after injuries sustained mainly by human intervention. Over 100 birds a year are rehabilitated and returned to the wild, an incredible statistic considering that the person responsible for helping these animals was not always a big fan of birds. Well, actually, as a child, I was terrified of them. My earliest childhood memory was uh, such a, a horrible fear of birds. I had uh, climbed up on the uh, kitchen table at my grandparents' house. They, my grandfather had a pet parakeet, and as a little tiny toddler, I decided I'd pet the, the pretty green little bird in the cage. I stuck my hand in there and, and went to pet the bird, and the bird bit me. And I pulled away from the, the bird and, and, the, and me in the cage and everything fell off the table and, and smashed everywhere. And, and it was traumatic and that caused me to, to have a, a tremendous fear. And it was getting worse and worse. Every time I'd see even a sparrow fly overhead, I'd scream, run for the house. Keeping a few birds for education and friendship is important to Martin. But he sees what we are doing today as being far more beneficial especially after he has spent many weeks or months treating so many injured animals. But does he feel a loss when the birds just fly away? I get asked all the time from people, you know, you've put your heart and soul into rescuing these animals and they just fly away. Does that make you feel bad? And the truth of the matter is, no, that's, that is my reward. Like I said, we don't get paid for this. My reward is the knowledge that there's one more beautiful eagle, hawk, owl, whatever, back in the sky. There's one more beautiful deer, or coyote, or fox back in the wild. That's, that's my reward. It's always a really good day when I can turn something loose. Today, Martin has enrolled some help with the latest release. It's an emotional moment, and neither of the men know quite what to expect. You'll release the bird. You just follow my instructions and you'll be perfectly safe. And, and I'll take the bird out of its box. I will uh, hand the bird to you and I'll show you how to hold it properly. And then we'll just walk over to the rock fence right there and hold the bird for as, as long as you're comfortable. And then I'll, all I want you to do is take the bird and just throw it. Yeah. And, and it, should, uh, it should go. And you will be the last person on the planet to ever touch that beautiful hawk. Just hold it right into your chest, yeah. just just like this. And then when you're ready to release her, then all you're going to do is just take her and just throw her right up in the air. Okay. So it's, it's very, very simple. Let me strike this. I don't want you to release her with the hood on. That would no, be very bad. No, that's not good. Hey, sweetie, the baby girl. Yes, you are your baby girl. Such a sweetheart. Okay. Now I want you to put your hands underneath, your fingers underneath mine, and grab those feet. Grab both of them. Yeah. Okay, you got those. And you've got a hawk in your arms. Yeah. And you will be, like I said, if all goes well, you'll be the last person on the planet to ever touch that beautiful animal. Yeah, what a pleasure. Yeah. Let's go over here. Martin is just as enthusiastic today releasing this bird as he has been for many years. And with the wind blowing, it's probably going to go that way. Any opportunity to escape? She'll take it, and she'll fight with you, and she'll tr and she'll try to escape. But right now, she doesn't think she has an option. Yeah, because she so, keep the pressure on you. Yes, I've probably got more pressure than you would ever have. <laughs> you ready? Guys? I know it's a little intimidating, but there no, you go. No, it's not intimidating. It's just uh, interesting. Yeah, it's great. Whenever you're ready, guys. Yeah, and I'm yeah. ready on my end. Jules. Yeah. Please. So I still hold the legs. Just just move it away from your chest yeah. and throw it up and release the legs at the same time. Okay. Here we go. She's landed. Almost. Almost, but she will land. Now, now she's going to, uh, well, maybe she'll catch a little ridge lift and, go, and continue going up. She's still going. Yeah, she's going to go up. She's catching some ridge lift over there. Wow. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. That's, that's a privilege. Yeah. That's what I do. I just yeah, care for man. critters and put them back in the wild.
Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, you any time. <laughs> yeah, it's an incredible experience. Yeah, amazing. I've never let anything go before. I tend to keep them and eat them. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, like I said, I, that, this has been my entire life. Yeah. You know, my misguided life. Yeah. This is what I do. <laughs> No, it's a great thing to do. Yeah, yeah it's, I think it's, so. it's a great thing to do. No, thank you very much. Well, you're, so. you're welcome. Very a baby ferret can be like bringing home two toddlers. If you don't know what you're getting, you see this cute little animal. Our first one, we had to replace all the children's beds. We had to replace all the carpets in their bedrooms. Oh, I didn't know anything. Um, I'd be cleaning my teeth and she'd be climbing up and eating the soap. You need to know what you're doing before you do it or it's dangerous. You look at those teeth. Look at ferret's teeth. They're, they're designed to chew and to crush, crush bones. I tell everybody ferrets bite. Domesticated from the European polecat, the ferret's fluffy appearance and playful nature make it seem an unlikely predator. Yet ferrets are such adept predators that they have been used for centuries to hunt rabbits. And this is what they used back in uh, uh, the Dark Ages and back in the 1700s, 1800s. These, are, these things hunted rabbits for wealthy people, but these were bred in captivity in Europe hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The ferrets are taken and, and put down the holes and they chase the rabbits out. They put nets across the, across the holes so that the rabbits just go straight up into the nets. And That was why ferrets were first brought to Australia. They come out with their um, settlers. They were also popular for pest control in cities flushing out and killing rats, and even helping with rat bolting, a method used to chase wires through buildings. Ferrets are still used for rabbit hunting today, although they are far more commonly seen as house pets. Joe is the rescue coordinator for the Western Australian Ferret Society. She currently cares for 17 ferrets, many of whom can't be rehomed. This is Gator. Gator will not use his back legs. He eats, drinks, he's happy. Hi. But yeah, most of these are all rescues for one reason or another. We get quite a few each year. There are a lot of reasons why people surrender them. They're not prepared is one of the big ones. This is a little rescue girl. We knew where our owners were, but they never came forward to claim them. So she stays. Ferrets are small and mostly domesticated, and many, like Joe, see them as an attractive and rewarding pet, despite their bite. They're great. They're, they're a combination between a cat and a dog. They've got the curiosity of a cat, and that's what gets them in trouble. There's always what's over there or what's, you know, what's this or what's that, and, and they're too busy looking at everything. You know, everything is fast forward for a ferret. But they've got the loyalty, the love, the intelligence of a dog. It's like it's all rolled into this tiny little furball. Ferrets are best known for their bad smell and their bad bite. And at first, even Joe wasn't keen on the idea of a ferret as a pet. A friend of our daughter, my youngest daughter, who was, I think even when she was five, she wanted a ferret. We weren't going to have one. I used to think that they were the worst creature ever put on the earth. And um, a friend purchased her one. And we hit the roof. There was no way in the world my husband and I were going to have a stinky horrid ferret in my house. Um, and then we, they brought her home and put her in my hands, and it was instant love. I just fell in love with her. In Las Vegas, Exotic Pets employee, Georgia, is another fan of the ferret. She has nine of them herself. Essentially, they're kind of like a puppy or a kitten, and they never really grow up in the fact that they're always playful. They love to like have attention and just interact. 
Um, they're pretty easy to take care of, and they're really fun and interactive. I mean, they're sleepy right now, but you can wrestle with them, you can play with them, and they're more than happy to play back. And I just, they're really interactive. Their boisterous nature means that ferrets can be quite a handful. Joe has fostered dozens over the years, and it's taken all of those years of experience to get the hang of keeping them as pets. Toilet seats, you know, it's toilet doors. People leave seats up and doors open. It's just something a lot of places do. You need to put the seat down and close the door because the little buggers will get in it because of their curiosity, what's in there? But yeah, they'll climb, they'll climb brick walls. In the US, ferrets are such a popular pet. They're the biggest seller in Ken Fuse's exotic pet store in Las Vegas. Las Vegas is the number one city that sells ferrets in the world. Reno is number two. Why? Because 99.9% .9 of our ferrets go to California because they're illegal in California. 99% of the ferrets in Reno go to California. They take care of the Bay Area. We take care of San Diego and, and Los Angeles. If ferrets are illegal to own in California. I don't ask them where they live. California has banned the keeping of pet ferrets, fearing that if released into the wild, they will decimate the local flora and fauna, as they did in New Zealand, where the fuzzy predators are also prohibited. When someone comes in and buys a ferret, they pick it up, we give it to them in a box, they walk out the door with it. They're the ones crossing the state line with a banned animal, not me. And um, I think in all the years, I think we've had one person that got caught at the state line with one. And, uh, and we, we sell hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ferrets. And we get that a lot where they'll say, hey, we want to buy a ferret. We live in Fresno. Will you ship us a ferret? And I said, absolutely not. You want a ferret? Drive down here and get it. And, uh, and they do. Members of the weasel family, ferrets are obligate carnivores and in the wild will feed on small mammals and birds. In captivity, they still need to be fed a meat-only diet. I always tell people, think of a T-Rex in a little version. So it's, it's raw meat, um, day-old chickens, mice. Yeah, my guys have the raw meat and the chicken hearts and chicken giblets, and they like them. They need to chew. And it turns out that if ferrets aren't properly fed, they may look for an alternative and very vulnerable food source. In 2011, a four-month-old baby boy from Grain Valley, Missouri, was left in critical condition after a hungry pet ferret ate seven of his fingers. His parents were charged with criminal neglect. A one-month-old baby girl left unattended downstairs in her Pennsylvania home in 2015 had her nose, upper lip, and cheek eaten by the family's three pet ferrets. And in Lancashire, England, a 10-month-old baby girl needed hospital treatment after she was savaged in her pram by a ferret. Having looked after hundreds of ferrets over the years, Joe maintains that their biting is rarely aggressive. They'll bite when they're frightened. They bite to protect themselves but they'll also bite to play. One of their favorite games is tag chasey, but they can only tag you with their teeth. It's a form of communication for them. Um, I mean, look, there's 17 ferrets in this house at the moment and there's not a mark on me. They'll come up to you and they'll use their teeth and they'll just go like that. But some people, they don't know it. They've never seen it before. They think they're attacking it. The minute they use their teeth, they're biting them. But generally they'll only bite because they're frightened, that's it. And once you know how to handle that, you're fine. Again, that's being prepared. See? Not a mark. So he's playing with me, but he uses his teeth. So, but for some people, that's enough to, to say they've been bitten. But it, it, it's not, it's a way that he's communicating with me. Like our producer, Joe has also experienced the ferret that bites and won't ow, let go. Ow, ow, ow. Ah, ow, 
too bad that you can get out oh, of it. Good, I can. Ow, ow, ow. Hi, 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 hi. Ow. Oh, look. Their jaws can lock. I've had one hanging here. And I got through, I got in between a ferret fight. Um, and she was just lashing out. And she grabbed me here without realising it was me. And it's just like, let go, let go, let go, let go. And then she did, and she looked, let go, and she just looked at me and she said, oh, oh, what have I done? And then it was, yeah, but just take them. Don't pull it off, don't scream, because you're just going to frighten them more. Get a cold water tap and just gently drop it on their head. Their acute appearance can also foster a feeling of complacency. Don't be fooled. These creatures bite hard. And even though they may appear to have given up on their prey, they'll happily come back for another round. Gator, you are no longer my favorite ferret, mate. Ah. Oh. Oh, that's nasty, that one. Oh. They spit and everything. That's nasty. Mm -hmm. They can bite if they want it to, but they usually don't. It's sneezy. Sometimes when they're babies, they'll nibble a little bit harder and you gotta teach them, but they take the training pretty well. They can learn basic commands and stuff too. Ferrets' high intelligence make them both effective predators and attractive pets. They're incredible, they're intelligent. Never underestimate them. We've got people teach them to do rollover tricks, walk on a lead. I've seen them get across from one corner of this backyard to the back corner without getting a drop of the sprinkler on them. And the sprinklers were going like this at the time and they would just time it perfectly. Or this door, they couldn't open the door, the girls, because they were smaller, couldn't open the doors. So they'd go and get the big boy Fred and he'd come and open the door. So yeah, don't underestimate them. If they want something, they'll work out exactly how to get it. And the ferret's sharp teeth and strong jaws aren't its only defense. Yeah, everybody's got a different personality and you have personality clashes and yeah, the arguments and, hmm, I don't like you, go away. Lots of screaming, that's when they drop their stink bombs. That's another form of defense for them, but that's it, that's all they've got. And they're such tiny little creatures. It stinks, but it's not like a skunk, it will dissipate. With 17 ferrets and not a bite mark on her, Jo clearly has a special relationship with her tiny predators, and she has her own theories about ferret owners. The amount of people that get ferrets, something's happened to them emotionally. You know, I don't know what it is or why it is, but they get them. Is it because they're so misunderstood? And people think that, you know, these people think that they're misunderstood or, or, I don't know what it is, but there's something, some connection. And my mother swears I would have had a mental breakdown at some stage in my life. Um, and it was just them that's kept me sane, because I'll just go and sit and curl up with them. It's like, it's like having a pretzel or a chip. One is never enough. You always take more. <laughs> Zebras Are Us is home to Dominic Ferrero, a zebra-crazy animal lover who's dedicated her life to caring for and breeding these striped horses. I've always been raised with animals. My passion for exotics started when I was young. I always liked zebras and I was raised with horses. You know, and it became a thing where I was a crazy horse kid that wanted a zebra and people said, no, you can never own a zebra. That's crazy. I got shut down so many times and, you know, look where I'm at now. I think I have some of the most unique animals in the country. Dominique began caring for exotic animals straight out of high school. She purchased her first zebra in 2003 and has been growing her herd ever since. Her passions quickly extended beyond zebras and her property in Texas is now home to a successful rescue and breeding program and houses over 45 zebras, as well as herds of water buffaloes, camels, deer, goats, and horses. I love my zebras. I will be the crazy zebra lady. I already am, but I'm gonna be the really good one when I'm older. There are certain types of zebras. There's actually a mountain zebra, 
There's a Grevy zebra, a Grant zebra, and a Chapman Damara type zebra. We have all the types here, so it's pretty unique to get to interact with them and see the personality differences because they are different. No two zebras have the same stripes. In fact, their stripes are just like human fingerprints, unique to each animal. Each zebra has different characteristics. The Grevy zebra is known for the large ears. He looks like Mickey Mouse. And they have a white stomach, and their stripes are vertical, and they have a white belly. And then we have the mountain zebra, which looks somewhat like a pony that has a medium-sized ear and really fat, beautiful stripes on the rump. It kind of does a zigzag pattern, and it does also have a white stomach. The Grant zebra has full belly stripes and they're thicker and they do go vertically and horizontally. I mean, they're a smaller type zebra. And then the Damara type Chapman zebra actually has zebra stripes on its body and they typically have white legs, no stripes. So you can definitely, if you point all of them out and stand them together, you can, there's obvious differences, you can tell. Two of the species of zebra that Dominic houses are endangered, the mountain zebra and the Grevy zebra. Due to their need to compete with livestock for food, the destruction of their habitat for farmland, and hunting, mountain zebra populations have previously reached as low as 750 individuals worldwide. Fortunately, current numbers are back up to around 2,000, and part of Dominique's work involves breeding these animals in the hope of keeping the population growing. In addition to breeding these highly sought after creatures, Dominique sells her much cared for charges to other exotic animal owners who are looking to expand their own herds after a thorough screening process, of course. It's amazing. The relationship you can have with the zebra is one in a million. You know, it's a very hard process to screen potential owners. I feel that people that go into exotic animal ownership you really have to be passionate. And I can tell that in someone's voice when they call. It's the people that want to ride them or go in parades and do things. It's like you set yourself up and the animal for failure. So I try to screen all the clients and really talk to them and tell them what they're getting into. And if the at the end of the day, you're satisfied looking out in your beautiful pasture with two beautiful zebras grazing on the grass, you will never have an unhappy day with a zebra. You will love that animal. And I invite everybody out here to come see and, and really know if this is an animal that they want to get into. You know, you need to think about vet work and what if something happens, what are you going to do? You know, you have to have those plans and stuff. I do not want to get my zebras back. I want them, when they leave this property, I've raised them. I want them in a forever home. It's not just humans that need screening when it comes to the sale of Dominic's zebras. Zebras are wild creatures, and attacks on humans when they get too close aren't uncommon. With owning zebras, there is an element of danger. Uh, you always really do have to be careful. When I first started getting into zebras, I was very ignorant. I ended up in possession of a zebra that was very dangerous, three-year-old stallion, and he was represented to me as the best zebra in the world. It even said that on the ad. And I had the animal at my house for less than 10 hours, and that zebra viciously attacked me. He bit me in the neck. He took some neck muscles off. I was in the emergency room, and it was quite an ordeal. Zebras defend themselves by rearing, biting, and kicking. In the wild, they have even killed lions, often by breaking their jaws so they starve to death. I've been kicked by camels, zebras, horses, <laughs> anything you can imagine, I've gotten kicked and uh, that bite sure gets you. That, that bite will do it. But to this day, it was the best experience that's ever happened to me. Thank God for my life and everything's fine, but I learned so much from that day. I learned that you really have to respect these animals and it can happen at any minute. And I think education is very important. You really need to be aware of what's going on and it goes back to not having unrealistic expectations. If you plan on loving the animal and not interacting with it and having it graze in a pasture, you're gonna be fine. 
when we try to move the animals or doctor them, do any vet work, that's where you have to be really careful. And breeding and raising for temperament is huge. The foundation, how the zebra was raised, where it was raised, that's all a big deal. It's kind of like children. There's different ways to raise kids. There's different ways to raise zebras. And I believe that there's good ways and bad ways. And each one has an effect on the adulthood of the animal. I have guys that raise tigers and carnivores and they won't mess with a zebra. <laughs> so they're pretty tough animals, but as long as you get around them and you, you know how to work with them, it's fun. It's really fun. I enjoy it. I wouldn't give it up for anything. Unlike horses and donkeys, zebras have not been fully domesticated by humans. They remain predominantly wild. Dominic's Safe Haven Rehabilitation Program rescues zebras, and they are certainly at home on the ranch. Started out with the zebras, and it slowly trickled into camels and a few different things. And now that I've had water buffalo, I am hooked on them. They're amazing. They're such a neat animal. Dominic's property is prone to flooding, so conditions here are not suited to typical livestock varieties. Water buffalo, on the other hand, thrive on the damp, marshy ground. There are several different types of water buffalo, and all are very hardy animals. The Cape water buffalo is the most dangerous variety, responsible for more deaths than any other. I have some cows I won't go in with. And I have some that I can scratch on the stomach and they'll lay down like a dog. Dominic's property is well secured, not just to ensure the safety of the animals inside the fences. The fencing that I prefer to keep, the big herd of water buffalo in, is eight foot tight lock fencing. It is good for the animals inside the fence and it's good for the animals on the outside. The fencing that we have doesn't allow predators to come in and eat the calves and then it also doesn't allow the animals that are on the inside to jump over or get through it. You know, dogs can't come in, the calves can't slide out. So it's extremely safe. It's been the best thing that I've found for any exotic. Water buffalo in the U.S. are mostly crossbred for a variety of characteristics. I do like to focus on a big horn base and I want the horns to kind of come back instead of curl. And so we can breed for those characteristics, but they do have giant horns. Some are better than others, like domestic cattle. Some have big horns and some don't, but I do like the big wide ones. Those are my favorite. In the wild, those giant horns are used to establish dominance and defend themselves from predators. In captivity, they ensure the water buffalo remains an outside pet. I would never have any of those in my house. They have been in my house, <laughs> all of them. It's really fun, you know, when you're like, hey, walk around the corner, you have a water buffalo following you or a zebra. I mean, you know, it's fun to stand out. <laughs> and I've taken these animals, surprisingly, I've actually used them all on set. So I've done a few things in the entertainment industry and I've had zebras in elevators, I've had water buffalo on stage. I mean, the things that we've done with animals are pretty impressive. <laughs> I think anything can be done with patience. In keeping with her obsession for four-legged creatures, Dominic has most recently expanded her herd to include camels. Camels are interesting. I have owned up to 20 of them at a time. I have had Bactrians and I've had dromedaries. A Bactrian is a two humped camel and a dromedary, which is the most common, has one hump. And we've used those in the entertainment industry. They're very hardy, easy to keep, very sweet, good animals. Really, really neat. Compared to our zebras, camels are very easy going and easily trained. They're very emotional animals. So they're the type that you want to ask which you should do with everything, but you ask them, you can bribe them, and you can typically get whatever you need done accomplished. Their large size can make camels dangerous, 
but Dominique is more concerned about their lack of manners. Camels do spit. It's a learned behavior, so they don't typically just spit on you. But in my experience, as long as I don't have one that spits, none of mine spit. But if you get one that starts it, five will follow. They do bite. Camels are very, very notorious for biting. If you go overseas, you'll see a lot of them with a little nose mask, kind of a guard. I've seen some pretty good camel bites. But for the most part, it's like anything. If, you're, if you work with them and not against them, you have a great relationship with any animal. It's when you kind of get into the training techniques and when you butt heads is when you might have a problem, but there's some great trainers in the U.S. Train them as she might, Dominique has still fallen foul of their vicious kicks. I've been, I would call it a camel hoof. I've been hoofed by a camel before. <laughs> I've been camel hoofed. And it's like a frontward kick instead of a backwards kick. They take their front foot and they just whack you with it. If you're gonna get into exotics, camels would be one of the good ones to start with, and they would be get a gelding or a female. A gelding would be a castrated male. Get something young. I don't recommend bottle babies, but if you get with the right breeder and the right people, you'll have a great animal. Good pet, really good pet. They may be her pets, but Dominic's herds still work for their keep, and they often hit the road in the back of the trailer to take part in events or to be used as therapy animals. I think that any animal likes to have a job, whether it's being ridden or interacted with in therapy sessions, anything like that. I think animals do like to have a job and a purpose. As long as it's kind and the animals are willing, they actually look forward to doing stuff. I, I've done a few events and my trailer will pull up to the barn and I've got four animals waiting to go on the trailer because they know we're going somewhere. So it's typically like your dog, if you take your dog in the car and you go for rides, that dog can't wait to get in the car. Doesn't know what it's doing, but it likes to go and do something. So I think the animals we have like to be a part of something, whether it's being ridden commercially or privately, I think they like to have a purpose. I like to educate people. There's nothing better than seeing somebody's dream come to life when they actually touch and interact with that animal. All of my animals here are gentle. We really focus on making everything friendly and happy and a really good environment for people and the animals. And when that kid has read about a black and white striped horse in a book, and they actually get to interact and touch and feel the difference between a zebra and a horse or a goat, that's what's gonna help our animals, is getting the kids to learn about conservation and you know, slowly repopulating, but making sure that our animals don't leave. Mm -hmm.